Chapter 13 In addition to cutting all the power in the house, Arto had fused the comlinks. Chewbacca had to venture forth into the steamy fog of the night to bring Javax a report of what had taken place. The chief person returned to the house with him, concerned and shaken he had been awake, he said, at the Muni Center, trying to raise communication with the nearby valley of Batan, whose calm center had gone out for the fifth time in six months. I don't understand it, the old look he said, looking from the ruin of fried bedding to the charred, motionless droid, upon whom Han was grimly affixing a restraining bolt. The pump stations and the mechanical feeders, yes we're still very much a shoestring operation in some ways, whatever the corporate brass likes to say. Most of our equipment is second-hand, and quite frankly pretty old. But you're our to unit. Wait a minute. Leia had removed her boots by this time and wrapped herself in a darkly patterned crimson and black local kimono, her hair hanging in a burnished mass down her back. She'd spent the past fifteen minutes locating every glow rod and emergency power cell panel in the house, even retrieving the candles from the watery mess on the floor. Are you telling me programming failures like this are common? Not common. The Mlucky's eyes met hers frankly under the heavy ridge of brow. But every now and then a tree feeder will go mildly amuck and wander through the streets squirting nutrient at passers-by. Or one of the ice walkers will start hiking away across the glaciers, forcing its passengers to bail out and walk back to the valley. Most people who have business out on the glaciers who read traveling to Badan or Mathipson, for instance pack thermal suits and distress signals as a matter of course. He spread his white-furred hands, and the silver in his ears glinted as he tilted his head. Personally, though, I'm not a mechanic. I suspect it's the result of doming the valley. It was always pretty damp here, but enclosing the valley has made it more so, and the pumping stations can't eliminate or neutralize all the corrosive gases that rise out of the vents at the bottom end of the rift. They've never reported mechanical problems like this in Baton. But it's not a mechanical problem argued Leia. It's a programming fault. Well, that's what the mechanics here say, Javax scratched his head. But the programmers swear it's mechanical. They would, thought Leia late the following morning, as she watched Chewbacca poke around in Artudito's mechanical innards in a hissing sizzle of sparks. She had yet to meet a programmer who'd admit that untoward results weren't universally attributable to either hardware failure or operator error. Even Kree sucks honestly, and sincerely believed to this day that the Death Star would have made a wonderful mining instrument. And yes, the air in the Plow Rift was extraordinarily damp. Plastering Leia's dark linen shirt to her arms and back as she leaned on the railing of the terrace where Han and the Wookiee were working to take advantage of the daylight Javax's promised engineers had yet to arrive to repair power in the house and completely unstick the welded shutters. If they worked on anything like the Muni Center's schedules, thought Leia, they wouldn't see them until the packing plants shut down for the night again. And yes, second-hand machinery not designed specifically for work in hyperdamp climates did develop the occasional flutter. But presumably the mechanics would install dehumidifier packs and everything they were certainly present in all the kitchen's quaintly old-fashioned blenders and choppers. And Arto had spent considerable time in the marshes of Dagoba without becoming homicidal, a restraint of which Leia wasn't sure she would be capable, after hearing Luke's account of that green snake-ridden world. As her old nanny had phrased it, something about it all just didn't listen right to her. Whatever programmers said, thought Leia, perching herself on the stone rail of the balcony, a mechanical flaw might possibly account for Arthur's running amok and trundling off the path into the trees. But by no stretch of the imagination could it cause him to perform a complicated series of specific activities like closing doors, sealing locks, crossing wires within wall panels and blasters. It was definitely R2. The serial numbers on his main block and motivator housing matched. 
Chewbacca his arms and shoulders crisscrossed with strips shaven in his fur and synth flesh patched in beneath but otherwise little the worse for the events in the caverns last night had found any kind of relay mechanism inserted into Arta's motivators that would have given him instructions. From the outside. And in any case, when would such a thing have been installed? He hadn't been out of Leia's sight last night for more than a few moments, and for part of that time she'd heard him moving. So what I think? Han wiped his fingers on an already unspeakable rag. Chewbacca pushed back his eyeshades and groaned noncommittally. The Wookiee had reassembled the engines of the Millennium Falcon when they'd been in worse shape than this, and the thing had flown. Leia, regarding the loose piles of wire and cables still spread around the stone flagging of the terrace, had her doubts. Artu rocked a little on his base and managed a faint, reassuring cheep. What did you think you were? Began Han, and Leia reached over to touch his shoulder, stopping further words. Artu had to be feeling utterly wretched already. Can you tell us about it? She asked gently. Artu rocked harder, swiveled his top, and beeped pleadingly. Can he tell us about it? demanded Han. I can tell you about it. He tried to kill us. The droid emitted a thin, despairing wail. It's all right, said Leia. She knelt beside Artu, touched the droid on the join of base pivot and body, disregarding her husband's muttered commentary. I'm not mad at you, and I won't let anything happen to you. She glanced over her shoulder at Han and Chewie, a sinister enough-looking pair, she supposed, leaned against the stone railing with their arms full of drills and grippers. What happened? All Arta's lights went out. Leia turned back to Chewie, who had pushed his welding goggles back onto his high forehead. Are you sure you got his wiring back the way it's supposed to be? Hey, he works, doesn't he? retorted Han. Leia stepped back while Chewbacca knelt and went to work again. Though not much of a mechanic Luke had taught her to break and reassemble a standard X-Wing engine in a pinch, and on a good day she could even identify portions of the Falcon's drive system Leia had the impression the Wookiee was redoing some of the repairs he'd done half an hour ago. But Han and Chewie, like Luke, were mechanics and thought in terms of mechanical failure. She found herself wondering if there was a way of getting in touch with Cray Mingla. It occurred to her that she had heard nothing from Luke or any of his party in days. Something moved in the orchard below. A bright yellow manalium burst out of the ferns like a startled flower and went winging away through the trees, and Leia who had never lost the watchfulness of those years on the run between the battles of Yavin and Enda looked automatically for what had startled it. She didn't see much, but it was enough. A ghost-like impression of movement faded at once into the mist, but there was no mistaking the white gown, the night-black tail of hair. From the balcony behind her Han's voice said, I never asked you last night, Lei, you find anything in the city records? Yes, said Leia briefly, swinging herself over the balcony rail and dropping lightly the meter and a half to the thick ferns below. I'll be back. In the mist it was impossible to see more than a few meters clearly. Tree stems, vines, beds of shrub and fern made dim, one-dimensional cutouts in the glassy grayness. Half closing her eyes, Leia reached out with her senses, as Luke had been teaching her to do, and picked up the subliminal stir of fabric among leaves, the squish of wet foliage underfoot. The trace of perfume. Her hand moved automatically to check for the blaster usually holstered at her side, even as she moved in pursuit. Nothing there, of course. Still, she didn't turn back. Not swiftly, but steadily, she worked to keep up with the woman whose face she'd seen under the lamplight of the path through the orchard last night. She remembered now where she'd seen her before. She'd been eighteen, newly elected the youngest member of the Imperial Senate. 
It was customary among the old houses to bring their daughters to Coruscant when they emerged from finishing school at 17 or 16, if their parents were ambitious to start the long and elaborate jockeying for a good match at court. Her aunt, she remembered, had been horrified when she refused, doubly appalled when her father had backed her up in her decision not to be presented to the emperor until she could do so as a senator in her own right, not simply as a young girl in the court marriage market. She wondered what they'd think now, those aunts, if they could see her married to a man who'd started life as a smuggler, whose parents had been nobody knew who. If they could see her as chief of state, after years of dodging around the galaxy in the company of a ragged gang of idealistic warriors with a price on her head. She honestly didn't know whether they would have been aghast or proud. When she was 18, she hadn't known them well, hadn't known them as an adult knows other adults and they had all died before she could. She stepped from among the trees of the orchard. The white dress was at the far end of Old Orchard Street, moving swiftly. Heading for the market square, Leia thought. For a long time she tried not to know whether it had been day or evening in the capital of Aldrin when the Death Star had appeared in the sky. Somebody had eventually told her that it had been a warm evening late in the spring. And Rouge had undoubtedly been having her hair dressed for dinner in front of that gilt-framed mirror in her boudoir. And Sully would have been lying down indulging in her daily bout of hypochondria. And Aunt Tia would have been reading aloud to her or talking baby talk to the Pittens. Leia even remembered the Pittens' names. Taffy, Winky, Fluffy, and at A.V. Dash... All-terrain attack vehicle. She named that last one. It had been pale candy pink and small enough to fit in her cupped hands. The pittens had all died, too, when somebody had pulled that lever on the Death Star. And everything else had died as well. Everything else. Leia gritted her teeth as she moved along the steep slant of the street, keeping close to the jumble of old walls and prefab shops fighting the sting behind her eyes and the dreadful tightness of her throat. Her aunts had made her girlhood an intermittent burden, but they deserved better than that. It had been her father who had presented her to the emperor in the Senate Rotunda, as junior representative of Alderaan. She remembered as if it were yesterday the evil dark eyes peering like a lizard's from that desiccated face in the black hood's shadow but her aunts were the ones who had insisted on taking her to the levee at the palace that night. That was where she'd seen this woman, this girl. She herself had been eighteen, clothed in the spare, formal white of senatorial office, as her father had been. There had been few other senators there, and the crowd in the pillared hall had been an autumnal flower bed of dull golds and bronzes, plum and dark green. Among the usual courtiers, the sons and daughters of governors and moths and the scions of the ancient. Aristocratic houses. Whose parents were trying to arrange alliances, Leia had noticed a half-dozen women of truly startling beauty, exquisitely gowned and jeweled like princesses, who did not seem to belong with either the bureaucrats' wives or the more elite groups of the old houses and their vassals. She'd asked Aunt Rouge about them and had gotten a very superior... Whom the emperor wishes to invite is of course his business, Leia dear, but one is not obligated to speak with them. Leia had realized they were the emperor's concubines. This woman, this girl had been one of them. Leia was catching her up. The woman glanced behind her as she threaded swiftly through the barrows of vegetables, jewelry, cosmetics, and scarves in the market square like a small fish hoping to lose a larger one among bright-colored rocks. She began to run, and Leia ran after her, dodging vendors and shoppers and the occasional lines of anti-grav wagons on their way in from the orchards. The woman who must be only a few years older than she, Leia thought ducked down an alley, and Leia ran on past its mouth, then doubled down the narrow lane beyond. The houses around the marketplace were old, built on the sunken foundations and lower stories of the original dwellings of the town. 
Leia descended a short flight of steps at a silent run, dodged through the squat pillars of what had once been a hot spring hall and was now a sort of open cellar under the gleaming white prefab of the upper house, knee-deep in swirling brown mist and smelling faintly of sulfur and cretch. At the far side she sprang up into the alley again. The woman had concealed herself behind a stack of packing crates and was watching the mouth of the alley to see if Leia was going to come back that way. She was still slender and small, almost childlike, as she had been eleven years ago. Her exquisite oval face was unlined, her slanted black eyes unmarred by wrinkles Leia remembered inconsequentially Cray's vast catalog of such products as Slitherberry Wrinkle Cream and distilled water of Maltokian Camba Fruit designed to preserve such perfection. The black hair that hung down her back in a heavy tail ringed with bronze the hair that had been piled into the elaborate, mask-like headpiece at the Emperor's levee. Untouched by Grey. All the way from the house in the orchard, Leia had been trying to recall the woman's name, and as she stepped from between the lava pillars and up into the alley she finally did. Roganda, she said, and the woman spun, her hand going to her lips in shock. In the drifting, shadowless mists it was hard to see her eyes, but after a moment the woman Roganda Ismarin stepped forward and sank into a deep curtsy at Leia's feet. Your Highness. Leia hadn't heard her voice before. Aunt Rouge had seen to that. It was soft and pitched rather high, with a lisping, childish sweetness. I beg of you, Highness, don't betray me. To whom? Asked Leia practically, and gestured for her to rise. The old hand movement, drilled into her by her aunt's deportment teachers, came easily, a whisper from the dead past. Roganda Ismarin wasn't the only one in danger of betrayal here. Leia and Han would probably find themselves far less able to pursue their investigations if there was in fact anything to investigate were it known who they were. Roganda got to her feet, the hem of her gown stirring the mist that drifted up from the old house foundations, the lower end of the moss-grown street. Them. She nodded toward the bustling noises of the market, half invisible in the fog and her gesture took in the stone foundations of the houses around them, the patched in white cubes with their terraces, their trellises, their steps. Her every movement still retained the implicit beauty of a trained dancer's. Like Leia, she had been well taught how to carry herself. Anyone in this town. The Empire laid it to the ground not too long ago, and even those who came in afterward have cause to hate even the unwilling servants of the Emperor. Leia relaxed a little. The woman was unarmed, unless she had a dagger or an extremely small blaster under that simple white linen gown, and the liquid drape of the fabric made even that unlikely. As Palpatine's concubine, Roganda would have found herself very much in the crossfire between the Emperor's enemies and his friends. Leia wondered how she'd gotten out of Coruscant. This place has been my refuge, my safety, for seven years now, Roganda continued softly. She clasped her hands in a gesture of pleading. Don't force me out to seek another home. No, said Leia, embarrassed. Of course not. Why did you pick this place to come to? She was thinking only of the Emperor's levy. Of the jeweled headpiece Roganda had worn. Massy gold and layered with a galactic dazzle of topaz. Ruby citron, remembering the elaborate bunches of shimmer silk skirts, held in swags and volutes with gem plaques the size of her palm, the chains of jewels, fine as embroidery thread, dangling row on row from the curved golden splendor of her concubine collar. Roganda's hair had been augmented and amplified by swags of lace, swatches of silk in every shade of gold and crimson her small white hands a glory of scintillant rings. But Roganda hesitated, seemed to draw back. Why do you ask? Then, quickly, it was out of the way. No one knew of it, no one would look for me here. Neither the rebels from whom I fled when I left Coruscant, nor the warlords who tried to take it back. I wanted only peace, 
She gave a shy smile. Since you've come this far, will you come to my rooms? Roganda gestured back along the alley. They aren't elegant, you can't pay for much elegance on a fruit packer's wages, but I do pride myself on my coffee. The one remnant of earlier glories. The coffee served at the Emperor's levy was one of the things that had stayed in Leia's mind. The Emperor had had special farms on a number of suitable worlds to provide the beans solely for the use of his court, including several that produced vine coffee, a variety notoriously hard to rear. The transition to this provincial town among its orchards couldn't have been an easy one. Another time, she said, shaking her head. Surely there were other places you could have gone? Few as out of the way as this. Roganda half smiled and brushed aside the tendrils of dark hair that trailed across her brow. Her complexion was the clear, pallorous white of those who live without sunlight, on starships, or underground, or on worlds like this where the only thin sunlight that leaked down through the mists had to be magnified by the crystal of the dome. Even smugglers rarely bother anymore. I knew I wasn't going to be welcomed in the Republic his name was too hated, and those who haven't been. Coerced, as he could coerce, would not understand that there was no question of refusing him. Leia remembered what Luke had told her of his days serving the Emperor's clone, and shuddered. And as for going to the worlds, the cities still under the rule of the governors and the new warlords, or the worlds where the old houses still hold sway. She shivered, as if chill winds blew down the alley instead of the dense warmth of the drifting fogs. He lent me to too many of them. As a gift. All I wanted to do was... Forget. What were you doing outside the house? Waiting for you, said Roganda simply. For a chance to speak to you alone. I recognized you last night, when your droid malfunctioned. I hope you got it back to the path without mishap. I almost came down to help you, but... On other worlds where I thought to take refuge, I've had bad experiences with those who remembered me from the Emperor's court. And I admit I was unhappy enough to do some foolish things in those days. She averted her face, twisting on her finger the small topaz ring that was probably the only jewel she had left of those days. Maybe, thought Leia, the only thing left unsold after her passage here had been paid. Her hand was still white and small and fragile as a cage-reared bird. I lost my nerve, she concluded, not meeting Leia's eyes. Then last night I began to fear that you had recognized me. That you might speak of it to your husband, and he to others here. I... I made up my mind to come to you in private. To beg for your silence. A bright drift of music keened from the market as the jugglers started setting up their pitches. A busker cried, Step right up, ladies and gentlemen. Three turns and turn them over. Somewhere Leia heard the dim, skeletal clatter of a mechanical tree feeder being walked out of a repair shop back to the orchards, and a musical Ithorian voice sang, Fresh tarts. Fresh tarts. Podden and Brandifert, sweetest in town. While high overhead the vast, flower-decked gondolas of the silk and coffee beds glided along their tracks, lifting and lowering, silent as birds beneath the crystal of the dome. But you didn't. Roganda looked down at her hands again, turning her ring. No, she said. Her long black lashes trembled. I can't. Explain, exactly. I've been so afraid for so long. It's hard to explain to someone who hasn't been through what I've been through. She raised pleading eyes to Leia's, darkness and old memories shimmering in them like unshed tears. Sometimes it seems I'll never cease being afraid. The way it seems some nights that I'll never cease having nightmares about him, for as long as I live. It's all right. 
Leia's voice sounded gruff and awkward in her own ears, shaky with the memory of her own nightmares. I promise I won't betray you to those who live here. Thank you? Her voice was barely a whisper. Then she smiled tremulously. You're sure you won't have coffee with me? I make it rather well. Leia shook her head. Thank you, she said and smiled back. Han will be wondering where I've gone. She started back for the market square, then turned, remembering something else. Something her aunt Selly had whispered to her in a corner when Aunt Rouge was over-lecturing the head of the house elegin about the proper deportment of its science. Roganda. Didn't you have a son? Roganda looked quickly away. Her voice was almost inaudible under the musical chatter of the market. He died. Turning swiftly, she vanished into the mist, the white swirl of it absorbing her like a white-robed ghost. Silent in the narrow alleyway, Leia recalled the day the rebels had taken Coruscant. The Emperor's palace endless, gorgeous maze of crystal roofs, hanging gardens, pyramids of green and blue marble shining with gold. Summer quarters, winter quarters, treasuries, pavilions, music rooms, prisons, halls, grace and favor residences for concubines, ministers, and trained assassins had been shelled hard and partially looted already rebel partisans having killed whichever members of the court they could catch. These had included. If Leia remembered correctly, not only the president of the Bureau of Punishments and the head of the Emperor's School of Torturers, but the court clothing designer and any number of minor and completely innocent servants of all ages, species, and sexes whose names had never even been reported. As Leia walked back across the market square she thought, no wonder she was twisting her hands in fear. And stopped to be cursed at by the driver of a puttering mechanized barrow of cheap shoe kits from Gerajader, but she hardly noticed. She was seeing, suddenly, the topaz ring on Roganda's hand a hand smaller even than her own, childlike, and completely innocent of either bandages, small cuts, or purple stains. You can't pay for much elegance on a fruit packer's wages. Also Nim's old pal Chatty had had at least three bandages on his fingers. So had half the clientele of the smoking jets, and most of the people she passed in the market. Bandages on their fingers, and purple hands or red, or yellow, depending on whether they were packing bauvine, brandifert, lipana, or vine coffee. And Podden and Slokin were sturdy enough to be packed by droids. Leia found herself wondering, as she walked quickly back toward the house on Old Orchard Street, what would have happened to her if she'd gone with Roganda to her rooms for coffee. Chapter 14 Who are you? The words glowed in amber silence in the almost darkness of the quartermaster's office on Deck 12. Somewhere in the distance a sweet, complex humming echoed in the labyrinth of corridors and rooms the tall singing in their hidden enclave of junior officers' staterooms. 3PO, before he'd shut down, had tried to tap into the will on this terminal and had reported that though power still functioned in some of its circuits, cable-greedy Jawas had torn out the computer connections somewhere up the trunk line. Perhaps, thought Luke, that was one reason he felt instinctively safe here. The far-off wailing halted, then resumed with transmuted rhythm. Even the air circulators were silent. The room smelled of Jawas, Talls, the vanilla whiff of the Kittenax clump like podgy mushrooms at the end of the corridor, chatting endlessly in their soft, squeaking voices. Luke gazed into the onyx well of the screen and felt suddenly tired unto death. Who are you? He felt that he already knew. The words swam up out of the depth, whole not letter by letter as if it had existed there for a long time. Callista, his breath paused. He hadn't actually thought this would work. Then, she's all right. They haven't harmed her. Not beyond what she'd taken a rough training session relief was a flood of sensation so violent it was almost like a headache, release bordering on physical pain. 
thank you, typed Luke. He was struck by the absolute bald inadequacy of the words on the screen. Something you'd say to someone who moved a chair out of your way when your hands were full. Nothing to do with the interrogator droids in the detention area. Nothing to do with the bruises on Cray's face, or the dead, bitter look in her eyes. Nothing to do with the Gamorreans holding the screaming Jawa over the shredder. Thank you, he whispered aloud, to the no longer quite empty darkness of the room. Thank you. They're on deck 19, in the starboard maintenance hangar. They've dismantled half a dozen ties to make their village or mud hub has, anyway. It's the sows who do all the work there was a pause. Fortunate, since the boars are about as smart as the average cement extruder and aren't good for much besides getting into fights and making little gammerians. Can you get me up there? I can take you to the cargo lift shaft they're using as a communications tunnel. They've got it booby-trapped and guarded. Can you levitate? Yes. I've been you don't have to keyboard, you know. Internal surveillance had every room and corridor on this ship wired. Charming people. I've been using Paragon for my leg, said Luke, still looking at the screen, as if it were a wall or a blackout window behind which she dwelled. It's beginning to interfere a little with my concentration, but I can manage. Even as he said it, he shivered. In addition to the painkiller's eventual side effect of reduced concentration, fatigue, exhaustion, and the slow grind of constant pain were eroding still more his ability to manipulate the force. The thought of self-levitating over a lift shaft hundreds of meters deep was an unnerving one. Again he asked, meaning it differently, Who are you? She didn't reply. After a very long time, more amber words appeared on the screen. The droid with her, the droid with the living eyes, what is he? What is this? Is this a new sort of creature Palpatine thinks he can use? What is this that's happening between them? Palpatine's dead. Laser light showing up the Emperor's bones within his flesh. The pain in his own bones, his own flesh, destroying him. Darth Vader's voice. He pushed the images from his mind. The Empire has broken into six, maybe ten major fragments, ruled by warlords and governors. The Senate's in control of Coruscant and most of the Inner Rim. A new republic has been established and is growing strong. The screen white dark for a moment. Then, spreading and flashing across it, a growing design, a dancing spiral geometry of outflung joy. Her joy, Luke realized. The essence, the heart of what he himself had felt in that tree village on Enda's green moon, when he knew that the first terrible hurdle had been cleared. Music by someone who no longer had a voice. The joy dance of the bodiless. Triumphal delight and utter thanks. We won, we won. I died, but we won. If she had been here, he knew she would have flung herself into his arms. Like Triv Pothman, she'd been waiting a long time. What she said was, You have made this worth it for me. The designs whirled themselves across every screen in the room and then away, like a ring of dancing waves moving outward. Luke said softly, Almost. Another long pause. He knew it was half jesting, and he laughed. Your master Luke? Is Kalrishin your real name? Skywalker, he said. Luke Skywalker. He was conscious of the silence implicit in the suddenly black screen. Anakin's son, he added quietly. It was Anakin who killed Palpatine. There was nothing on the screen still, but as if he looked into another person's eyes, he sensed the changing tides of her thought the wondering contemplation of the vagaries of time. Tell me. Another time, said Luke. What happened to this vessel? This mission? What started it again? How long do we have? 
How long we have I don't know. I am side by side with the will, but there are things of the will that I do not and cannot touch. Thirty years I have existed so. I managed to cripple the receptors, and before coming here, damaged or destroyed most of the slaved auto-activation relays that would have triggered the computer's core from a distance. The components of the relay were crashed, shattered, destroyed. No one could have found them to activate this station by that means, but there still remained the danger the station could have been activated manually. That's why I stayed. Then I was right. Luke felt his scalp prickle. I knew it, sensed it. Those guns weren't fired by a mechanical. On a ship this size, I was the one firing the guns. That's where I've been all these years. In the gunnery computers. I was sure you were the Empire's agent. Before you came on board there was no one, nor is there anyone on board save yourself, and the aliens the landers brought in after the will was activated again. I don't understand, said Luke. If no one came on until the will was activated, it was the force. I felt it, sensed it. The broken activation relays were set off, all of these years later. By the use of the force Luke was shock silent, the neat amber letters like a hammer blow hitting him over the heart. The force? He leaned closer, as if to touch her arm, her hand. That's impossible. I know it is. The force can't affect droids and mechanicals. It can't Luke thought about that for a time, about what it meant or could mean. Ether came back to him, and the cold flood of dread as he'd sat in semi-trance at Nichasa's side, the sense of something terribly wrong. The wave of darkness spreading outward, reaching, searching. The random numbers that had led him hear the dream of some terrible attack creeping stealthily through the desert night. But why? Why bomb Belsavis now? There's nothing there. Nothing except Han and Leia and Chui and Arta. Nothing except thousands of innocent people and the usual handful of the not-so-innocent. And Han and Leia hadn't arrived there yet, when he'd felt that first dark surge. To his knowledge nobody had known they were going. All personnel, report to your section lounge. The computer's voter contralto broke abruptly into his thoughts. All personnel, report to your section lounge. Abstention or avoidance will be construed as Better go flash the orange letters on the screen. Can't let your actions be construed as sympathetic to the ill bent of the etc. Watch your back for that moment he could almost see her grin. The Imperial Military Code Section 12 C classifies as capital offenses. Among others. Incitement to mutiny against duly constituted authority. Participation in mutiny. Concealing known or suspected mutineers from central authority of the vessel. Concealing evidence of planned or executed acts of mutiny or sabotage from chain of command. Physical plant or automatic self-checking devices on board any fleet vessel after examination of all evidence, the defendant has been found guilty of mutiny against the central authority of this vessel and of inciting by her participation further mutiny and acts of sabotage by persons unknown. What, are they blaming the Jawas on Cray now? murmured Luke to 3PO, who had switched on again to accompany him to the section lounge. They stood in the portside doorway, half hidden by the Kittenax who had been brought yesterday to observe Cray's trial and had remained there, chatting, ever since. Closer to the screen, the Gaff tribe squealed and snarled and yelled. So it's her fault, the witch. And she's the one behind the Festeran rebels. Despite the excellent record of the accused, it is the decision of the will that Trooper Cray Mingla be executed by laser inclusion at 1,600 hours tomorrow. All personnel are to report to their section lounges. Luke! Cray raised her voice above the voter monotone of the justice station. 
Her face was gray and haggard under the bruises, her dark eyes exhausted and sick with inner pain. Luke, get me out of here. Please get me out. We're on deck 19, starboard front sector, maintenance bay 7. We came up lift shaft 21. It's guarded and booby trapped. The gak feds hooted and yelled, and in the justice chamber the nearest clag guard snapped. Zip it, skag face. And Cray flinched Cray, who despite her makeup and stylishness had never, to Luke's knowledge, shown physical fear in her life. Hot rage flooded him, blotting the pain in his leg. But she went on fast, as the guards seized her arms, dragged her to the door. Lift 21. Ten guards, they ricochet blaster bolts down the shaft to hit the lower doors. There's a booby trap ten meters down the corridor. Yeah, tell us about it, rebel tramp. Blow this laser in collision, steam her. Dump her in the shredder. Throw her in the enzyme tanks. Hey, toss her to the garbage worms. Sixteen hundred hours tomorrow, whispered Luke, icy chill fighting the red rage in his veins. We can. Hey. You. Ugbas, Croc, and three or four other boars stood before him, heavy arms folded, yellow eyes glittering evilly in the reflected glow of the emergency lights that were at this point the only illumination in most of the sector. As more and more systems failed, the ship was growing dark. Since the Jawas were stealing power cells out of the emergency lamps, and any glow rods they could find, someone had set burning wicks and red plastic bowls of cooking oil all around the lounge there had already been one fire in a nearby rec room from the same source. The MSEs and SPADS were still cleaning up the sodden mess left by the overhead sprinklers when Luke had passed on the way to the section lounge. He'd seen Jawas, like mermans at a picnic, carrying away several MSEs and looting the power cells out of the larger droids. The whole section smelled now of gamerians and smoke. I put your name through central computer, Kaurishan. Ugbas planted himself between Luke and the doorway. Exhausted as he was, Luke found it a strain even to focus the force on Ugbas's mind. I'm not Major Kaurishan. That's what the computer says, pal, snarled Croc. So who are you and what are you doing on this ship? We know what he's doing. You're thinking of someone else. But Luke felt the cold shadow of something else in their minds, the ugly certainty of the will. Turning to the nearest Kittenak, 3PO reeled off an endless chain of whistles, buzzes, and glottal stops, to which all the Kittenaks listened intently while Ugbas growled. There's something funny going on here since you first came on board, mister. And I think you and I need to have us a little talk about it. The Gamorreans closed in around Luke at the same moment that the Kittenax, with a sudden burbling ripple of interest, closed in and as one entity seized the Gamorreans, each Kittenak grasping a Gamorrean's arm in huge, stubby hands. And they began to talk. Luke darted between them. Grab him! Yelled a buzz between the two portly mushrooms that held him in a grip like stone. He tugged furiously at their hold but he might as well have tried to unembed his hand from fast-set concrete. The Kittenax, having found an audience for whatever it was they had to say, were not letting go. And somebody get these stinking yasbos off me! Two Erzat's troopers were already trying to free their compatriots with axes as he ducked through the lounge door, yanking 3PO after him. Luke saw the axe blades bounce harmlessly off the Kittenax. Rubbery hides. Then the door hissed down behind him with a furious snap. Deck 6, laundry drop appeared on the narrow monitor plate where the door's serial combination would usually be shown. Luke grabbed 3PO by the arm and hobbled. Behind them the door jerked in its tracks, rising half a meter or so. There was furious pounding curses, the sizzle of blaster bolts that sang and zapped and ricocheted wildly in the section lounge and a moment later as the Gamorreans finally got out in the hall. The fugitives ducked down a cross corridor and across an office pod, hearing behind them a mellifluous treble outcry of, After them! After them! 
Luke swung around, gathered all the waning strength of the force to sweep every desk and chair in the room like the blast of some huge hurricane at the multicolored riot of Aphitekans who came barreling through the door. They tripped, fell, tangling in calm cords and terminal cables Luke's mind flashed out, transforming the cables for a moment almost into the semblance of living things, grabbing snake-like at his pursuers. He staggered, his mind aching, and 3PO dragged him on. You go first, he gasped, not knowing if he could levitate 3PO down eight decks of repair tube. He fell to his knees, trembling in a sweat of exhaustion before the open panel. Master Luke, I can remain behind. Not after that trick with the kittenax you can't, gasped Luke. What did you say to them? 3PO paused halfway through the panel an incredible display of trust considering that he was not flexible enough to use the latter rungs. I informed them that Ugbuzz had expressed an interest in their ancestors' recipe for Dalmat pie. That's what they've been discussing all this time, you know. Exchanging recipes. And genealogies. Luke laughed, and the laughter gave him a kind of strength. Closing his eyes, he called the force to him, lifting the golden droid within the dark confines of the shaft. Lowering him. There is no difference between that leaf and your ship, Yoda had said to him once. Raising a single yellow-green leaf the size of Luke's thumbnail, making it dance in the warm, wet air of Dagoba. No difference between that leaf and this world. Luke saw the leaf small, light, shimmering, Shiny gold descend the blackness of the shaft. Voices in the corridor behind him. The Gamorrean's curses and squeals, the stern soprano yammering of the rainbow Aphitekans. He dragged himself into the shaft, hung for a moment on the ladder of staples, trying to summon the strength to levitate himself down. Trying to summon even the physical strength to hang on while he shifted his good leg down one rung, then one rung more. You can. He felt her, knew she was there with him. Luke, don't give up. He couldn't levitate. In the corridor he heard Abba's swear, Croc yell. That way, Captain. Feet thundered away. Rung by rung, one aching drop at a time, Luke descended, the shaft falling away bottomlessly below him. He felt the warmth of her the awareness, beside him every agonizing meter of the way. Deck six was utterly dark. The dead air stank of Jawas, of oil, of insulation, of Luke's own sweat as he dragged himself along its lightless corridors, his shadow and three pios lurching like drunkards in the dim flicker of the glow rods on his staff. Even those were failing he'd have to cannibalize a power cell from somewhere, and the thought of that niggling little chore made his whole aching body revolt. Ahead of him, and in all directions, he heard the squeak and scuffle of Jawa feet, saw the firebug glimmer of their eyes. 3PO, he thought. They'll be after 3PO if I pass out. Now and then he smelled, and heard the talls, and breathed a sigh of thanks that the sand people, being essentially conservative, would defend their own territory rather than explore new corridors at this stage of the game. Everywhere he saw torn-out panels, looted wiring, SPs and MSCs lying gutted and derelict along the walls. Helmets, plates, dismantled blasters and ion mortars strewed the halls Luke checked the weapons and found that, one and all, they'd had their power cells pulled. Limping painfully down the echoing blackness, Luke had the eerie sensation of being trapped in the gut of a rotting beast, a zombie killer still bent on destruction though its body was being eaten from within. This section of Deck 6 was dead to the will. No wonder Callista had directed him here. Cray. Somehow they had to rescue Cray. she know how to cope with the will, know how to disable the artificial intelligence that ruled this metal microcosm. Sixteen hundred hours. His whole body felt on the verge of collapse. Somehow he'd have to get enough rest to get up the lift shaft tomorrow. Thirteen levels. His mind flinched from the thought. 
They ricochet blaster bolts down the shaft. Callista. But there was no reply. I exist side by side with the will. She had died in the computer core. Luke had seen how the spirit of the Jedi could detach itself from the physical body, could imbue itself in other things, as Exer Kunz had imbued the stones of Yavin. Knowing she had Dissa for the automatic trigger knowing the Empire might very well send an agent to trigger the eye manually she had stayed in the gunnery computers for thirty years, guarding the entry to the machine that had taken her life, a fading ghost keeping watch on a forgotten battlefield. Come on, 3PO, he said, and bent to retrieve a hank of cable from the corpse of a gutted MSE. Let's find ourselves a terminal, Aunt Chad Callista said, the letters fading in slowly as a single paragraph, as if rising whole from the depths of her recollection. If our ark were in Wisto territory and Wisto hunt most of the deep oceans where our ranch was and we had to make a hull repair, or go out to the herd to help an off-season calving, we'd send out something called a footwitter the night before, a floater that made some kind of hooting or tweeting. Since Wisto are frantically territorial, they'd all head for the thing which by then would be kilometers from the ark and that would give Papa or me or Uncle Clay a chance to do what we had to do in open water and get back to safety. Would the Clags respond to a footwitter long enough for you to get up the shaft? They seem pretty territorial to me. If it sounded like Ugbuzz and the Gakfeds, they would. Luke leaned back into the heap of blankets and thermal vests 3PO had gathered to make cushions for him in the corner of a repair shop, and considered the screen before him. It had taken most of his salvaged batteries and power cells, rigged in series, to fire up even the smallest of the portable diagnostic units in the shop. With the Jawas in control of most of the deck it would be a hard search for more. But it was a trade-off he was willing to make. Not just that he needed Callista's advice, he realized. He wanted her company. Any of the bigger game systems in the lounges will have voters, he said at length. 3PO, you know the stats on Gamory and vocal range, don't you? I can reproduce exactly the language and tonalities of over 200,000 sentient civilizations, replied the droid, with perhaps pardonable pride. Gamorrean verbal tones begin at 50 hertz and run up to 13,000. Squeals begin at. So you could help me program the voter? With the greatest of ease, Master Luke. Then what we need is a way to get the voter up to deck 19 in time to pull the clad guards away from the shaft. A schematic appeared on the screen. Not the precise, every wire and conduit blueprint a ship's computer would display but a more or less to scale sketch of a section of the vessel, labeled in one corner deck 17. A bright circle flashed around a gangway. Then a window appeared in the screen. The gangway's wired. It leads from recycling the area of the ship where only the droids go to deck 19. If you make your footwitter light enough, you should be able to propel it up fast while you keep the inclusion grid misfiring enough to let it through without too many hits Luke thought about it. That's how you did it? He asked at last. Caused the grid to misfire? A long hesitation. The schematic faded from the screen. At some slight sound in the corridor, 3PO clanked his way out to check and the whitish glow of the screen edged his golden form in threads of light as he stood listening in the utter black of the doorway square. It's like causing a blaster to misfire. You can't keep them all from firing there are too many, and some of them always get through and you can't keep all the bolts from hitting you another long pause. She would, Luke thought, have avoided his eyes, as Leia sometimes did when she spoke of Bail Organa, not letting him see her grief. The more that hit you, the more that will. But if you case the voter in a gutted tracker droid, you can shoot it up the shaft fast enough to survive a few hits. And a mechanical can absorb a lot more hits than human flesh the more that hit you, thought Luke with a chill, the more that will. She climbed the shaft from the gun room, knowing she'd be hit. 
knowing the first hit would break her concentration on the force, damage her ability to keep the grid from firing, lessen her chances to avoid the second. And the second hit would lessen her chances to avoid the third. He remembered how the clag's blood had trickled down the steps, and the smell of burned flesh. His heart contracted within him, aching, as the silence lengthened. Very softly, he said, I wish it hadn't happened. Wise, powerful, comforting, he approved with bitter sarcasm. The wisdom of a true Jedi master. It's all right they were silent for a time, as if they stood on either side of fathomless night, reaching across to fingers that could not touch. Were you from Chad? The screen was dark for a long time. He almost feared he'd offended her by asking, or that the batteries had failed. Then words came up, white flowers in the sunken meadow of the void. We had a deep water ranch. We moved with the herds along the algic current, from the equator almost to the arctic circle. The first time I used the force was to move pack ice one winter when I got trapped with a band of cows. Papa never understood why I couldn't stay, if I was happy. Were you happy? He looked down at the lightsaber she made for herself, on Dagoba, perhaps, or on whatever planet she'd taken her training. She'd put a line of Tselka around its hand grip, in memory of the tides of her home. I think more happy than I've ever been since Luke didn't ask. Then why did you leave? He knew why she'd left. It's funny, he said softly. I always hated tattooing, always hated the farm. Now in a way I think I was lucky. It cost me nothing to leave. Even if my family hadn't been killed, it would have cost me nothing to get out of there. The force was like the pull of the tide like the deep ocean currents that carry the herds on their backs. From the time I was a child I knew there was something there. When I learned what it was, couldn't not seek the Jedi. But you also couldn't explain. Any more than he could explain to Uncle Owen and Aunt Burr the inner tide pulling at him, almost before he knew how to speak. They're dead, you know, he said softly. The Jedi. Another long darkness, like a hollow in her heart. Then I know. I felt. The emptiness in the Force. I knew what it meant, without knowing he took a deep breath. Obi-Wan Kenobi hid out for years on tattooing. He was my first teacher. After he. Killed I went to Dagoba, to study with Yoda. Yoda died. About seven years ago. After I left him. The old grief, the old bitterness, rose in him like a faded ghost. His last pupil. And I left him, only to return too late. He thought about K.Y.P. Duran, his own finest student, about Streen and Silgal and the rest of the tiny group in the jungles of Yavin. About Teninil of Dathomir, and Cray and Nichas, and Jason and Jaina and Anakin and all he'd gone through the hellish forge of the dark side, the emperor's secret fortress on Wayland and all that had happened there. Exerquin and the melted holocrin, Gantoris's ashes smoking on the stones of Yavin and the destruction of worlds. His heart was the diamond heart of a Jedi, forged and hard and powerful, but the pain he felt inside him was no less for that. Almost to himself, he whispered something he hadn't even said to Leia who was like the other half of his soul. Sometimes it seems like there's just such a long way to go. Master Luke. Threepio appeared once more in the doorway. Master Luke, it appears that the Jawas wished to speak with you. He sounded as if he disapproved in advance of whatever it was they might have to say. They're asking what you have to trade for wire, power cells, and blasters. You know said Luke, angling a palm-sized diagnostic mirror to see the delicate fastenings of the voter box as he hooked it to the tracker droid's gutted casing. 
If somebody had offered me odds on which group of my fellow guests on this little tour had taken the rooms next to the transport shuttles, I'd have bet my boots and lightsaber on it being the sand people. It had to be them, didn't it? It's something even the masters don't reveal about the inner nature of the secret heart of the universe the words appeared, minuscule, in the voters' monitor screen. Luke hadn't been aware he'd glanced there automatically for a reply. The deepest and darkest secret of all that the Force lets you see. What? She made a whisper by reducing the letters to the tiniest readable specks. The universe has a sense of humor Luke shuddered. I'll have to be a lot higher level Jedi than I am before I even want to think about that. And he felt her rare laughter like a shimmering of the dark air. Working on the tracker he'd gotten from the Jawas it was the one Kray had disabled on Zob. And at the cost of considerable pain he had used the strength of the Force to heal one of their number of the headache and nausea left over from a bad stun blast. And another of electrical burns on its hands he talked about tattooing, and Obi-Wan, and Yoda, about the fall of the Empire and the struggles of the New Republic, about Bakura, and Garyl Capiston, about Leia and Han and Chewie and Arta, about the Academy on Yavin, and the dangers to the unfledged, untried, untaught adepts whose power was growing without any sure knowledge of what to do with it or how to guide it, about Exerquin, about his father, and hesitantly, a sentence or two at a time. On the tiny monitor screen or the larger diagnostic whichever he'd been nearer at the time Callista had been slowly drawn out, about growing up on the ranch on Chad, about the father who never understood and the stepmother who'd been too baffled and unhappy herself to comprehend either of them. About the moons and tides, ice and phosphorus, and the singing of the Syene far out in the deeps. About Jin Altus, the Jedi Master who had come to Chad, and the Jedi Enclave on the spin, floating unknown among the clouds. It was like riding a sighing the diagnostic screen flashed a thick. Long-necked fish lizard, huge and matchlessly beautiful and shining with wild power, and Luke felt in the darkness, just for an instant, the touch of salt wind and leash strength and heard the songs the creatures sang running free in their herds. Huge and fast and scary, shining like bronze in the sunlight. But I could do it. Barely. Yes, said Luke, remembering the power of the force flowing into him as he'd battled Exerquin for the final time, and that first moment when the lightsaber he'd called to his hand on Hoth tore itself free from the snowbank and flew into his grip. Yes. He told her about Cray and Nichas, and why they'd gone to Ither to seek the help of the healers there, about Drub McCum's attack, and Han and Leia's mission to Belsavis. It hasn't been that long, said Luke, sitting back and keying the Twitter's makeshift remote. Nothing happened. Resignedly, he undid the fasteners, angled the mirror again, and tried the second of several possible hookups to the A-size power cell. He'd stripped out all the armaments and gripper arms, and most of its memory cores, knowing he'd have to fling it up a long tunnel by effort of his mind alone. They're still going to be there. Even if they weren't, there's a whole city on the site now, nearly 30,000 people. It's hard to imagine the words appeared on the monitor, close beside his eyes. Plett's house was just a little place, though the crypts went back into the cliff, and all ways up under the glacier. But the part that was outside was just a big stone house, set in the most beautiful garden I've ever seen. I grew up without gardens you don't have them, on the sea. Nor in the desert. I remember it was quiet, like few places I'd been or seen. Maybe night on the ark, after everyone was inside, and the stars come clear down to the edge of the world. But sweeter, because even when it's sleeping, you never can trust the sea. Master Luke? Luke sat up, aware that his back ached and his hands were trembling with fatigue. Thripio came in, yellow eyes twin moons in the almost dark of the single glow rod's light. 
The smell of coffee floated around him like an exquisite sunset cloud. I do hope you'll find this acceptable. The golden droid set down the plast cafeteria tray and began removing dish covers. The nearest working mess room of which Callista had been aware had been the Deck 7 officer's lounge, and 3PO had volunteered to make the trek while Luke dismantled the tracker the Jawas had traded to him. Selection was rather limited, and those items for which you expressed preference were not to be found. I chose alternates with the same proportion of protein to carbohydrate, and more or less the same texture. Noah, this is great. Ordinarily Luke wouldn't have touched Guktag, but he'd been so long without food that anything sounded good. Thank you, 3PO. Did you have any trouble? Very little, sir. I did encounter a group of Jawas, but the Talls chased them away. The Talls think very highly of your efforts to feed and care for the tripods, sir. Are they down here, too? The Guktags were absolutely horrible, but Luke ate both of them and was a little surprised at how much better he felt. Oh, yes, sir. Both Talls and tripods. The Talls wish me to convey their goodwill to you and ask if they can be of service. Luke wondered momentarily if a Tals would be any more reliable at selecting edible food for human consumption than a droid, then dismissed the thought. By the time he needed another meal, he'd be long out of here. Good job there are two transports, remarked Callista, when Luke returned to work. You couldn't take the clags and the gakfeds off on the same vessel. And which one of them gets to ride with the sand people? Lander. They'll never go in it said Luke. They hate small enclosed spaces. I wondered why they keep knocking holes in walls. You'll be lucky if they don't sever the main power trunk to the magnetic field. Another reason to hurry, said Luke grimly. This whole ship must be driving them crazy. Not that they were ever real good company to begin with. You sound like you've studied them, Luke laughed. You could say they were my next-door neighbors growing up. Them and the Jawas. Everybody who lives on Tatooine has to learn enough about the sand people to stay out of their way. He leaned back and flicked the remote. A harsh, guttural voice boomed. Very well, men, fan out and remain quiet. We are going to massacre those smelly clag rebel saboteurs. Luke sighed and shook his head. 3PO? Little change in the script here. My, what a grammatical storm Troopper commented Callista, where the protocol droid couldn't see. Luke grinned as he hooked up the cable. Edit that too. Okay, men, fan out and keep quiet. We're gonna kill them stinking clag rebel saboteurs. You forgot to say, sir. Luke started to make the gesture of elbowing her in the arm as he did when Leia made a smart mouth remark, but stopped. He couldn't. Her arms were dust and bone on the gun deck floor. Yet she had no more question than he did himself that somehow, all the eyes captive sand people and Gamorreans as well as the Talls, the Jawas, the Aphitekans and Kidanax and the baffled, helpless tripods had to somehow be taken to safety. It wasn't their fault, or their wanting, that they were here, he thought, angling the mirror to affix the voters' fasteners once again. Savage, violent, destructive as they were, like himself they were captives. He moved the mirror, seeking the fasteners, and for a moment saw in it his own reflection, and a sliver of the room behind him, three peel like a grimed and dented golden statue in the feeble glare of the work light, compulsively tidying up the abandoned tray. And close beside him, Visible clearly over his shoulder, the pale oval face within its dark cloud of hair, the gray eyes from which sorrow had faded a little, replaced by caring, by interest, by renewed life. Luke's heart turned over within his ribs, and knowledge fell on him knowledge, horror, and grief like inevitable night. Chapter 15 She might have had other reasons for lying. Like what? 
Leia folded her legs up tailor fashion on the bed and sipped the glass of pot and cider she'd picked up on her way through the kitchen. The craftsman Javax had promised had made their appearance while Leia was out. The metal shutters, armed with a formidable new lock, were nearly out of sight in their wall sockets on either side of the tall windows, and a new bedroom door was folded into its proper slot. Even the cupboard had been fixed. Sitting on the other end of the bed, Han was checking both blasters. Like she might be working at Madame Loda's House of Flowers down on Spaceport Row. Leia wondered why it hadn't crossed her mind before. Dressed like that? He gave her his crooked grin. I suppose you're dressed for your job? She brushed a dismissive hand over the plain dark linen of her shirt, the knockabout cotton fatigue pants, and high lace boots. She wouldn't have been on the path by the Muni Center last night if she were working the bars. The pile of hard copy Arto had made for them that first day strewed the bed between them. Nowhere was Roganda Ismer enlisted on any employer record of any packing plant in Plal. And if she'd followed me there from the marketplace, for instance, she wouldn't have been dressed like that at that hour. While she was speaking, Han rose and walked out to the balcony, took aim at a small clump of ferns a few meters away in the orchard, and fired. The ferns sizzled into oblivion. He flipped the safety back on and tossed the weapon to Leia. Good as new. So what did you find in the town records? It seemed like a thousand years ago. Returning last night to find a soaked and exhausted Han patching Chewie's cuts had driven from her mind the web of speculation fed by the records themselves, and after Mara's subspace call, her mind had been on other things. Not what I was looking for, said Leia slowly. No mention of the Jedi. Or of Plet himself. Though it's obvious they were behind the different kinds of plants growing here and that they set up the archiving programs the municipal records time shares off the Brathlin slash galactic slash imperial fruits computer. But all the archiving programs look like they were originally designed for some kind of 460 model, which puts it back to the date the Jedi were here. Naturally, Nobody knows where that original computer went to but my guess is it got sold for chips and wire to Nublik when the new one was put in. Good guess, muttered Han. Not what I want to hear, but a good guess. Any record of what happened to Nublik? She shook her head. He just disappeared one night about seven years ago. His nightclub was taken over by his associate, Brand Kempel who also took over his import and export business on Pandawerton Lane. Slights on the record as having bailed out Drub McCum twice from charges of running stuff in through the corridor. Kempel never bailed out McCum at all. After Kempel took over, McCum is listed as having been bailed out once by Mubbin the Wiffid. This was right after Slight disappeared though at no time is McCum ever listed as having legally landed a ship at the port. Now the interesting thing is. Chewbacca appeared in the doorway with an interrogatory growl and gestured out into the front room, where a signal was coming in on the subspace. The code was for Leia, and the image was scrambled. Leia punched in the unscrambler sequence, and the dazzling buzz of green, brown, and white pixels resolved itself suddenly into the image of Admiral Akbar. This may not mean anything, princess said the Calamarian in his soft, rather sibilant voice. Still, I thought you ought to know about it. I've received reports from operatives in the Senex sector and the adjoining portions of the Juvex sector. They say that the heads of six or seven of the old houses the ones who've been lying low, staying out of the border fighting and not committing to the warlords of the Empire have all gone, on vacation without taking their families or their mistresses. Oh, yeah? Han raised his brows. Now, that's serious. The Admiral folded his squamous hands, a ghostly image in the subspace hollow, 
like a statue rod of mist in the receiver cubicle. This is curious enough, but it coincides almost exactly with the vacations taken by the uncommitted ex-governors of Varan and Musabir III and with representatives of the Sainar Corporation and a high-up member of the Mikuin family. Drost Elijan, the head of House Elijan, evidently took his family but left them on Ariadu. That's a sort of epidemic of rudeness all of a sudden, remarked Han, standing behind Leia with folded arms. Any troop movement? None so far. The calamarian touched the slim stack of report wafers on the desk just visible at his side. Nothing from the larger warlords. But our operatives on Spuma seem to think there's increasing recruitment in basic trooper levels into Admiral Harsk's fleet. And sources within the Sanar Corporation say there's some kind of major funding in the wind Sanar is ordering new equipment to produce energy cells and stepping up thermal fabric production. But nothing concrete. Still, considering how close Belsavis lies to the Senex sector, Your Excellency, you may want to consider coming into a more protected area. Thank you, Admiral, said Leia slowly. We're almost finished here. She brought the words out reluctantly. Her chief of staff was right, she knew. If the self-styled Lord High Admiral Harsk was moving or about to move, she was in a desperately exposed position on Belsavis, and something about the assassination of Stinadrizing shot triggered warning sirens in the back of her mind. But she sensed some darker riddle, some deeper and deadlier puzzle, than she'd first come seeking on this world of fire and ice. The Jedi and their children had been here. Roganda Ismarin once the emperor's concubine had come here. Why? And why did something snag in her mind just now, some trace of something she had heard? Drub McCum had worked his way desperately, through blinding nightmares of agony and confusion, halfway across the galaxy to warn her and Han about something. And someone here had thought it worthwhile to murder them while they slept. Admiral Akbar was still watching her face anxiously through the wavery light of the subspace transmission, so she said, We'll be returning soon. Will we? Asked Han as the Admiral's image faded. I don't. I don't know, said Leia softly. If there's some kind of trouble brewing among the old houses of the Senex sector, I think we'll have to. They've kept quiet. Even under Palpatine all they wanted was to be left alone, to rule the so-called natives on their planets however they wanted to. I've heard that before, said Han grimly. The big corporations just love governments like that, Leia sniffed. Ask us no questions and we'll hand you no responsibilities. Yes. She folded her arms uneasily, prowled past Chewie and Artu's quest game and back into the bedroom to stand with one shoulder against the window jam, staring out into the mists of the orchard where that morning she'd seen Roganda Ismarin, nearly invisible among the trees. Of course the woman had every right to take refuge here, beyond the frontiers of the New Republic. The fact that it was, close, to the Senex sector meant little. It was close only in interstellar terms. It wasn't any place any of those ancient aristocrats, those cold-eyed and elegantly groomed descendants of ancient star-faring conquerors, would come. She remembered Drost Elegin from her days at court, and tried to picture that disdainful dandy in this provincial world of fruit pickers and backwater smugglers. They'd even considered Coruscant de Classe. So many bureaucrats, my dear, and Rouge had said. A white-sleeved arm reached around from behind with her abandoned cider glass. So what was the other interesting thing? Oh, said Leia startled. Han leaned against the frame next to her, looking down with quizzical hazel eyes. Yes, said Leia, remembering. All along, there's something about this business of droids going haywire that's bothered me. Bothered you? Han jerked his head in the direction of the living room, 
where Arto's holographic geo figures were rapidly burying Chewbacca's enraged hero. He tried to. But why did he try to? Leia asked. Yes, I know colonies frequently operate with substandard machinery, but in the records I found literally dozens of unexplained malfunctions a year. Even a rough count shows the number has increased dramatically over the past several years. She gestured back toward the bed, with its scattered counterpane of Arto's readouts. Last night, before Arto's attack on us, when I was looking at the records up at the Muni Center I wasn't connecting it with anything. I think I'd like to recheck the causes of those malfunctions. If it was a function of the climate, that would have been constant, not increasing. Not necessarily if their stuff's wearing out. Maybe, agreed Leia. But they're listed on Arta's readouts as unexplained. That means they check for the obvious things, like age and dampness. A few years ago Han would have dismissed it as coincidence. Now he said, So what do you think it was? I don't know. Leia ducked under his arm, crossed to the bed, and fetched her blaster and its holster. But I think I'd like to talk to the head mechanic at Brathlin and see whether those malfunctions were just a fried wire or whether they involved chains of specific, unexpected actions. Like welding the windows shut and putting blasters on overload. Yeah said Leia softly. She gathered the readouts, stowed them in the cupboard. Like that. Want to come? Han hesitated, then said, If we're getting out of here soon, I think I'm going down to the jungle lust. He made a suggestive wiggle with his hips. And have a couple words with Brand Kempel. You want to come, Chewie? There was more behind the request than friendly companionship the last time Arto had beaten Chewbacca at Quest. The game console had ended up hurled through the nearest window, and Arto seemed well on his way to another victory now. He may know something about how and when and mostly why Nublik made tracks out of here, and if he took a ship with him when he left. You're not taking him with you, are you? He added, as Leia, following him into the living room, Cross to touch Arta's dome top. Leia hesitated. She had had it in mind as a matter of course, but then, it hadn't been her scantily covered anatomy Arta had been firing bolts of electricity and not twelve hours ago. Whatever his problem was last night, we don't know if we've solved it yet. Han was checking his blaster as he spoke, in spite of the fact that he'd tested and retested it not half an hour before. If Goldenrod was here he might get some sense out of him, but since he isn't, I say leave him here with that restraining bolt on him till we can get him checked out by somebody better than the local toaster repairman. Chewbacca snarled and aimed a sweat at him with one enormous paw, and Han threw up his hands and grinned. All right, all right. You did a swell job on him, Chewie. He'll make point five pass light speed now and can outmaneuver Imperial patrols. They descended the ramp together, Han, Leia, and the Wookiee. Han gave Leia a quick, hard kiss at the foot of the ramp, and she waved to them as they disappeared into the shifting rainbows of the fog. But when they were out of sight Leia turned back, climbed again to the house, and walked over to the little astromech droid sitting beside the deactivated quest console. Arta? The droid bobbed forward, extending his front. Leg, and gave a timid whistle. His top swiveled to regard her with the round red eye of the visual receptor. Leia often wondered what she looked like through it, and how the shape that was her the shapes that were Luke and Han and Chewie, and the kids appeared to the astromecha's digitalized consciousness. You can't tell me what happened? A wretched whistle, begging for understanding. Did someone tell you to do it? She asked. Program you somehow? His cap swung wildly and he rocked a little on his base. All right. Leia touched his cap again. All right. We'll be out of this place pretty quick. And I'll ask the mechanic about what happened to you. 
Look. She hesitated. Yes, Artu was only a droid, but she knew he'd been hurt by Han's mistrust. I'll be back. No. 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 His desperate whistling and rocking stopped her halfway to the door. Trust your feelings, Luke had said to her many times since she had submitted to his greater wisdom as a teacher. Raised to trust her brain, her intellect raised to trust information and systems Leia found this difficult sometimes, when things looked wrong but felt right. She could almost hear her brother's voice, see him standing beside the little droid. Trust your feelings, Leia. Arto had tried to kill both her and Han not twelve hours ago. Han would choke. But then, she thought, her love for Han was the greatest triumph she'd ever seen of. Looks wrong, feels right. So he didn't have any room to talk. She fetched a bolt extractor from Chewbacca's toolkit in the next room and removed the restraining bolt from Artu's casing. Let's go. This way the mechanic won't have to come back here to have a look at you. She added to herself, I hope I don't regret this. Due to vague uneasiness about taking the less traveled roadways through the orchards again, she turned her steps to the slightly longer route through the town market. The fog was thinner here and the proximity of the buskers, hucksters, and shoppers reassuring. As she climbed toward the bench from this direction, the oddly patchwork structures of the older part of town fell behind her. Only the white prefabs remained, crammed together here into apartment blocks for the packers and shippers, the clerks and mechanics, though lichen, ferns, trailing vines, and even small trees grew out of every chance projection and ledge offered by an uneven fit of the plastine blocks. She wondered what the place had been like when the Mluki had inhabited their massive stone houses clustered against the bottom of the bench, farming their small crops and occasionally going up to hunt on the ice. Not so foggy, certainly, without the dome, and not so hot, though the Yungli rift held the heat well. The orchards wouldn't have extended as far as they did now. There would have been clumps of dense jungle around the warm springs, nothing at all down at the bottom of the valley, where the mudflats, caldera, and steaming gas vents of the rift's true bottom poured forth more minerals than unengineered plants were capable of digesting. Exactly the sort of place a heat-loving, plant-loving, beauty-loving Hoden would seek out. She remembered her vision of Plet, tall and willowy, his flower-like cluster of headstalks faded nearly white. A gentle face, with that look in his eyes Luke had had when he'd come back from servitude to the Emperor's foul clone. Was this a refuge he had chosen, a place to repair, to rest? How had he learned about it, for that matter? The galaxy was filled with planets, worlds, star systems still unexplored, and unless a system was on someone's computer, it didn't exist. Roganda might possibly have heard of the place at court. Although now that she thought about it, that troubled Leia too. And how had Plett liked having the peace of his experiments disrupted by the influx of... How many... Nichos had spoken as if there was a fair-sized gang of children. Leia had had almost a year of raising two enterprising Jedi babies. With Anakin just arrived to provide his own variety of mayhem. After years of quiet meditation, how had the aged reptilite coped with a swarm of them, of all ages, running up and down the tunnels of his crypts, following their own leaders even where their parents had warned them not to go because of the crutch? She stopped in her tracks, Nichasa's deep voice sounding in her ears. The older kids. Lagan Ismarin and Hada Zambil. Lagan Ismarin. Roganda Ismarin's. Brother? Her age was certainly right. A few years older than Leia, a few years younger than Nichas, she would be old enough to remember the world where she had lived. That meant that Roganda Ismarin Palpatine's concubine and member in good standing of his court had come from the blood and the heritage of the Jedi Knights. The Emperor had been hideously strong in the Force. He couldn't have been unaware. 
Anger flushed through Leia like the shock of a burn. She lied. Leia had suspected the other woman had been lying about something, but she realized with sudden clarity that it had all been an act all of it, down to the sweet, frightened tones of her voice. An act calculated to play on her pity. If Roganda was force strong the Emperor might have used her, certainly might have coerced her. But he'd never have simply passed her around to his guests. She came here seven years ago, thought Leia, quickly turning her steps back toward town. She wasn't sure what she should do now certainly not go anywhere near the woman herself. And she was gladder than ever she turned down that invitation to coffee but she wanted at least to find Han, to send word to Akbar, to look again through the records Arta had run out to see if they included port arrivals in the year of Palpatine's death. But as she crossed through the small square at the head of Roganda's narrow street, she saw something that hit her in the pit of the stomach like a club. Emerging from between the dark foundations, the white plastic buildings she saw, across the street and quite clearly, Lord Drost Elegin walking with Dr. Oren Kelder. Leia looked aside at once, as if studying the small stand of sweetberry that someone had planted in the waste space between two buildings. But as Luke had taught her had tried to teach her, in her hectic intervals between trying to be a mother, trying to be a diplomat, trying to keep the new republic from falling to pieces and her children from dismantling per C-3PO she extended her senses, identifying footfalls, breathing, voices. The sense and essence of what people were. Oren Kelda and Drost Elegin. Here. They vanished into the fog almost at once. She crossed a narrow street. R2 trembling behind, followed the sound of the feet, the sense of their presence, cutting ahead through an alley and watching as they passed across its mouth. There was no chance of mistake. Drost Elegin's hair had grayed a little from the days when he'd been one of the most notorious plebeys of the Emperor's court, in and out of the court gazette for scandals about gambling, dueling, amorous affairs he'd mockingly called her Madam Senator and Little Miss Inalienable Rights. Only his brother's position in the Imperial Navy had saved him from severe reprisals after the last of his major scandals that, and the power his family wielded. The flesh of that hawk face had begun to sag, but the tall, gawky graceful form and beaky features were unmistakable to anyone who'd ever seen them. Or in Keldip. She felt as if her skin had been stuffed with red-hot pins. She'd studied his holos until she could see his face in her dreams. His face, lit from below by the glow of the Death Star's activation consoles. Oren Kelda. Nastra Magridi. Bevel Lemelisk. Quisux, though Quisux had been only their dupe. So there was more here far more than just a woman hiding out. Fog cloaked the two men as they took the paths that led through the orchards, where the rushing of water and the faint click and whir of the tree feeders covered our to soft, steady rumble. Now and then one of those huge. Arachniform mechanicals would loom from the mists, picking its way across the path in front of her, intent on its tedious ministrations, and Leia wondered with a sort of chill viciousness if the droids belonging to the primary designer of the Death Star's autosystems ever malfunctioned. Somehow she didn't think so. The ground began to rise in a long, steady ramp. The mist thickened, darkened before them, solidifying into the dripping, vine-festooned monolith of the valley wall. Leia fell back, stepping into the lipana thickets at the bottom of the ramp, Arta following gingerly onto the spongy ground. From here they were definitely committed. They were going to the lift shaft that led to the hangars, from which vehicles could be taken out onto the ice. She heard their voices fading away as they climbed. It seems a long, cold way to go around, she heard Drost Elegin say, in that bronze and velvet voice that every girl and woman at court had seemed to believe when it said the words, I love only you. If the tunnels connect with this smuggler pad, the fewer people who know the way in from here the better. Even you, my lord, 
There was a world of implied offense on Kelda's part in the hasty addition of that last sentence. And at this point, with Organa showing up as she has, we don't know who may be watching. Wishkunk. Distantly the vapors stirred around the closing of the door. Leia and Arthur stepped back on the path, climbed the ramp to the small curved bunker of quick-set permacrete molded into the cliff itself, the plain green Sturdaplast door. Sturdaplast was a material designed only to keep minor fauna out of the bunker and the air conditioning in. She listened through it with only minimal concentration until she heard the characteristic ping of the lift's arrival, and tiny behind the thickness of the door, Elegen's voice asking, is it far out? The last words were cut off, presumably by the lift doors. Leia still counted out two minutes before inserting her card. To her utter relief despite the sound of the lift, for many years with the Rebel Alliance had turned Leia into a confirmed pessimist about things that could go wrong the small lobby in the bunker was empty. She touched the summoning switch and looked swiftly around her. A small metal door proved to be a locker filled with gray mechanics coveralls. She picked the smallest human fit she could find, dug around in the pockets of the others until she located a build cap, which she crammed on her head, shoving her hair up underneath. Is it far out? If Elegin was asking, then Kelda knew. Which meant Kelda had been here longer. How much longer? And Elegin meeting someone? Someone else who'd gone on vacation with wife and children and then dropped them off at a fashionable resort in order to take a fast ship elsewhere? The lift doors opened. Leia stepped in, key to the hangar, the only possible destination. While the lift was ascending she flipped open Arthur's front hatch. Usually the droid was kept spotless, but Chewbacca's rough and ready engineering had resulted in a great deal of soot and grease which she smeared on her face. After a moment's thought she transferred her blaster from her belt to the coverall's copious pocket. She hoped she could carry off the impersonation of an inconspicuous mechanic when she reached the hangar, but if she couldn't. Elegin and Kelder. As she feared they might be. We're just pulling on protective thermal suits preparatory to climbing into the smallest of the available ice walkers. A low-slung vehicle built along much the same lines of a tree feeder, whose dozen long legs were capable of both climbing over the rugged glacial terrain and spreading out to anchor in the face of the brutal winds. They'd heard the lift descending and were watching as Leia came out, but the sight of the slight, shuffling figure in an unbelted gray coverall trailed by an astromech droid was apparently a reassuring one, because they climbed into the ice walker and slammed shut the cowl. A moment later the bay doors cranked open. Leia shuffled over to the crew lockers at the far end of the hangar and pretended to canvas her pockets for keys until the walker moved into the bay. The moment the doors shut behind it she pulled a pair of wires out of her inner pocket and flipped open Arto's hatch again, hooking the bare ends in as Han had showed her once. Okay, Artu, she said grimly. Let's see how good a burglar you'd make. They opened four lockers before they found a tea suit that fit her. The gloves in its pocket were clearly intended for a bith. She reset the oxygen and temperature controls for human levels and checked the seals as she pulled it on. There were a couple of Ikazano speeder bikes of various models in the hangar but Leia regretfully passed them up. Anti-grav vehicles moved fast, but in a high wind environment like the glacier they were worse than useless. Instead she chose a very old mobcat crawler, mostly for its low profile and small engine, which would probably fail to register on a detector if Kelder was watching his trail. She dragged a couple of oil-stained planks over to make a ramp for R2, up the back between the high trapezoids of the treads. You sat back there? She climbed in, shot the canopy into place, and hit the latches. The inner bay door creaked open warm air swirling the powder snow and ice crystals that still strewed the dirty concrete floor. Arta tweeped an affirmative. 
So let's see what's actually going on on this ball of ice. The outer door opened. Bleak winds howled across the wilderness of rock and ice. Bitter, vile, toothbreakingly cold, a hell winter that had already lasted for 5,000 years. Leia said homing coordinates, glanced back to make sure Arta had hooked himself into the guidance computer, and set out across the frozen landscape in the distant ice walker's wake. Chapter 16 In a way, you, princess, are responsible for our choice of target. She could see him still. A tall man, pale as bleached bone, a skull face above the olive-green uniform and behind him the blue-green jewel of Alderaan burning like a dream against the velvet darkness beyond the view screen. Ice spattered on the triple plex of the crawler's bubble, wind rocking the low-slung vehicle like the paw of a huge pit tin batting at a slow-moving slud bug crawling across some hellishly vast kitchen floor. Leia Though her attention was focused on every shutter of the control bar, Every fluctuation of the gauges on the bobbing pattern of yellow lights that marked the ice walker's gawky, arachnoid limbs, far out ahead of her in the wind-torn desolation of the ice was in the deeper part of her mind scarcely aware of it. Her consciousness was back on the Death Star, on Moff Tarkin's colorless eyes. You, princess, are responsible. You are responsible. Had she been? She knew Tarkin. She knew he despised Bail Organa and she knew he was aware of the opposition centered on Alderaan. She knew that under his self-satisfied efficiency he had a spiteful streak the width of the spiral arm and loved to tell people that his or the Emperor's most frightful retaliations were actually the fault of the victims. Of the Atreves sector massacres, he'd said, they have only themselves to blame. She knew, too, that as a military man he'd been dying to try his new weapon to see it in action. To describe its performance to the Emperor, and hear that pale cold voice whisper like dead leaves on stone. It is well. In her heart, she knew he'd intended Alderaan as his target, all along. But in her dreams she was responsible, just as he said. The lights were far out ahead of her on the ice, reeling and dodging among themselves with the motion of the walker's legs like a pack of drunken firebugs. Away from the hot thermals that rose off the plow dome and cleared the dense royal of clouds, storm winds and blowing sleet covered the glacier, cutting visibility and darkening the already feeble daylight to a whirling, cindery gloom. Black bones and spines of rock. Scoured bald by the winds. Thrust like dead islands through narrow rivers of ice. Drifts of snow packed high in places like wind-sculpted desert dunes, and in others the violence of storms had carved the ice underfoot into toothed, ridgy masses, like the waves of an ocean flash-frozen in the midst of storm. Twice crevasses loomed before them, ghostly sapphire depths falling farther than her eye could easily judge in the shadowless twilight. The walker's longer legs had taken them in stride and Leia cursed as she trundled the crawler along the rim for hundreds of meters, looking for a place where the chasms narrowed sufficiently to make the heart-stopping jolt over the emptiness. Rumbling back along the rim to pick up the choppy trail again, she prayed the wind-blown ice hadn't eradicated the walker's marks. Orin Kelder was aboard that walker. Orin Kelder, who had helped design the Death Star. Orin Kelder had been aboard it, watching when Alderaan was destroyed. Leia had more or less forgiven Kui Sux, the Death Star's primary designer, when they had finally met, seeing the woman's stricken horror at what her abilities had wrought. It was a little hard to appreciate how anyone could be naive enough to believe Moff Tarkin's assurances that the Death Star was a mining implement, but she understood that the Amwat woman had been raised in a carefully constructed maze of ignorance, coercion, and lies. And when she had seen the truth, she had had the courage to follow where it led her not something everyone did. But Orin Kelda and Bevel Lemelisk, and others whose names the Alderan Alliance of Survivors had collected had known precisely what they were doing. After the destruction of Alderan, they'd all been dropped at Carita, when the Death Star started its final voyage to destroy the Avon base. 
But all of them had wanted to see the first test of their theories. And Kelda was here. And so was Drost Elegin, she thought, and in all probability the heads of those other old houses, those planetary rulers who headed up the human or humanoid populations of planets settled long ago, rulers who'd hated the Senate's interference with their local power and who hated the Republic more. Those rulers who had only supported Palpatine because he could be bribed to a gentleman's agreement to let them run things as they pleased. They are gathering. Gathering around Rogenda Ismarin, former concubine of the Emperor and child of the Jedi, and who knew what besides? Out in the sooty maelstrom another light glowed briefly blue. It blinked away almost instantly, but Leia saw the moving tangle of the walker's leg markers turn in that direction. Got that, R2? She yelled into the calm, and barely heard the reassuring affirmative chirp. Coarse bearings flashed green on her readouts, and the wind slapped hard as she steered the crawler out from behind a twisted cliff of ice, like some impossible marble monolith thrown up by the restlessness of the volcanic line far beneath. Her hands were shaking, and she was weirdly conscious of the heat of the blood in her veins. In a way, it surprised Leia that nobody had mapped the location of the smuggler pads. Because of the intensive ion storms, high-altitude scans were out of the question, but a ground-level geothermic trace would have been possible. Possible, but not easy, she reflected, fighting the control bar as the crawler heaved up over a talus slope of rotting ice under the feet of another, older cliff. And probably not worth anybody's while. The wind nearly took her off her feet when she climbed out of the crawler in the lee of the scoured black rocks that sheltered the pad. The tea suit was certified below the freezing point of alcohol, and still she felt the cold creep through it as she fought her way up the knife-edged crest of drift and rock to get her first clear look at her goal. It wasn't a pad anymore. Where a sort of bunker had been precast permacrete and designed for little more than an inconspicuous staging point beside a clear space thermoblasted into the rock-hard glacier Leia saw through the screaming sleet the low black walls of what the military referred to as a permanent temporary. Hangar, snow frizzing wildly away from a magnetic field that was clearly both new and extremely powerful. The old permacrete bunker had been added to by others, mostly perm temps. Low-built structures whose black walls blended with the rock of the ridge against which they backed. Were it not for the magnetics they would have been buried by drifts in hours. Leia muttered a word she'd picked up from the boys in the old rogue squadron and edged her way down to the walls, slipping in the heavy packed snow, with Arto's treads squeaking sharply in her wake. The ice walker was gone. That didn't mean the hangar was deserted Leia could see by the melt patterns that something had landed on the ice and been taken into the hangar less than three hours ago, and at a guess they'd have left crew. Above the battering howl of the wind it was difficult to extend her senses into the main shed, but the door to the smaller buildings adjacent to it was on the lee side, and those smaller buildings were empty, anyway. It was a matter of moments, even with gloved fingers and the deepening cold, to have our to hot wear the locks. The stillness when the door slid shut behind them was almost painful. She pulled off her helmet, shook out her hair. The small annex's heating system was a relief, but she could still see her breath in the dim gleam that fell through the connecting passage to the main hangar itself. The ship in the hangar was a Miku and Tikkier model, sleek and dark and curiously reminiscent of the avian hunter for whom the model was named. Tikiars were a favorite, she knew, among the aristocratic houses both in the Senex sector and elsewhere. Two crew. She leaned against the door jamb, listening deeply, focusing her mind through the hazy brightness of the force. Relaxed, watching a smash ball game illegally on the subspace net. The dreadnoughts were getting pasted again. Reassured, she surveyed the annex room behind her. It was filled with packing crates. Stacks of them, piled around the lift doors, 
dark anonymous green plastine bear of destination but emblazoned with corporation logos and serial numbers. Mikuyun made DMP guns and heavy laser carbines. Sanar ion cannons. Scale 50 power cells, size for the smaller, older ties and blast boats. Smaller cells, C's and B's and scale 20's by the dozen. Blaster size. We've lost contact with Baden again, she heard Javax say. That's where they're bringing in the men. The realization came to her, complete and logical. Bring them down the corridor, come in high, drop fast, run along above the ice. Communications between the rifts failed so frequently that it might be a week before anyone took an ice walker out across the glaciers to check. Or more. You getting all this, Arta? She pulled her helmet back on, braced herself as they slipped out to the frozen nightmare outside. She had to cling to the droid for support as they struggled back to the crawler, picked up the trail of the walker's huge grippers across the ice. The astromech tweeped ascent. Orin Kelda, last of the Emperor's fleet designers. Designing something new? She shook her head. Only with an effort now could she see the almost obliterated tracks. Too expensive, beyond even the capacity of a coalition of the Senex lords, and the corporations they dealt with would be wary of backing them on major construction. Kelder had more probably been called in as a consultant on some older apparatus. Maybe the very Jedi equipment Nublik and Drub had been looting and smuggling out all those years ago. But her instincts whispered, no. Something bigger. Something else. Something they'd assassinated Stina Dreesing Shaw over, lest she hear something that would ring familiar from her own studies and notify the Republic of their danger. The black rock outcroppings of the main ridge formed a wind trap east of the hangar itself. No one, thought Leia, grimly hanging on to the crawler's control bar, would have been able to track the sight of the tunnel from the air. The pale sun's light barely penetrated the scudding clouds and only faint scuffs remained of the walker's tracks. She only saw the cave where they left the craft, and the permacrete pillbox that covered the shaft head itself because of the puckery masses of dimples fast fading in the blowing snow. New military structures at the landing pad but no improvements on the shaft head, thought Leia, maneuvering the crawler behind the last spur of rock out of sight of the walker in its cave. And bringing Elegin in the long, cold way around. Don't trust the Senex lords, do we? Snow squeaked under Leia's boots as she crossed to the pillbox and the hot air rushing out around her as the shaft head doors opened to Arta's breaker program made her gasp. She stepped inside quickly, the droid at her heels, and the door slid shut once more. More crates filled the shaft head, bearing all the logos and labels she'd seen before. Mikuin, Sanar, Quad Drive Yards, Pravat the massive consortium in the Selenon system that manufactured and sold uniforms to whoever cared to pay for them. The pale strings of battery-run glow panels threaded around the room showed the floor scratched with fresh drag marks and spotted with oil leaked from second-hand droids. Han. I've got to let Han know. Kill you all, Drub McCum had said. They're gathering. They're there. Five sets of tracks marked the powdered snow that lay all over the cement floor, ending at the doors of the lift. For humans and the broad, short, slightly rounded prints of what might have been a Celestin or a Radian. Leia recalled that many of the executive board of Sena were of the rotund, flat-nosed Celestin race. She recalled other things as well. R2, she said softly. I want to see how this tunnel links up with the smuggler tunnels under Plal itself. But if we get into any trouble... Your default command is to head back to the crawler and get Han. While she spoke, she broke the seals on three of the crates. Helped herself to a flamethrower, a semi blaster carbine, and a force pike, which she assembled swiftly, deftly, as the boys in the Hoth dugout had taught her when it looked as if they weren't going to get out before the Imperials came in. 
Give him coordinates, information, everything. Don't stay to defend me. All right. The droid beat and trailed her onto the lift. The smuggler tunnel would surface somewhere in Plaul, she knew. But from Han's description of the lava caves and the well in its circle of standing stones from the fact that Roganda Ismarin had spent a part of her childhood here she guessed they connected with the crypts under Plet's house as well. What she was concealing there, and how she had managed to thwart sensor probes after people started disappearing, Leia couldn't imagine, but it was clear to her now what had become of Drub McCum and Nubbuck the Slight, and who knew how many more besides. Vader. And Palpatine, Mara had said. And evidently, Palpatine's concubine, though the woman hadn't struck Leia as particularly strong in the Force. Certainly not imbued with that aura of eerie strength, that silence that even as a cocky teenage senator she had felt emanating from the Emperor. What then? Leia slung her weaponry straps over her shoulders and stepped out warily into the dark. For a long distance the smuggler tunnel was simply raw stone, chewed out of the bedrock of the planet under 5,000 years worth of glacier, which ran occasionally through the widened beds of what had once been underground streams. The floor had been smoothed to permit the passage of cargo droids, ramps built, roofs heightened, crevasses bridged. It was easy to follow. All she had to do was move as silently as she could. Later. When the way branched, or cross tunnels were cut in the rock, or when they passed through caves stifling with fumes and smutteringly hot from sullen craters of steaming mud, she listened, stretching out her senses, feeling in the force for the touch, the essence of the five people who led her on. Painted doors street the narrow lane on which Roganda had said she lived tacked onto the vine curtain bench on which Plett's house stood. Before the dome was built, the rift had been periodically subject to storms. Of course the Mluki would tunnel. And of course the smugglers would find at least some of the tunnels in the foundations of those ancient houses. Not all the dwellings on Painted Door Street were built over the older dwellings, of course. But Leia was willing to bet Roganda's was. She had lived here. She had known this place. And she had come back when Palpatine died in the seething heart of his second attempt to cow the galaxy by terror. Why? Leia sensed the swift scramble of claws, the snuffling pant of animal breath, even before Artu whistled his nearly soundless warning. They were far off but coming close fast, their direction almost impossible to determine in the maze of cross tunnels, caves, carved out rooms, ramps and stairways ascending and descending. They're probably tracking us by scent, she said softly. So let's have some light, R2. The droid barely had time to brighten all his panel lights when the things were on them. Radian, human, and Tomb Luki or what had been those races once. Leia identified them even as she cut with the force spike not as clean or as strong as a lightsaber, but in trained hands potentially deadly. It had the advantage of keeping more than one at bay at a time, without danger of ricochets, and as they fell screaming on her, Leia struck at her attackers, cold, scared, and furious. She slashed them Lucky halfway through the neck and swung immediately to the Radian, whose broken metal club gashed open her sleeve and the flesh of her arm. The weight of them nearly overpowered her. There was nothing in them she could warn to keep back nothing that realized they were in danger. When one of the humans ripped the force spike away from her she barely brought the flamethrower up in time, searing at them, blasting them, and they attacked her, still burning, as she caught up the pike again to finish the job. They had hardly fallen when the crutch appeared, slithering out of the darkness to feed on the corpses and the blood. From the depths of the tunnels behind her, around her, in a dozen directions the second Lucky's final cry was echoed by a chorus of screams. Kill you all. Kill you all. She fled down a tunnel, Arthur's beam flashing ahead of her to the archway of an artificial entrance in the rock. She ducked through, 
to an area of cut stone, hewn chambers, ramps of desiccated and crutched nod wood covering steps and changes of level. A bridge crossed a fast-running stream whose water steamed thinly in the hot air. A tunnel where she sensed an echo of the force whispering, Don't come down here. Dead glow panels, small trunk beds and corners. Something huge and hair-matted and stinking fell upon her from a doorway, and Leia slashed without thinking, blood splattering her tea suit as the thing collapsed shrieking at her feet. She sprang over it, R2 nudging past the body, and the air around them seemed to breathe with foul, snuffling, guttural snarls and what might have been stammered, mind-blasted words. Refuge She sensed it, felt a curious lightness, the sudden impulse of safety. A sense of what she'd long been seeking. It lay to her left, calling her, it seemed, through a dark triple arch. An open hall, wide and dark with soda straw stalactites and thin curtains of mineral deposits forming through cracks in the roof. A stream divided the wide room in two, planks thrown across it, but no sign of a bridge. Right, left, and center, three open, arched doorways led out of the room on the far side of the water, and as Leia crossed the plank, the center one called. Distantly, as Artu shined his spotlight into the room beyond the center arch, Leia felt as she had felt looking down from the tower, as if she saw and heard things not of her own time. Children's Voices The bone-deep awareness of the presence of the Force she stepped through the arch, and Arta brightened his lights again. Chips and threads of metal winked at her all the length of the long, barrel-vaulted room. A glass tank a few centimeters thick, empty save for a thin layer of yellow sand. A glass cylinder a meter tall, hermetically sealed and containing only the withered skeleton of a leaf. Beside it on the table lay a ball of black volcanic glass, a gold ring and a crude doll wrought of rag and twigs. The whole back wall of the room was taken up by an exquisitely balanced apparatus of suspended spheres, rings, rods, and pulleys, glistening in enigmatic welcome. Two other machines of shafts and buckets and polished steel balls seemed to beckon, tempt, and tease the mind with a monumental silliness of potential chain reactions. There was a glass sphere filled with dull pinky-gold liquid that seemed to stir colors coalescing briefly at the vibration of her stride. The children were here, thought Leia. The joy and fascination they'd felt seemed to have soaked into the stone of the walls. She might not have found their names, Leia thought. But she'd found their toys. She reached tentatively, touched the sphere of liquid, and where her fingers contacted the glass, molecules of red separated themselves from the pink suspension, hung like dissipating clouds in the fluid atmosphere of the ball. Uncertainly because Luke had taught her nothing of this, though it seemed ridiculously easy once she tried she prodded with her mind, and the liquid separated itself, golden on the top, crimson on the bottom. Something in the color of the crimson made Leia look deeper, summon the force. In the blood-colored molecules were hidden enough of a third color to form between the existing zones a narrow band of cobalt blue. Jason and Jaina need these, she thought. Anakin, when he grew older. There were other things, maddeningly simple things she could not understand. Why a circle of empty bowls, straight-sided and of varying size? What went in them? Leia could see nothing on the black tabletop except gray stains like watermarks. Was the composition of the table part of the riddle? Dense and shiny, it looked like lacquer until she touched it, but under her fingertips it clearly said, Wood. What were all those weirdly heavy metal spheres, lined up according to size in a rack? The bars, ropes, hanging beams of the ceiling were self-explanatory. Or were they? Luke has to see this. None of this was mentioned in the holocron, or in the records Luke had salvaged from the wreck of the Jedi ship Chuan Thor. Maybe they didn't think it worth recording, as we don't think to mention the alphabet when we write literary criticism. 
or stop to explain the human enzyme system at the start of a love story. Or the human need for oxygen, for that matter. Perhaps it was premonition, some dark tension in the air that keyed and stretched Leia's senses. But amid the shadows of levers and pulleys of that great toy on the wall she caught sight of something half familiar and, stepping forward, pulled it from where it had been tucked almost out of sight. It was a small packet of black plastine, powdered with a dirty residue whose smell brought back to her the dim blue-green grotto of the Cloud Mother's healing house. Tamla L's soft voice saying, Yarek. New, she thought. Not anything the Jedi would have left here. But who? By the doorway, Arto whistled a warning. Leia froze, not breathing, reaching with her mind into the dark. The shrieks and snuffles of the mind-stripped guardians of the tunnels were mute. But the air itself seemed to thicken, coalescing, sinking in on itself. The Force An enormous darkness, masquerading as the silence of nothing there. Then from the darkness she heard a very faint, chittinous scratching. Some shift of pressure, a change of the deep, hot atmosphere of the caves brought her the smell, like the vast exhalation of rotting sugarcane or the decaying debris of the fruit-packing plants, a chemical dirtiness that lifted the hair on her nape. Let's get out of here, Arta. She slid the packet back where she had found it, crossed quickly to the door, and Arta flashed the beam of his spotlight past her, to the ebon silk of the water flowing down the center of the room, and the stretch of floor beyond it. The floor moved. Glistening shapes heaved over one another like a lake of black jewels amid a vast, filthy scratching of claws. I wouldn't advise it, your highness. Roganda Ismarin, small and pale and fragile-looking in her white gown, stood framed in the narrow archway to Leia's right. Beside her stood a dark-clothed boy, like her slim and raven-haired, like her small, with a suggestion about him of wiry grace. Orin Kelder, Drost Elegin, and another man stocky, hard-faced, fifty, in black stood grouped behind. Artur, go! Ordered Leia. No. Roganda only gestured. Elegin and the third man strode to cut Arto off before he reached the bridge and Leia brought up the flamethrower. The dark-haired boy snickered derisively and said, Oh, please! And Leia, warned by some instinct, flung the weapon from her as the tank glowed and ruptured in a burst of fire. She shucked her carbine and caught up the force spike, feeling the yank of the boy's mind on it forcing her own mind against his like a resistant wall as she sprang between the men and Artu. Elegin fired his blaster at her, but she was already dodging, moving in on him, driving him back. The other man yelled, Put it away, idiot! As the bolt hissed and zinged against walls, floor, ceiling and shattering ricochets, Leia couldn't probe with her mind to strike the weapon out of his hand, but she could at least keep it from being done to her. At Roganda's side, the boy said, Don't waste your time, Elegin Garanin. You. He fixed his wide eyes, like cobalt glass, on Artu. Back here. Now. Artu, who had crossed the plank bridge and was a few meters from the arch leading away into the dark maze of passageways, came to a stop. Kretsch crawled and squirmed wildly over his slick sides in a way that turned Leia sick, but the little droid took no apparent notice. It was the boy who had stopped him, the boy's voice. Back here, the boy repeated calmly. You aren't going anywhere. Artur, go. Leia shifted sideways, four spike raised, keeping a wary eye on Elegin and the man called Garanin surely not a member of the house Garanin. Oh, really, Leia, said the boy impertinently. If I could make him almost blow up the house you were sleeping in, you don't think he's going to disobey me now? He sniggered again, his face twisting in an unpleasant grin. I'll make him run into the water and short himself out. He turned those glass-cold eyes on the droid. Come on. Open all your repair ports and back this way. 1.5 meters left and parallel to your original course. 
Artur. She couldn't look, keeping an eye on the men. The astromech droid rocked on his base and emitted a desperate whistle. Come on, ordered the boy. Irek, just send the crutch away and Garan and Will. No, said the boy furiously. The black wings of his brows plunged together over an ivory curve of nose. I told him to come back and he won't. Back here. 1.5 meters left and parallel course. R2, get out of here! R2 ran a pace back, a pace left, crutch twisting like a net of filth over him and crunching stickily under his treads. Come back here! Ordered the boy, all calm suddenly gone from his voice. 1.5 meters. R2 wheeled in a tight circle and headed for the door into the tunnels. Send away the crutch, Lord! Garanan made a feint toward the bridge, Leia stepping to block, vibroblade raised. Once he gets into the tunnels we won't be able to track him. Obey me! Yelled Irek, pale face twisting, ignoring the older man completely. Come back! Picture the schematic. Began Roganda evenly, and Irek turned upon her like a wildcat. I know what I'm supposed to do. It worked before. Artu vanished into the tunnels in a brown smear of mashed crutch. Irek stared after him, panting with rage and disbelief, and Leia felt the vicious fury, the concentration of the force, flung after him. And remembered vividly, Chewbacca amid a tangle of wire and solder on the terrace, patching the droid back together. Send the crutch. Don't bother me! Screamed Irek, and strode toward the bridge, shoving Garanin aside. Leia stepped in front of him, vibroblade raised in her hand. The boy stopped, staring at her in astonishment that anyone would thwart his will. Leia felt the tug and jerk of the force against her grip on the pike haft, and tightened her grip, bringing all her mind, all her concentration, to bear on keeping him back. The blue eyes widened in stark fury and he whipped a black-hilted lightsaber from his side. At the same moment Leia felt her breath choke off, had to fight with all her strength to draw past it. She could see he didn't handle the laser weapon properly, using instead the stance and grip of formal blade dueling, totally inappropriate for the two-handed weapon's balance. In a duel Luke would make strip stake of him. The blade slashed at the force spike and Leia fainted upward with it, ducked aside, and nearly took off his feet at the ankles. Battling for even a thread of air, she faced him off, and with a yell of fury he came at her. I wreck! shouted Roganda. The crutch had begun to swarm across the bridge. Leia felt the bitter grip on her windpipe relax saw the swarming anthropods halt in the middle of the planks and begin to mill, as if an invisible barrier prevented them from coming further. Closer to the door, there was a turmoil among them as they devoured the bodies of those Arto had crushed. Mother, she's doing something! cried Irek angrily. It isn't working. That droid should come back. That doddering old scumbag said. Irek, be silent! Leia saw the look Roganda gave her son, and saw, too, the concubine's swift wary glance at Garanin and Elijin. She's keeping something from them. Lord Garanin, Lord Elijin, said Roganda in her sweet, reasonable voice that same sweet voice, with just a touch of helpless deference, thought Leia, that she had used to speak to Leia herself in the market. Step back this way. We seem to be in a rather simple impasse. Irek, remember not to lose your temper and always take the easiest way out. Your Highness. She stepped a little aside in the doorway to let the two aristocrats pass her. Irek remained where he was, just out of range of Leia's force spike, sullen blue eyes flickering from Leia to the crutch. Right, said Irek softly. And he grinned. 
You put it down, princess, or I let the crutch come all the way across the bridge. Maybe I should do it anyway. He tittered and stepped back a pace. The crutch flooded across, pouring onto the near side of the floor like a seethe of bloody mud. I wreck! Commanded Roganda furiously. The crutch stopped, milling again. Leia had backed a few paces but knew at the speed they ran she'd never make it to safety even if she knew in which direction it might lie. Particularly not, she thought, if Elijin had his blaster trained on her. Well, why not do it now? Demanded Irex sullenly. Without her the Republic would crumble. Without her the Republic would simply elect another chief of state, replied Lord Garanin quietly a twinge of disgusted content in his voice. He stepped around Roganda and walked across the room toward Leia and the crutch. Leia, fighting not to run headlong from the filthy things, wasn't sure she could have done that. The light of the single glow panel in the doorway behind Roganda made a stiff gold fuzz, like a metal halo, of the elderly man's short cropped hair. Surrender your weapon, your highness. That's the only hope you have to come out of this alive. Some hope, thought Leia bitterly, as she switched off the vibra-blade and slid the force spike to him across the stone of the floor. Chapter 17 When Nichos had been diagnosed with Quanat's syndrome, Cray had said, There's got to be something I can do. Trembling and panting for breath, Luke leaned on the wall of the fifth or sixth gangway Callista had shown him his leg a cylinder of red pain that spread upward to devour his body in spite of the double dose of Paragon he plugged into it. He remembered Cray's face that day, the brown eyes blank with shock and refusal to give up hope. There's got to be something, she'd said. He closed his eyes, the wall cold against his temple. There had to be something. And Cray would be the one to do it. The eye of Palpatine would be jumping to hyperspace soon. Even the most intricate of waiting games came to an end at last. It had waked, and it would fulfill its mission, and something told Luke that this wasn't simply a matter of laying waste a planet that thirty years ago had sheltered the Emperor's foes. Something wanted the ship. Something that could use the force to affect droids and mechanicals. Something had called out to it commanded the long-sleeping Will. Whatever it was, he couldn't risk letting it wield this kind of firepower, this kind of influence. Not even for Callista's life. But everything within him turned away from the thought, unable to bear the understanding that he wouldn't get to know her. That he wouldn't have her always somewhere in his life. It was worse than the pain of his crippled leg, worse than having his hand cut off, worse than the pain of realizing who his father was. He literally didn't know if he'd be able to do it. He leaned his weight on the gangway railing to support himself while he stepped up the next riser with his good leg and straightened his body again. Lean, step, straighten. Lean, step, straighten, and every muscle of his shoulders and back cried out with the days of unaccustomed labor. The few Paragon patches 3PO had been able to scrounge for him from emergency kits around the ship were nearly gone, and the droid had covered all of decks 9 through 14. When he'd lost his hand he'd had a mechanical within hours, and he would have fought, or traded, or sold almost anything he could think of for a working medlab and a 2-1B unit. The footwitter floated at his back. By the chronometer on his wrist it was just after 1,000 hours. 3PO should already have located the main communications trunk and isolated the line that controlled the Deck 19 intercoms. It was information classified to the will, but the will couldn't prevent Callista from whistling a trace note from one side of the deck to the other, loud enough for the protocol droid's sensitive receptors to detect. Failure of the line would be attributed to the Jawas, in their guise as rebel saboteurs, or just possibly when the guards on lift shaft 21 heard the gaffed voices to some plot by the gaffeds themselves. With luck, Luke could get up the shaft and get Cray out of her cell before they were even aware they'd been tricked. Abyssal darkness and faint, 
ghostly clanking sleigh at the bottom of the gangway beyond the open doorway labeled 17. This was one of the ship's recycling centers, cut off from the crew decks or any realm of human activity. The droids who occupied themselves with the reconstitution of food, water, and oxygen needed no lights to work. The glow of Luke's staff picked out moving angles, blocky SPADS. Going about their monotonous business in company with apparatus not intended to interface with humans at all, MMDs of all sizes, scooting our eyes and MSEs, and a mid-sized magnibore that bumped Luke's calves like a mammoth turtle. He disconnected the gauge lights on the altar tracker to delay as long as possible the moment when the clags realized they'd been duped, and it drifted forlornly behind him, like a rather dirty balloon attached by an invisible line to the trackball in his pocket. Right turn, then second left, Luke repeated to himself. A wall panel in one of the recycling chambers, a narrow shaft at a 45-degree angle. He settled his mind collecting about himself, in spite of the pain and the slow numbing of the overdoses of Paragon, the mental focus, the inner quiet, that was the strength of the Force. For the dozenth or hundredth time since that particular side effect had begun to make itself felt, he wondered if he'd be able to work better with an infection-induced fever and the constant stress of pain. It had to work, he thought. It had to. He turned a corner and stopped. A dead Jawa lay in the corridor. It had a handful of cables wound around one shoulder, a satchel open beside its hand. Luke limped to the body, eased himself down to kneel beside it, and touched the skinny black claw of wrist. A charred pit of blaster fire gaped in its side. Batteries and power cells lay strewn around the open satchel. Luke scooped them back into the leather pouch, slung the strap over his shoulder. Faint whirring made him look up, to face two small droids of a kind he'd never seen before. Gyroscopically balanced on single wheels, they reminded him of some of the older models of interrogation droids, but instead of pincer arms they had long, silvery tentacles, jointed like snakes. Small round sensors, like cold eyes, triangulated on him at the end of prehensile stalks. The two droids were barely taller than Artudita, but there was a curiously insectal menace to them that made Luke back slowly away. The tentacles extruded with a whippy hiss, encircled and lifted the Jawa's tattered little carcass. The droids swiveled and shot away. Luke followed to the door of a cavern lit only by the sickish glow of gauge lights and readouts. The smell of the place was like walking into a wall of muck, ammoniac, organic, and vile. Steam frothed thinly from beneath the covers of the three round, well like vats whose metal curbs rose scarcely half a meter above the bare durasteel of the deck. As the snake-eyed droids approached the nearest tank its cover dilated open. The stench redoubled as steam poured forth, knee-high ground fog that swirled to the farthest corners of the room. The droids raised the Jawa corpse high and dropped it into the vat with a viscous ploop. The cover dilated shut. A sharp rattle at Luke's side made him jump. A slotted hatchway popped open in the wall, and a tumble of bell buckles, boot latches, a stormtrooper helmet, and some half-dissolved bones clattered into the catch bin under the hatch, everything dripping brownish enzymatic acid. The skull of a Gamorrean grinned up at Luke from the bin. Luke stepped quickly back. Though he knew that full recycling from enzymatic breakdown products didn't kick in until the second or third week of deep space missions, still he found himself queasy at the memory of that gucked egg. The food twitter waited for him in the corridor. Luke led the way through another door, past backup enzyme tanks locked up cold and closed, to the far wall. At the touch of the lights on his staff the three SP-80-foot-S ranked in a corner swiveled their cubicle upper bodies, the wide-range sensor squares casting dim blue glare. A small MMF rolled out of the darkness and rattled its three arms at him like a bare mechanical tree. It halted beside Luke as he knelt to pop the panel hatches, 
reached to take the hatch cover from him with the surprising, irresistible strength of droids. Luke leaned around the back and hit the pause button. The MMF froze, panel still raised in its grippers. Within the shaft, the inclusion grid's lattices grinned at him like broken, icy teeth, fading out of sight into the dark chimney above. Very carefully, Luke leaned into the shaft. It ascended two levels at a steep slant, climbable at a pinch, but not by a man with a useless leg. The square, cold patchwork of the wall seemed to whisper, Try it. Go ahead. It's like causing a blaster to misfire, Callista had said. And the more that hit you, the more that will. He thumbed the trackball in his pocket, and the silvery tracker drifted close. He'd examined the latches that dogged panels shut from behind, so it was an easy matter to reach through with his mind as he had reached behind the panel leading into the shaft and twist the latches aside at the top. More difficult was blowing the panel clear, for it was hard to concentrate through fatigue and pain. He felt the hatch cover give, two levels up, and dimly heard the clang of it striking the floor. Air flowed gently down the shaft against his face. Two levels. Eight meters at a slant, though the darkness was too dense for his eyes to penetrate. Okay, pal, he whispered to the foo Twitter. Do your stuff. He thumbed the trackball to edge the tracker to within centimeters of the inclusion field. Focused his mind, gathered his thoughts, put aside pain, weariness, and growing anxiety. Each square of the grid came to his mind, flawed, delayed, molecules not quite meeting, Synapses not quite touching momentary shifts in atmospheric pressure, conductivity, reaction time. And beside that, kinetic force building up like lightning, dense and waiting, aiming like a sighted cannon upward into the dark. It was like shouting a word, but there was no word. Only the silent explosion of the footwitter's speed, rocketing upward, ripping air as if fired from a slug thrower, and the spattering hiss of lightning. Few spidery, too late, the blue bolts zapped and fizzled from the opal squares around the metal casing, sparking where one hit two. Then he felt it in air, and the grid fell silent again. Luke checked the monitor on the trackball. The foo Twitter was still transmitting. Shakily, he leaned his forehead on the jam of the panel, thanked the force and all the powers of the universe and turned to see what, for that first moment, he thought was another footwitter hanging in the dark behind him. The next second his reflexes took over and he flung himself sideways, barely in time to avoid the scorching zap of blaster fire. Tracker flashed through his mind as he rolled behind the disused tank, jerking his bad leg out of the way of a bolt that burned a chunk out of the heel of his boot. He remembered the charred hole in the Jawa's side. Evidently the floating, silver trackers were equipped to do more than just stun and fetch. He grabbed for his staff where it lay in the open and whipped his hand to safety empty only just in time. Another bolt hissed wildly off the decking and he dodged a second tracker that swam up out of the darkness. In the meadow on Zab he'd watched these silvery, gleaming spheres in action and knew the few instants whirring shift and refocus of the antenna-like nest of sensors rolled, ducked, changing direction. The central vision ports shifted and the second droid slatted fire, not at him, but in a line of quick bursts on the floor in a raking pattern, driving him toward the open panel of the shaft and the inclusion grid within. Oh, clever, muttered Luke, crawling back, gauging his timing for a leap. More by instinct than anything else he flung himself through an opening in the pattern of bolts, rolled up to his knees, and whipped the diagnostic mirror from his pocket as the trackers swiveled in his direction again. He caught the bolt of the first one on the angled glass, clean and vicious and perfectly aimed. It struck the second tracker in the instant before it fired. The tracker burst in a shattering rain of shrapnel that clawed Luke's face like thorns but it gave him the second or so he needed to lingle the mirror as the first tracker tried again and zapped itself into noisy oblivion with its own reflected bolt. 
Luke lay on the floor, gasping, the warmth of the blood trickling down his face contrasting sharply with the cold of drying sweat. One dead tracker lay like a squashed spider on the floor a meter from his side. The second still hung fifty or so centimeters above the floor, broken grippers trailing, turning disjointedly here and there. Luke got his hands under him preparatory to crawling for his staff. With a faint whirring, the three SP-80-foot S in the corner came to life. Luke dove for the door as they whipped toward him, moving faster than he'd have given those tractor treads credit for. He held out his hand, calling his staff to it, as the MMF came to life again and shot out a gripper. Luke rolled out the doorway, wondering if he could get as far as the gangway in time, and skidded to a halt as two more SPs and the biggest treadwell he'd ever seen a 500 or 600 at least. A massively armored furnace stoker loomed out of the hall's darkness, reaching for him with inexorable arms. The light saber whined to life in his hand as snaky silver tentacles caught his wrist from behind. He struck at one of the snake-eye droids, the other jabbing at him with a long, jointed rod, and the jolt of the electrical shock knocked him breathless. He flipped the lightsaber to his left hand, as he could when he had to, cut at the snake droid's sensors. Something struck him from behind, wrenching strength grabbing his arms, lifting him bodily from the floor. He cut again, sparks exploding as the glowing blade severed a G-40 servo cable. But, unlike human opponents, the droids didn't know enough to back off, and were incapable of going into shock. They surrounded him, gripping with an impossible strength, and when he slashed through sensor wires, joints, servo transmitters, there were always more. The Treadwell's case-hardened arms resisted even the cut of the laser. It was made to work in the heart of an antimatter furnace, and though the lightsaber hissed and slashed, the searing violence of the blows reverberated up Luke's arms as if it would shatter the bones. Arms dangling, eye stalks dangling, such droids as were still operable followed the stoker as it bore Luke through the doorway, and the mephitic stink of the enzyme chamber's darkness engulfed them. Luke hammered, twisted, slashed at the pinchers that held his arms and ankles, but couldn't so much as make them flinch. The stink redoubled as the enzyme vat irised wide. Steam boiled up around him like thin foam, the smell as much as the heat of the dark red-brown liquid that bubbled beneath him making him dizzy. Luke went limp. The lightsaber's blade retracted. A leaf on the wind, he thought. A leaf on the wind. The treadwell let him drop. Relaxed, almost as if he could sleep, Luke summoned the force as he fell, light and true as if he drifted above the steam. From some abstract distance he was aware of his own body rolling lightly sideways above the seething filth in the vat, away from the droids, levitating effortlessly to the far rim. Just beyond the rim he fell, and hit the floor hard. His crippled leg gave beneath him as he tried to stand, stumbled and plunged for the door, crawling desperately as the droids clanked and ground in pursuit. They weren't as fast as the trackers had been he had the cover plate off the manual door release when they were still a meter behind him, and ran his lightsaber into the works to fuse them once the door was down between him and the droids. He managed to crawl a considerable distance before he passed out. Callista, we can do it! The man's voice held a thin veneer of patience and confidence over a core of rough irritation. He put his big, calloused hands through the back of his belt and looked from her to the blackness framed by the faintly glowing rectangle of the magnetic field. Luke recognized the hangar, though it seemed less cavernous in the clear cold lighting of the glow panels than it had been when he'd stood there by the shorn, chalky light of the stars. The moonflower nebula's drifting banks of light could be seen outside, speckled with the darker chunks of asteroids, an eerie field of glow and lancing shadow. The ally wing stood where he'd seen it, scars and holes glaring in the brightness. On the marks that had been empty stood a skipray blast boat, crowding the smaller craft. The station lays its defensive fire in a double ellipse pattern, that's all. We got in, didn't we? 
The man's eyes were bright blue in a hatchet jawed, amiable face grubby with three days' rust-colored beard. He had a gold ring in one ear. The force was with us or we'd never have made it. It was the first time Luke had seen her clearly, but it was as if he'd always known that she was tall, slim, long-boned without the smallest trace of lankiness. The light saber with its rim of brown cetaceans hung at her belt. Like her companion she was filthy, a universe of heavy brown hair unwashed and trailing from a knot the size of his two fists at her nape, gray eyes light against the soot and oil that stained her face. Shrapnel or shattering glass had opened a three-inch cut on her forehead. The way it was scabbed, it would leave a hell of a scar. Her voice was like smoke and silver. She was beautiful. Luke had never seen a woman so beautiful. I'd like to think I had something to do with that. The man's long mouth twisted. You did. Callista looked taken aback that he'd feel offended. Of course you did, Geith. The force. I know. He made a gesture, a slight pushing of the air, as if against something heard before for which he had no time. The point is, there's other ways of doing this than getting ourselves killed. There was silence between them, and Luke saw, in the way she stood, in her diffidence, her concern that he would be angry at her. She started to say something, visibly checked, and after a moment changed it to, Geith, if there was any way for me to go up that shaft, you know I. By the flare in his eyes Luke saw he'd read her words as an accusation of cowardice. And I'm telling you either of us has to do it, Callie. Anger in his voice. Luke saw that no lightsaber hung beside the blaster at his waist. Was that between them, too? It's not going to take us that long to get clear of the nebula's interference and back to where we can signal for help. Help in dealing with this hunk of junk. His expansive wave took in the chill gray-walled labyrinths of the silent eye and at least let Plet know what's coming at him. As it is, if we try to be heroes and fail, they won't know zip until they catch a lapful of smoking plasma. They won't know if we make a run for it and get nailed thither. Her voice was low. His rose. It's a double ellipse with one randomized turn. I've got it scoped, Callie. It'll be tougher in that tub than in the ally wing, but it can be done. She drew breath again and he put a hand on her shoulder, a finger on her lips, a lover's gesture of intimacy but still meant to silence her. You don't have to be such a hero, baby. There's always ways of doing things without getting killed. Luke thought he doesn't want to climb up that shaft. He's told himself there's another way and he probably even believes it but at bottom, he doesn't want to be the one who climbs through the grid while she's using the force to make it misfire. And he saw this understanding, too, in Callista's gray eyes. Geith, she said softly, and in her hesitation Luke heard the echo of his previous rages. Sometimes there's not. He threw up his hands. Now you're starting to sound like old Jin. That doesn't make what I'm saying less true. The old boy's too damn ready to tell other people how they should die for a guy who hasn't been off that festering gas ball of his for a hundred years. Callie, I've been around. I know what I'm talking about. And I know that we have no idea how long we've got until this thing goes into hyperspace. She still didn't raise her voice, but something in its level softness stopped him from cutting in again. None. If we destroy it, it's gone. Dead. If we leave it, run for it. There's nothing wrong with jumping clear and getting help except that it'll lose us our one sure chance. It'll lose us our chance of getting the hell blown up along with this thing, you mean? That's what I mean. Will you help me or not? He put his hands on his hips, looked down at her, for he was a tall man. You stubborn fish rider. 
affection glinted in his smile. Her voice flawed, just slightly, as she looked up into his face. Don't leave me, Geith. I can't do it alone. And Luke saw something change, just slightly, in Geetha's blue eyes. Pain came back to him, shredding away the scene in the hangar. He opened his eyes, felt under him the slight, smooth jostle of movement. Thin dark lines passed like scanner wires above his head, traveling from head to feet. Ceiling joints. Moving his head, he saw that he lay on a small antigraph sled, beyond whose rim C-3PO's grimed and dented metal head and shoulders were visible as the droid guided the sled along the hall. There was a sound somewhere ahead and 3PO froze into the perfect immobility of a mechanical. The yellow reflection of a tracker droid's dim lights passed over the metal mask of 3PO's face, glinted very faintly on the perfect, intricate shape of his hand where it rested on the sled's rim. The yellow light passed on. 3PO moved forward again, footfalls hollow in the empty corridor. Luke slid back toward darkness. The Foo Twitter, he thought. He misfired the inclusion grid and thrust the silvery globe up ten meters of shaft, but it had been hit anyway for, maybe five times. He'd heard the shrill zing of ricochets against the metal. 3PO had cut the calm trunk, Cray was in danger, he couldn't lie here. The more that hit you, the more that will. He saw her in the gun room. The lights were on there, too. She was alone. All the monitors were dead, blank black idiot faces, holes into the will's malignancy she was sitting very still on the corner of a console, but he knew she listened. Head bowed, long hands folded loose over her thigh, he could see the tension in the way she breathed, in the slight angle of movement. Listening. Once she looked at the chronometer above the door. Don't do this to me, Geith. Her voice was barely audible. Don't do this. After long, long, grinding silence like years of cold illness, though absolutely nothing changed in the room, Luke saw when she understood at last. She got to her feet, crossed to a console, and tapped in commands. A tall girl whose gray flight suit hung baggy over the long-limbed fighter's frame, whose lightsaber with its line of dancing sea clowns gleamed against her flank. She called a screen to life, and Luke saw past her shoulder the hangar, with the ruined ally wing and the empty meters of concrete floor where the blast boat used to be. She toggled in a line of readings, then, as if they weren't enough to convince her, tapped visual. Replay Luke's eyes were the eyes of the pickup camera concealed among the craters of the Dreadnought's irregular hull. There was no question that Geith was one hellskinner of a pilot. Blast boats were landing craft, not fighters, clumsy to handle, though in a crisis they had the speed to outrun, if not outmaneuver, most pursuit. And Geith had been right half by observation, half by instinct. Luke saw slash felt the pattern of the shots the will laid down a complex double ellipse with a couple of random twitches. A couple, not the one that Geith had said. Dodging, dropping, veering among the sheets of light-filled dust, the half-hidden chunks of tumbling rock, Geith handled the blast boat as if it were a tie, flipping through the white streaks of death with breathtaking speed. He was almost out of range when a random bolt that shouldn't have been there hold his stabilizer. The more that hit you, the more that will. He must have got the craft in hand somehow, spinning crazily but keeping his trajectory. An asteroid swam out of the dust and took off one of his power units, dragged him around. And it was over. Luke saw the white blast of the final explosion as a reflection from the replay screen cast up on Callista's face. She closed her eyes. Tears traced a line in the grime. She had the look of a woman who hadn't slept or eaten in days, exhausted, skating the edge. Maybe the wool had tricks for dealing with those who entered by other means than the landers with their indoctrination bays. Maybe if Geith had been 100% alert, 100% sharp, he'd have done as he meant, 
and gone now to fetch help. She turned her head and looked up at the dark shaft, like an upside-down well into the night above the ceiling. The inclusion grid had the look of pale, dementedly regular stars. She drew her breath without change of expression and let it go. He woke again, or thought he woke, to utter blackness, and she was there, lying against his back. Her body curved around his. Her hips spooned behind his, her thigh touching the back of his leg his leg didn't hurt, he realized. Nothing hurt her arm lying over his side and her cheek resting against his shoulder blade, like an animal that has crept stealthily to a human's side, seeking reassurance and warmth. The tension of her muscles frightened him, the pent-up bitter grief. Grief at dreaming the dream that he'd seen. At remembering the one who'd betrayed her. At having to do it alone. Gently, fearing that if he moved at all she'd flee, he turned and gathered her into his arms. As she had in the gun room, she breathed once, hanging on to something for as long as she could, then let it go. For a long time she wept, silently and without fuss or apology, the hot damp of her tears soaking into his ragged jumpsuit, her body shaking with the draw and release of her breath. It's all right, said Luke quietly. Her hair thick and rough textured as it appeared, was startlingly fine to his touch, springy where gathered into his hands, filling them and overflowing. It's all right, after a long time she said. He thought I'd never try it myself. He meant to save my life. I know that. He knew I'd know. But he still made it his decision, not yours. Against his chest he felt her small, wry smile. Well, it was his decision, so it had to be right, didn't it? I'm sorry. That sounds bitter a lot of his decisions were right. He was a demon of a fighter. But this. I felt it. I knew there would be no getting back in, once we were away. I was angry for a long time. I'm angry at him. He remembered the faint, attenuated sense of her less than a ghost even, in the gun room. Hidden, eroded, worn by exhaustion almost to nothing. I'm surprised you helped me at all. I wasn't going to, she said. He felt her move her arm, push the hair from her face. Not out of hate, really, but... It all seemed so distant. So unreal like watching Mort scurry around the bones of the ship. Yet you stayed, said Luke. Even as he spoke, understanding that he was dreaming, understanding that the warmth of her body, the long bones and soft fine hair and the cheek resting on his shoulder were her memories of her body, her recollection of what it had been like, long buried and nearly forgotten. You used the last of your strength, the last of the force, to put yourself into the gunnery computer, to keep anyone else from taking the ship. For all you knew forever. Against his shoulder, he felt her sigh. I couldn't. Let anyone come aboard. All those years. It wasn't. So bad, after a time. Jin had taught us had theoretically walked us through the techniques of projecting the mind into something else, something that would be receptive, to hold the intelligence as well as the consciousness, but he seemed to regard it as cowardly. As being afraid or unwilling to go on to the next step, to cross over to the other side. Once I was in the computer, she shook her head, and he felt the gesture of her hand, trying to speak of some experience beyond his ken. After a time it began to seem that it had been my entire life. That what came before Chad, and the sea, and Papa, Jin's teaching, the platform on Bespin, and... And Geeth they turned into a sort of dream. But the tripods... They're a little like the dreams back home, sweet and harmless and well-intentioned. I wanted to help them. I was so glad when you did. 
That was the first time I really, really saw you. And even the Jawas. She sighed again and tightened her hold on him, her arm around his rib cage sending a shock of awareness through him, as if its shape and strength and the pressure of her hand had somehow a meaning and a truth to which all other things in his life were tied. He understood for the first time how his friend Wedge could write poems about Quee Suxa's pale, feathery hair. The fact that it was Quee's made all the difference. She said, Look! And he brought her face to his, and kissed her lips. Chapter 18 In the throbbing indigo darkness, Framjim Spa then rolled back his head so that the long electric ropes of his glowing hair brushed the floor, raised arms glistening with cutaneous diamonds to flash in the bloody light, and screamed. The scream seemed to lift him onto his toes, rippling through that hard-muscled body in wave after wave of sound and pain and ecstasy as he rolled his head, heaved his hips, stretched his fingers to the utmost. Were those muscles all really his? Wondered Bran Kempel, drawing on a hookah that smelled like old laundry steeped in alcohol and regarding the hollow and extremely old one, Han had seen it in dozens of cheap clubs from here to stars and with half-shut eyes. Sure they were, said Han. He paid about two hundred credits per ounce for M, plus installation, but after that they were his, all right. The dancers on either side of Fremjin's hollow were real, a boneless tree boy and a massively breasted Gamorian female, undulating under the red glare of lights for the edification of half a dozen seedy customers. It would have been hard to picture anything less conducive to lust, jungle, or otherwise. The day-shift hustlers of various races and sexes were working the floor hard, chatting up the patrons and drinking glass after glass of watered liquor at prices that should have brought 100% breath of heaven. Even they looked tired. Hans supposed that having to listen to a 15-year-old Framgen Spada and Hala for eight hours would tire anyone. Brand Kempel sighed heavily. Nublik the slight. Now there was a hustler who could run things. Things was all different in his day. Hans sipped his drink. Even the beer was watered. Pretty lively, Han. Lively? Phew. Kempel made a kiss-your-hand motion toward the ceiling, presumably a signal to the slight's departed spirit. Wasn't even the word. Half a dozen flights in a week that never made it on the port manifests. People appearing and disappearing through the tunnels out under the ice. Decent drinks and decent girls. Hey, Sadie. He yelled, gesturing to the one-eyed abyssin barkeep. Get my friend here a decent drink, fair pity's sakes. Festerin barkeep can't tell the Festerin difference between a mark and somebody in the trade, fester it. He shook his head again and mopped at his broad, pale green brow with a square of soiled linen he dragged from the depths of his yellow polyfibe suit. His curly brown hair was surrendering to its destiny, and he'd picked up a couple of extra chins in the years since Han had last seen him as a two-bit gunrunner in the Juvex systems. So what happened? What happened? Kempel blinked at him through the gloom. Place got cleaned out. He'd been stripped in old machinery, droids and computers and lab stuff, down under the ruins. Some kind of old laboratories, they must have been, and there were rooms full of them, Nublik said. I will say for Nublik. The Abyssin brought Han a drink that would have flattened a rancor, and Kempel, evidently forgetting for whom he'd ordered it, polished it off, his long, prehensile tongue questing around the bottom of the glass for stray drops. I will say for Nublik, he kept a strong hand on the loot, played it out and kept anybody else from horning in. It was his show, nobody else's, and he didn't trust a soul. And why should he, hey? Business is business. He never even told me how he was getting into the tunnels. Ja look for the way in, after he left? Course I did. Kempel's vertical pupils flexed open and shut indignantly. 
Think I'm stupid or something? Two new dancers climbed up to an even older and scratchier hollow of Pecky Blue and the Star Boys. Han winced. We checked the cellar of this joint, and that house he had in Painted Door Street, and finally ran a deep rock sensor scan of the ruins themselves. He shrugged. Double zeros. Not enough gold or xylan under there to register. We couldn't even pay the rental on the scanner. He must have cleaned the place out before. He stopped himself. Solo raised his eyebrows. Cleaned the place out before he went where? We don't know. He lowered his voice and glanced nervously over at the abyss and barkeep, who was pouring out a drink for a tall black girl and listening to a long tale of the last Mark's perfidy. That woman who rents the house in Painted Door Street says the credit house where she sends the money every month changes a couple times a year, so it sounds like he's on the run. But before he left he said, he leaned forward to whisper. He said something about the Emperor's hand, Mara Jade. Solo's eyebrows quirked up. She neglected to mention this in last night's discussion. Oh, yeah? Kempel nodded. Solo recalled that the man never could keep that enormous mouth of his shut. He said the Emperor's hand was on the planet, that his life was in danger. He leaned close enough for Solo to be able to tell the composition of his last three drinks by the smell of his breath and sweat. I'm thinking. He cleared out and ran. Could he have cleared out that much loot? How much? Kempel straightened up and reached for his hookah again. It must have been playing. Out, anyway, for him to take it all with him. Believe me, we ran sensor scans up, down, backwards, and sideways of the ruins and this place and his house, and you don't get that many sensor malfunctions. Oh, don't you? Thought Solo, remembering Leia's questions about unexplained flutters in the behaviors of droids. Mubbin didn't buy it. Han looked sharply around at the new voice. It was one of the hustlers, a childlike omelette like a little blue fairy, with eyes a thousand years old. Mubbin the whip hid, he explained. Another of the slight's runners. He always said there were shipfuls of stuff still down there. Mubbin didn't know what he was talking about, said the city boss quickly a gleam of guilty nervousness in his eyes. He looked back at Han. Yeah, I heard Mubbin go on about how much stuff there still was. He was Drub McCombs' pal, wasn't he? Solo addressed the question to the hustler, not Kempel. He remembered the whip hid Chewie had killed, thin and starved and screaming in the dark. The boy nodded. One of my pals was with Drub when he went down that well in the ruins and ran a scan, looking for Mubbin. Drub was convinced he'd gone down looking for the stuff and never came out. He glanced at Kempel. Some people around here refused to give him a hand when he said he'd go looking himself. Those scans found absolutely zip, pointed out Kempel hastily. Zero. A lot of zero. If that wasn't good enough for Drub, then. Wait a minute, said Han. They ran a life skin down there? From the room at the wellhead, said the Amwat. Like most of his race, he had a high, sweetly flute-like voice. My pal was a treasure hunter. She had a Spizak G-2000 she'd got off an Imperial Carillion ship and that thing could pick up a Gamorrean mort in a square kilometer of Permacrete. And there was nothing down there but cretch and pit molds. Kempel blew a thin cloud of steam. Drub ran two or three scans, one for the Whiphid and one for Xylan and Gold. Did the same from the house on Painted Door Street, looking for a tunnel entrance there. What did he tell the woman renting the place? Miss Roganda? The boy grinned. That they'd had reports of malignant insect infestation and were inspecting every old looky foundation in town. 
She got all helpful and offered M.T. Roganda? Han felt the hair lift on the back of his neck. You mean she's the one who's renting Nublik's old house? Sure, said Kempel, turning his attention back to the dancers. Nice lady darn pretty woman, too. She could work at this place like a shot, not that this place, or any place in town, has that kind of class anymore. Got somebody keeping her in high style, anyway. Showed up a month or two after the slight disappeared and said she'd made arrangements to rent the place. She seemed to know him. He gave Han a wink that was supposed to be slightly sophisticated and succeeded only in looking puerile. Roganda Ismarin. The room where they put Leia was a large one, hewn out of rock and equipped startlingly with a window of three wide casements through which one daylight filtered even before Lord Garanin slapped the wall switch to activate the glow panels of the ceiling. By all means try to break it if it will amuse you, your highness, he said, observing the immediate direction of Leia's interest. It was put in long before the dome, and the locks are made to withstand almost anything. She walked over to it, leaving Lord Garanin, Irek, and Roganda in the doorway. The window was in a sort of bay, whose jet from the rock of the cliff hid any sign of it from below. A more massive jet overhung it from above, like every irregularity of the cliffs bearded with curtains of vines, so that light from the window could not be seen from anywhere in the rift at night. Through the dangling creepers Leia could see, ten or twelve meters below her and to the right, the topmost courses of the ruined tower. She remembered seeing this vine-grown overhang from the tower one of many in the cliff wall behind Platt's house. How many of those, she wondered now, hid the windows of this warren of tunnels and rooms? If she angled her head, she could see down into the stone enclosure where she'd glimpsed the echoes of Jedi children playing. Beyond, the rift was a lake of mist and treetops above which the hanging gardens floated like an armada of flower-bedecked airships. Leia could see the feeders mostly of the nimbler races. Like charter fan or verpine, since mechanicals were out of the question under the circumstances scrambling along the ropes and catwalks that stretched from bed to bed, or from the beds to the supply station, clinging amid its own luxuriant cascades of sweetberry to the cliff wall. I still say we should put her in one of the lower rooms, insisted Irek. He shook back his long hair, shoulder length, black as a winter midnight, and clearer than his mother's. Like hers, his skin was slightly golden, but pallid with the pallor of life lived mostly underground. Like her, he dressed simply but carried himself with the cocky arrogance of one who believes himself to be the center around which all the universe turns. Leia was familiar with that posture from her days in the marriage mart of the emperor's court. A lot of the young men had had it, knowing the universe revolved around them and them alone. If we keep her at all, he added, and gave her a look up and down, calculated to be an insult. Lord Garanin replied quietly. Whatever her position in the Republic. Lord Irek, her highness deserves the consideration due to the daughter of one of the great houses. Irek opened his mouth to snap a reply and Drost Elegin's lip curled slightly with something close to smugness as if his opinion about the boy and his mother had been borne out to their discredit. Roganda put her hand quickly on her son's shoulder and added, And for the time being, my son, she is our guest. And this is what we owe to our guests. It might have been Aunt Rouge speaking Leia could see Roganda's eyes on Elegin as she brought out the words, and guessed they were more to impress him with her knowledge of how things should be done than from any true concern for Leia's comfort. But. Irek glanced from his mother's face, to Garanin's, to Leia's, and subsided. But the full lips were sullen, the blue eyes smoldering with a secret discontent. It is time we look to our other guests. Irek threw a cocky glance back to Leia and said, with deliberate malice, I suppose we can always kill her later, can't we? He transferred his gaze to Garanin and added, Have you caught that droid of hers yet? The men are searching the tunnels between here and the pad, said Lord Garanin. 
It won't get far. It better not. The boy turned and strode out, followed by Roganda in a whisper of silk. Garanin turned back to Leia. They are parvenus, he said, his matter-of-fact tone containing, by its sheer lack of apology, something abysmally deeper than contempt for those not of the ancient houses. But such people have their uses. With him as our spearhead, we will be able to negotiate from a position of power with the military hierarchies that fight for control of the remains of Palpatine's new order. I trust you will be comfortable, Your Highness. Chief of State of the New Republic and architect of the rebellion she might be, but Leia could see that she remained, in his eyes, Bail Organa's daughter. And the last surviving member of House Organa. The last princess of Alderaan. Thank you, she said, biting back the annoyance she had always felt at the old Senex aristocracy, and speaking to him aristocrat to aristocrat, sensing in him a potentially weak link in the chains that bound her. I appreciate your kindness, my lord. Am I to be killed? She fought to keep sarcasm out of her voice, to replace it with that dignified combination of martyrdom and noblesse obliged with which she had been taught aristocratic ladies surmounted every adversity from genocide to spotty tableware at tea. He hesitated. In my opinion, your highness, you would be of far more use as a hostage than as an example. She inclined her head veiling her eyes with her lashes. Lord Garanin came of the class that did not kill hostages. Whether the same could be said for Roganda and her son was another matter. Thank you, my lord. And thank you, Anne Rouge, she added silently, as the burly aristocrat bowed to her and closed the door behind him. The bolts hadn't even finished clanking over as Leia began her search of the room. There was, unfortunately, little enough to search. Though large, the chamber contained almost no furniture. A bed built of squared ampore logs and equipped with an old-fashioned stuffed mattress and one foam pillow so old that the foam was starting to yellow. A work table, also of ampore logs, beautifully put together but whose drawers contained nothing, a lightweight plastic chair of a truly repellent lavender. A screened-off cubicle contained sanitary facilities. A curtainless rod with pegs embedded in the wall behind it indicated where someone had once hung clothes. Leia noted automatically that all the furniture was human-proportioned, the plumbing fitted for human requirements. The room had been cut out of stone, accurately but roughly, the walls smoothed after a fashion but not finished. The door was metal and fairly new. Marks of other hinges indicated it had replaced one probably less substantial. This high above the hot springs that warmed the caves, without her tea suit it would have been unpleasantly cold. Leia touched the places where the older set of hinges had been, and thought, they changed this place over to be a prison. When? She wished she knew offhand the decay rate of foam pillows. It might tell her something. And for whom? The door latches clicked. She felt, at the same moment, a thick, weighted buzzing in her head, a heavy sleepiness, and for an instant nothing mattered to her but going over to the bed and lying down. The Force. A trick of the Force. She shoved it off with a certain amount of difficulty and retreated from the door as far as she could, knowing who would come in. You're still awake. Irex sounded surprised. He had a blaster and a lightsaber. Leia kept to the vicinity of the window, knowing better than to bolt for the door. You're not the only one around here who can use the force. He looked her up and down again, content in his blue eyes. He was, she guessed, fourteen or fifteen years old. She wondered if he'd made the lightsaber that hung at his side, or had gotten it from somewhere someone else. You call that using the force? He turned and regarded a place on the rock of the wall slightly to the right of the bed. She felt what he did with his mind, with the force, felt, as she had in the tunnels, 
the trained power of his will and the dark taint that stained its every usage. Where there had been only the dark reddish stone, there was now a hole about half a meter square. He giggled, childishly shrill. Never seen anything like that before, have you? He crossed to the place, but Leia still felt him watching her. His hand was close to his blaster, and she remembered his words in the hall of the stream. With her dead, the Republic will crumble. He hadn't liked being contradicted and, what's more, didn't believe he was wrong. She suspected he didn't believe he could be wrong. He would have loved to shoot her while trying to escape. He took a black plastine pouch from the hole, and at his nod, the stone reappeared as it had been. He gave her his cocky, charming grin. Even my mother doesn't know about that one, he said, pleased with himself. And she wouldn't know how to open it if she did. He tossed the pouch lightly in his hand. Leia recognized it the twin of the one she'd found hidden in the old toy room, and of the one Tom Lael had taken from Drub's pocket. She doesn't know as much as she thinks she does. She thinks I can't handle this, either. Thinks I can't use the force to turn it into another source of power. The blue eyes glittered. But with the force on my side, everything is a source of power. As they'll all find out. Leia watched him, saying nothing, as he crossed to the door. Then he turned back, his face suddenly clouded. Why didn't your droid stop? He asked. Why didn't it obey me? What made you think it would? She returned, folding her arms. Because I have the force. I have the power. She tilted her head a little to one side considering him in silence. Not needing to say, you obviously don't all the time. And he couldn't tell her she was wrong, she thought, without telling her how he had acquired that power in the first place. After a moment he hissed at her, So! And stormed out the door, slamming and locking it behind him. It took Leia fifteen sweating, aching minutes to open the hole in the wall once more. She had sensed, quite clearly, what he did the compartment in the wall was built with a segment of the rock that covered a key to be literally shifted into another dimension by the power of the Force. It was old, she sensed, designed and built by a Jedi of vast power, and even so small a quantity of shift required a control and a strength almost beyond her capacity. By the time the shift took place she felt drained, as if she'd worked out with the sword for an hour or run for miles. Her hands were shaking as she reached inside. There was a little cream-colored Yarrick powder spilled on the bottom. Easily obtainable enough in any spaceport, of course. If Irek was anything like some of the more self-destructive spirits at the Aldrin Select Academy for Young Ladies, he had packets of the stuff cached everywhere. It would explain how Drub McCum had come by it and obtained the temporary sanity it brought. There were other things in the compartment, shoved farther in. Bundles of flimsoplast notes. Tiny skeins of wire. A couple of small soldering guns. A handful of xylan chips. A gold ring that, when brought to the light and rubbed, proved to be the mark of an honorary degree at the University of Coruscant. A small gold plaque commemorating the dedication of the Magritte Institute of Programmable Intelligence. A woman's gold mesh glove. Leia opened the notes, and at the bottom of the last page a signature caught her eye. Nastra Magritte. To this day I don't know if Palpatine equals new. Curled up in the window seat, Leia read the words with a strange sense of almost grief, of pity for the man who had written them in this room not all that many years ago. The heavy black lines of the chip schematics traced on the other side bled through the pale green plast a little, giving the effect of a palimpsest, like an allegory of tragedy. Calm scientific fact and the dreadful usages to which it had been put. In his way, Magritte had been as naive as the Death Star's hermetically sheltered designer, Quisux. 
She wondered if he'd written this on the back of his notes, because it was the only writing material he was allowed. Probably, she thought, considering the marginless edges, the way the bold calligraphy cramped at top and bottom. Probably. I should have suspected, or known, or guessed. Why would an imperial concubine, with all the pleasures and privileges available to those who have nothing to do but care for their own beauty, have sought out the bookish middle-aged wife of a robotics professor, if not for some kind of intrigue? I never paid attention to the affairs of the palace, the constant jockeying for position among the emperor's ministers and the more vicious, behind-the-scenes power plays engaged in by wives and mistresses each intent on being the mother of Palpatine's eventual heir. I thought such matters beneath the concern of scholarship. I paid a high price for my absent-minded ignorance. I only pray that Eliza and our daughter, Shenna, will not be required to pay as well. Leia closed her eyes. All the reports she had received after the destruction of Alderaan and the demolition of the Death Star had assumed Magritte had disappeared willingly, probably into the Emperor's infamous think tank, in flight from retribution by the rebellion for what he had done. Those reports, that is, that didn't assume that Leia herself had been behind the distinguished scientist's sudden absence. Many attributed work on the Sun Crusher to him took his wife and daughter and went into seclusion someplace. Would her father have traded his ideals, gone to work for the Emperor, to save her? It had been her biggest fear on board Vader's Star Destroyer, and later on the Death Star itself that Bail Organa would yield to threats to do her harm. She still didn't know. He'd never been offered the choice. My Mothma will laugh. I suppose, at the ease with which I was lured to the place where they picked me up. And well she might, should circumstance ever permit her to laugh at anything connected with the evils that I have been required to perform. I thought all I had to do was some single service they'd let Eliza and Shenna free, perhaps put me down on some deserted planet, where I'd eventually be found. A frightening annoyance, but finite. Dear gods of my people, finite. Roganda Ismarin told me it was all in the Emperor's name. She had a small collection of bullybas around her, military types but none in uniform. I suppose she could have bribed them with money juggled from treasury funds, or deceived them as she deceived me. She was herself clever enough with finances and blackmail to obtain whatever she wanted. There seemed to be far more money than personnel in evidence. Leia had noticed this herself. The finest, newest, most exquisite equipment available, cutting-edge programs and facilities, but the same ten or twelve guards. Though she told me and the guards that all was by his command, I never received one scrap of empirical or circumstantial evidence that Palpatine was in any way involved. It didn't matter. I didn't even know what planet they took me to, or where Eliza and Shenna were, after the one time I saw them. Leia shivered though the window seat where she read was the warmest spot in the room and looked out into the eerie rainbows of the atmosphere under the dome. She remembered, the night before the time of meeting, sitting beside one of the fountains in the rooftop gardens of the Athorian guest house while Han pointed out to Jaina and Jason which star was Coruscant's sun. On Coruscant itself the scintillant planet, old songs called it the flaming veils of its nightly auroras prevented amateur astronomy but Ithor was without even the lights of cities. The sky there seemed to breathe stars. Most of those stars had worlds of some kind circling them, though they might be no more than bare balls of rock or ice or frozen gas habitable only after prohibitively expensive bioforming. Fewer than 20% had been mapped. Before the day of Drub McCombs' attack, Leia had never even heard of Belsavis. Worlds were large. And life appallingly short. What they wanted was simple, they told me. My talents unsuspected, I thought, by any had led me to study the records of the old Jedi, to experiment with the mental effects attributable by them to the energy field referred to as the Force. Talents? Thought Leia startled. 
Magrity was force strong? It was something she hadn't known, something Cray had never mentioned, probably hadn't known either. Considering the Emperor's attitude toward the Jedi in which he had never been alone it was hardly surprising the man had kept it hidden. I thought I had been successful in concealing, in my experiments, my own abilities to influence this energy field by means of thought wave concentrations, an ability that I believed to be hereditary and not limited to the human species. Perhaps Roganda Ismarin, or the Emperor himself had deduced from my articles in the Journal of Energy Physics that I knew more about directed thought waves than I ought. In any case, for my sins, I had reflected on the tradition, or legend, that the Jedi were unable to affect machinery or droids by means of the force, in the light of the nature of subelectronic synapses. I speculated about the possibility of an implanted subelectronic converter to be surgically inserted in the brain of one who possessed such hereditary ability to concentrate thought waves, enabling him or her, with proper training, to influence artificial intelligences of varying complexities at the individual synaptic level. This was what they wanted me to do. Irek thought Leia. Perhaps the boy actually was the Emperor's son, though given Palpatine's age at the probable time of Irex's conception and given Roganda's coolly and scrupulous talents as a planner the odds were good that he wasn't. And if Roganda was his mother, there was no need for Palpatine's seed to guarantee that Irex would be himself strong in the Force. Given the atmosphere of Palpatine's court, the pervasive use of fear and threat, the infighting of factions and pretenders to power, Leia could only guess at what attempts might have been made on Roganda's life before Irek was born. No wonder Roganda was a liar, a chameleon, an adept manipulator of emotions and situations and behind-the-scenes power. If she hadn't been she'd have been killed. It was quite clear from the timing of events that Roganda, a child of the Jedi herself, had set out almost at once to better the hand she had been dealt at Irek's birth. Irek had been implanted at the age of five, before the debris from Alderaan had even settled into its permanent, ragged orbit around what had been that planet's sun. Had she planned it herself in her most malicious daydreams, Leia could have evolved no more wretched vengeance upon the man who had taught the Death Star's designers. Nastra Magrity had been kept, drugged with mild doses of antidepressant just sufficient to rob him of any will to leave. In a comfortable villa on a planet so inhospitable, so dangerous, so teeming with bizarre insect-borne viruses, that to step outside the magnetic field that surrounded the gardens would have resulted, within hours, in his death. I can only be thankful I had already been soothed with Telezin before they demonstrated this fact to me, he wrote sadly. I still don't know the name of the man they tied up outside the boundaries of the field, or his crime if he'd committed one the commander in charge assured me he had, but of course that could have been a lie. The bullyboos who took him out there wore T-suits, which they then cut to pieces in front of me. The man himself lasted two hours before he began to swell up. His decomposing flesh didn't begin to slough until nearly sunset, and he died shortly before dawn. If it hadn't been for the drug I don't think I'd have slept at all, either that night, or any night in the four years that I remained there. They supplied me regularly with holos of my wife. I was comfortable, and studied, and perfected the techniques by which subelectronic synapses could be controlled. I think that in spite of the drugs I was aware that in those two years there was no alteration of Elise's face nor of the length of her hair in the holos. Of Shenna, who would have grown from girl to woman in that time, they never sent me anything at all. I did my best not to think about what that meant. The drugs made that easy. When Irek was seven, his training began. It was obvious to Leia, from what Magritte said, that the boy had already had training in the use of the Force, the swift and easy simplicities of the dark side. With the less punitive accelerated learning procedures Magritte had developed for the Amwat orbital station. 
He learned enough, by the age of 12, to qualify for an advanced degree in sub-electron physics or a position as a droid motivator technician at what cost Leia. Recalling Cray's desperate measures to accelerate learning, could only guess. Every now and then a tree feeder will go mildly amuck and wander through the streets of the town squirting nutrient at passers-by. Bizarre enough when Javax had told her of it last night, but clear as daylight, Leia realized, when she understood that a 12 or 13-year-old boy was developing his powers to alter the behavior of droids. Visualize the schematic, Roganda had said. Leia thought about the mechanical intelligences behind every ship in the Republic's fleet, and shivered again. Chewbacca had repaired R2, obviously not rewiring in the same fashion, and Irek had lost his power over the droid. Han, she thought desperately. Like Drub McCum, even if she lost her own life, she had to get word out to them of the danger they faced, and how to circumvent the boy Irek's powers. They're there. They're gathering. Going to kill you all. More of that night at the Emperor's reception returned to her. Aunt Sully. Plump and pink-faced with her fading fair hair looped into the sort of lacquered confection of twirls. Pearls and artificial swags popular twenty-five years previously had taken her aside and whispered conspiratorially. It's a hotbed of intrigue, dear. Just terrible. She'd glanced across at the slender, exquisite concubines. I'm told they're all at Dagger's drawing, my dear. Because, of course, whoever can provide him with a child, that child is going to be his heir. Leia particularly remembered Roganda, like an enameled image of crimson and gold, moving from dignitary to dignitary with that same air of vulnerable shyness. At that time, Leia realized... Irek had to have been at least four years old, and Roganda already gathering her own power base, laying her plans. From things Magritte said, she must already have been training her son in the ways of the dark side of the Force. There was no way Palpatine would have let such power exist without using it for his own ends. And having acted for him in some things, it would be easy to say, these orders come from him. She wondered how Roganda had come to the old man in the first place, and whether it was he who had turned her to the dark side, as he had turned Vader and for a time turned Luke, or whether Roganda had sought him out when she saw the fate of Jedi who tried to stay free. Somehow, Leia strongly suspected the latter. Looking back at that levy, she had the tremendous sense of seeing yet another palimpsest one set of circumstances rising up through another in a complex jungle of double meaning, which at the time she eighteen years old and filled with her father's republican ideals had been completely unaware of. Her own response to Sully's words still made her wince at her own naivete. She'd indignantly quoted a dozen points concerning the transfer of power from the Senate Constitution, just as if Palpatine weren't going to tear up that document later in the year. But in fact... In the power vacuum that had succeeded Palpatine's fall, the generals, with a few notable exceptions, had mostly gone each for him or herself. None had wanted a regent, particularly not one for an infant child. The boy is now thirteen years old, wrote Magritte in his final paragraph. His control over droids and mechanicals increases daily. His use of the various artifacts of the Jedi his mother brings to him is ever more adept. He can alter sensors and sensor fields, keeping abreast of the wiring patterns of all the standard makes. He amuses himself by causing minor machinery to malfunction. His mother demands much of him, and in consequence of this I fear he has begun dabbling in substances of which she disapproves telling himself they increase his perceptions and his abilities to use the force, but in actual fact, I believe, simply because he knows she would disapprove. I see well what I have created. Mon Mothma, my friend, bail all those who tried to enlist my support and help against the rise of Palpatine's power. I can only beg for your understanding, for I know that what I have done is not something that can be forgiven. I will try to get these notes to you in some fashion. Should I not, 
I fear that all will believe the worst of me. I tried to make the best decisions I could. With what results, I pray that you will never have occasion to see. To you I sign myself in all wretchedness, Nastra Magridi. Leia folded the notes together and slipped them into the pocket of her tea suit. I fear that all will believe the worst of me. With all her power, once the Emperor was dead Roganda had not joined in the immediate and general grab for power possibly because Irek was too young to use his powers, and possibly because warlords like High Admiral Thrawn had something against Roganda that Roganda considered insurmountable. A DNA comparison, for instance, between the Emperor and the child Irek that proved that the boy was not, in fact, Palpatine's son. Possibly Thrawn simply didn't like the woman. It was a viewpoint for which Leia had a good deal of sympathy. Instead Roganda had come here, to her own childhood home, where she knew she could raise and train her son unnoticed and where she knew the Jedi had left at least some training aids. Raise him and train him until he could not be ignored. It occurred to her to wonder whether Roganda had been grooming and preparing her own child to replace Palpatine at all. It sounded very much more, thought Leia uneasily, as if Roganda's intent had been to raise up not another Palpatine, but another Darth Vader. Chapter 19 Master Luke? It was very important. Master Luke? He had to wake up, come out of it, cross back over to the conscious world from the peaceful subsurface darkness of dreams. Please, Master Luke! Why? He knew that on the other side of that fragile wall of waking lay the fire heat of nearly unbearable pain. Much better to stay unconscious. He was tired, his body desperate for rest. Without rest, all the force he could bring to bear on self-healing was wasted, as if he were trying to fill a jar up with water before he'd patched the hole in its bottom. His leg hurt a raging infection and stress injuries exacerbating the original severed tendons and cracked bone. Every muscle and ligament felt stretched and torn and every centimeter of flesh ached as if he'd been pounded with hammers. The dreams had been unpleasant. Callista, what could be so important on the other side that it couldn't wait? After Callista had left or perhaps while she still lay in his arms, her head pillowed on his shoulder in the aftermath of loving he had drifted into deeper sleep. He had seen her far off, in the girlhood left behind on Chad, riding mermaid-like behind the sleek black and brown sighing with her brown hair slicked where the waves broke over her head, or sitting alone on a now buoy to watch the sun drown itself in the sea. Conversation replayed in his mind. You sound as if you've studied them. You could say they were my next-door neighbors growing up. Only he and Callista were no longer in the dark office, orange words coming out of the black screen like stars at sunset. Rather they sat side by side in that old T-70 he'd sold for Ban the feed to pay passage for Ben and himself on the Millennium Falcon, all those distant forevers ago. It surprised him that he hadn't known Callista then. That she hadn't always been someone he knew. They were on the cliffs above Beggar's Canyon. Passing his old Macrobinox back and forth to watch the startlingly unobtrusive progress of a line of banthas among the rocks of the opposite rim. The clumsy beasts moving faster than one would guess from their appearance, the dry wind fluttering the sand covered veiling of their riders, and the slanting sun flashing harshly on metal and glass. Nobody's ever figured out how to tell a hunting party from a tribe moving house, Luke said, as Callista made an adjustment to the focus. Nobody's ever seen children or young or whatever nobody knows whether some of those warriors are females, or even if there are male and female sand people. Mostly when you see sand people or even hear the banthas roaring you just head the other way as fast as you can. Has anyone ever tried to make friends with them? She handed the binox back, brushed a blowing trail of hair from her eyes. She still wore the baggy gray coverall she'd had on in some earlier dream, 
but her face was clean and unscarred now, and she looked less strained, less exhausted, than she had. He was glad of that, glad to see her happy and at ease. If anyone tried, he didn't survive to talk about it. Out of sheer habit Luke scanned his own side of the canyon rim, and the rocks below. He saw no sign of the Tuscans, but then, one frequently didn't. There was an innkeeper over at Anchorhead who had the bright idea of trying to get them on his side I think he wanted to go into the desert pirate business. He noticed they raid pika and debdeb orchards those are sweet fruits they grow in some oases and cooked up sugar water in a still to see if he could use it to bargain with them. It supposedly got them paralytically drunk and they seemed to enjoy it. He made up another batch and they came back and killed him. Luke shrugged. Maybe they didn't like feeling good. She turned, her gray eyes widening, like one who has seen a revelation. But that explains everything. She cried. It's a clue to where they come from. What? Said Luke, startled. They're related to my Uncle Diarro. He hated to have a good time and didn't think anybody else should either. Luke laughed and all the diamond hardness, the dark forged Jedi strength of his heart, was transfigured into light. He swung the speeder in a swooping dive away down the trail. Wow! That means your Uncle Diaro is related to my Aunt Cooley. Which means we're long-lost cousins! Luke mined a wildly exaggerated double take of recognition. They were laughing like teenagers as they sped down the trail. Come on, he said. We're gonna be late, it's past noon now, and we've got to be there at 1600. The speeder's shadow fluttered after them, like a blue-gray scarf dragged over the rocks. 1600, thought Luke. 1600. It's past noon now, and we've got to be there at. 1600. He came to consciousness with a cry as if he'd been tipped into an acid bath of pain. All the aches and stiffness of his struggle against the droids fell on him like a collapsing wall. He stifled a moan and 3PO cried, Thank the Maker! I was afraid you were never coming around. Luke turned his head, though to do so felt as if he were breaking his own neck. He lay on a pile of blankets and what felt like insulation on the worktable in the fabrications lab just beyond his old headquarters in the quartermaster's office on deck 12, illuminated by sputtering yellow emergency lights. The anti-grav sled floated near the floor along the far wall. 3PO stood beside his makeshift bed with the air of one who had paced at least 50 kilometers back and forth across the 4-meter room, the black box of an emergency medkit in his hands. What time is it? It's 1300 hours 37 minutes, sir. He set the medkit down beside Luke and opened it. Miss Callista informed me that you ran afoul of the ship's maintenance droids and I must say, sir, that I'm absolutely shocked that even the will could induce such disgraceful behavior in mechanicals and gave me the coordinates to find you. In addition to changing the dressing on your leg, on her instructions I've administered anti-shock and a mild metabolic enhancer. But frankly, sir, even with proper first aid I don't consider you in any condition to fight the Gamorreans, although I can only speak from personal observation, not being a medical droid myself. How do you feel, sir? Like the last third of a hundred-kilometer road race with a busted stabilizer. Luke Tate shut the gash in the leg of his coverall over the last three Paragon patches he or 3PO had been able to find. I think I want one of those about the size of a blanket. He gingerly moved his shoulder, which had been all but dislocated in the struggle the shrapnel cuts on his face smarted with disinfectant and the flesh all around them was swollen and exquisitely tender to the touch. His left hand and arm, burned by shorting wires, had been clumsily bandaged and dosed with some kind of local anesthetic, which wasn't working very well. The skin of his right hand had been cut open, bloodless, to show the glint of metal underneath. I don't believe they make them in that size, sir. Thripio sounded worried. 
as well he might, thought Luke. I wonder if the food Twitter is still up there? It's fine. Her voice was in his head, clear and soft the words might even have been actually audible, because 3PO replied. But Miss Callista, diversion or no diversion, Master Luke is scarcely up to taking on Gamorreans. No, we've been going about this all wrong, said Luke. If the Wook can program droids to think I'm garbage that needs recycling or can program Gamorreans to think Cray is a rebel saboteur, it's about time we went into the programming business ourselves. Torches were burning all around the gaffed village when Luke limped through the wide doors of the storage hold. The place stank of acrid smoke and a suggestion of malfunctioning waste disposal, or at the very least too few visits by the increasingly scarce MSEs. By the light of the huge bonfire in front of the central hut, Bolyak was constructing a splendid mail shirt of red and blue plastic messroom plates and engine tape. She looked up with a fierce grunt as the slender Jedi and his gleaming servant stepped into the ring of the firelight. She said something to him and gestured to him to advance. 3PO translated, The Lady Bulyak asks if her husbands did this to you. Another long string of guttural rumbles. She adds her opinion that neither of them is particularly intelligent or sexually competent, though I really fail to see what bearing that has on the matter. Give the Lady Bulyak my compliments and tell her that I've discovered a path to allow her husbands and the other boars of the tribe to redeem themselves in truly heroic combat against worthy enemies. The South sat up. Her greenish eyes gleamed like evil jewels in their pockets of warty fat. She says that her husbands and the other boars have all become stupid and idle from looking at the computer screens too much and have neglected their duties to their tribe and to her. She would be grateful to you if you could recall them from this stupid enslavement to the thing in the monitor screens that thinks more about catching vermin than it does about the need of boars to act like boars. She adds further detail that has no apparent connection to the matter at hand. Luke suppressed a grin. In his mind he could almost hear Callista's snort of laughter. Ask her where her husbands might be found. Behind you, rebel scum! They were actually grouped in the doorway empty-handed, for which Luke was profoundly glad. Having paid off the Jawas with the corpse of the G-40 to cut certain power lines, he'd feared his grubby hirelings would be caught in the act. Ugba shoved 3PO aside, sending the droids sprawling with a clatter. Two other boars seized Luke's arms. This outage is your doing, eh? Snarled the Gamorrean. You and your rebel saboteurs. Bolyak surged to her feet. You can be brave warriors against a puny little cripple and a walking talk machine. Translated 3PO, rather feebly, from the floor. His voice was nearly drowned by the sow's thunderstorm of shrieks. But given the chance to meet and fight those stinking misbegotten soap-eating clags, you all run away like morts to do the bidding of something behind a screen that never even shows itself. Ugbuzz hesitated. The Gamorrean in him was clearly at war with his indoctrinated stormtrooper persona. But it's orders, he argued at last. It's the will. It's the will that you act like true boars, put in Luke gently. In spite of the sweat-stringy hair hanging in his eyes and the bruises all over one side of his unshaven face, his voice was the voice of a Jedi Master, reaching to touch the minds of those with little mind of their own. Only by being true boars can you be true stormtroopers. The big boar hesitated, almost visibly wringing his hands. Luke added to Bulyak, I have heard that Mugs Hub laughs at you for having a feeble tribe that won't fight and calls you Piglet Mommy. Bulyak let out a furious squeal and, as Luke had expected, struck him hard enough to have knocked him reeling had the warriors not been holding him. He went limp and rolled with the blow. The infuriated sow kicked 3PO halfway across the hold, then started slapping Ugbuzz and every boar in sight, screaming obscenities that 3PO, from his corner, dutifully translated in a startling wealth of anatomical detail. But it's the will! insisted Ugbuzz helplessly, as if this were self-explanatory. It's the will. 
3PO translated what, in Bulyak's opinion, Agbaz could do with a will, and added, But I'm afraid that doesn't sound at all physically possible, sir. Perhaps the will has changed, offered Luke in his soft voice. Perhaps now that a way has been found for you to do your duty as fighting boars, it is consonant with the intent of the will that you do this. As one, Ugbuz and his men dashed into the big hut at the far end of the hold, Bulyak in high-volume pursuit. Luke picked himself up from the floor where he'd been dropped, helped 3 po to his feet, and wiping the blood from the corner of his mouth, limped after them. He found them clustered breathlessly around the monitor screen. In spite of the fact that all computer lines had been cut to the storage hold over an hour ago, a line of orange letters swam up into view. It is consonant with the intent of the will that you ascend to Deck 19 by means of Lift 21 and annihilate those stinking sons of cabbage pickers, and their mangy little morts. Two they nearly trampled him barreling out the door. What is it? growled a buzz. At Luke's signal the two stormtroopers who'd been carrying him for the sake of speed stopped and set him on his feet. This ain't Lift 21. The Gamorrean's piggy yellow eyes gleamed suspiciously in the dim flare of the emergency lights. The whole deck was dark now, and the air felt cold, stuffy, and strange. Curious scramblings and scufflings seemed to whisper all around them in the dark and Luke realized it had been quite some time since he'd seen a working SP or MSC. Only their gutted corpses, like row kills along the walls. 3PO stood silhouetted in the dark door of the quartermaster's office, gleaming in the feeble reflection of the lights of Luke's staff. Intelligence Report Luke hobbled to the droid's side and put a hand on the golden metal shoulder to draw him through to the storeroom beyond the office. The anti-grav sled was there. Additional power had been jacked into it from the cells of the G-40 and the two snake droids Luke had killed to raise it three meters above the floor. You okay in here? He asked softly. Quite all right, Master Luke. As long as I remain within the perimeters programmed into the trackers the Jawas cannot molest me. But I suggest that you pay off the Jawas quickly, before the power ebbs to the point where the sled settles any further. It had already settled a good half meter even with the two trackers 3PO had reprogrammed to stun Jawas. Once the sled with its load of dead robots got within two Jawa heights of the floor the point at which they could stand on each other's shoulders one way or another, they'd find a means of helping themselves. Luke could already see the little knot of brown-robed figures grouped in the door making their calculations, muttering among themselves in their shrill, childlike voices. Any problems? The smallest of the Jawas scurried forward, lay down, and kissed Luke's boots. Master, we did our best, did our best. It got up again. It was the one he'd rescued whom he nicknamed Shorty in his mind. Yellow eyes gleamed like firebugs in the black pit of its hood. Went to the places you said, tried to cut the wires you said. It held out its hand. Luke winced. The claw-like fingers were blistered and black with burns. Others stepped forward, stretching out their arms, and the evidence of injury was appalling. It's true, Luke. Callista's voice spoke soft at his side. The cables feeding power to the punishment chamber aren't only shielded, they're booby-trapped. One of the Jawas was killed trying to get in and two others are badly stunned. We can't cut power to the grid. Something else? Queried Shorty. Trade you 600 meters silver wire, 14 size A Telgorn power cells. 30 sized DeLoriner cells for drive housings, an optical circuitry of two Cybet Galactica gyro heel multifunctions. Luke barely heard him. He felt cold, panic whispering under the bones of his chest. Cray was due to be taken to execution in under an hour, and the grid in the punishment chamber was still live. His mind raced, trying to fit new plans, new conditions. Twenty size A Telgorns, Shorty urged. 
This is all we have. Without them we will grope in the dark like blind grubs in the rock, but for you, master, we make a special deal. Thirty A's, said Luke, recovering, knowing what he'd have to do. If the Jawas claimed they had twenty size A's it meant a stockpile of at least forty-five. And thirty D's, and thirty meters of reversing shielded cable, in trade for the gyro heel multis. For the rest, you do another job for me. All the rest? Half a dozen hooded heads turned when Jawa moved a step toward the black, floating shadow of the sled, and both trackers swiveled in a flashing of baleful lenses. The Jawa stepped back the precise eight centimeters required to put it beyond the tracker's range. Luke realized he'd have to conclude his deal quickly or his currency would end up being purloined before he even got back with Cray and Nichas. If he got back with Cray and Nichas. All the rest, said Luke. Easy job. Easy. At your service, master, master, whined the Jawas in chorus. They crowded around him, waving their burned hands and arms. Some had been bandaged with rags and strips of insulation and uniforms Luke wondered if it would be safe to detail 3PO to get them disinfectants from sick bay and decided it was too risky until Cray was safe. Do anything, promised Shorty. Kill all the big guards. Steal the engines. Anything. Okay, said Luke. I want you to go all over the ship, everywhere and bring me back all the tripods and put them all in one room. All in the mess hall, and keep them there. Don't hurt them, don't kill them, don't tie them up, just get them there gently, and put out water for them to drink. Okay? The Jawa saluted. Its robe smelled like a gondar pit. Okay, master. All okay. Pay now? Bring power cells to lift 21 and I pay half. Luke tried not to think how little time remained between the present moment and 1,600 hours. Cray was going to be executed and he had to play junk broker to the Jawas. And hurry. They're already master. The Jawas flurried away into the darkness. They're yesterday. High above the floor. The trackers clicked and whirred and dangled their grippers in by-brained automated disapproval. Luke leaned on his staff. He was trembling with fatigue. You okay here by yourself for a little longer? Quite all right, sir. A stroke of brilliance, if you will permit me to say so, sir. Luke produced the sled controls from his pocket, lowered the sled itself to the floor. He was aware of the smell of Jawa's strengthening in the room as he opened the tailgate, awkwardly balancing against the side of the sled as he dragged out the gutted treadwell and the two gyro heel snake droids. Okay, he said, slamming the gate again. It'll be tougher to guard, but I need the sled. You think the trackers can handle it? For a time, sir. The droid sounded worried, peering into the impenetrable shadows which were not quite impenetrable to those heat-sensitive optic receptors. Though I must say, those Jawas are diabolically clever. Callista's voice spoke from the shadows, where Luke had had, all through the conversation, the sense that she stood, just and only just out of sight. Sure is lucky for our side that Luke's diabolically clever, too. He felt her pride in him, palpable as the touch of her hand. The Jawas were at lift 21 with the power cells by the time Luke and his sweatily odoriferous forces arrived. Luke was steering the anti-grav sled, thankful to be off his feet he could feel the creep of exhaustion and pain beginning and thought, Drat, I only put that paragon in a few hours ago. He glanced at the chronometer above the doors of the lift. 1,520 Down the lift shaft from some floor above, a soft contralto voice floated. All personnel are to report to observation screens in the section lounges. All personnel are to report to observation screens in the section lounges. 
failure to do so will be construed as a buzz and his stalwarts turned automatically around. Luke sprang from the sled, wincing as he stumbled, and caught the captain's arm. That doesn't mean you, Captain Abbas. Or your men. The Boar frowned laboriously. But failure to report will be construed as sympathy with the intent of the saboteurs. Luke focused the force into the small, cramped dark of that disturbed and divided mind. You're on special assignment, he reminded him. Your assignment is to fulfill your destiny as a Boar of the Gaff tribe. Only thus can you truly serve the intent of the will. How easy, he thought bitterly as he saw relief flood the boar's eyes. It must have been for Palpatine to maneuver men using just those words, just those thoughts. And how easy for anyone who did it to become addicted to that smiling rush of satisfied power, when the stormtrooper captain signaled his followers back to the open doors of the shaft. It was the work of only minutes to link the power cells in series and hook them to the sled's lifters with the long green and yellow snakes of the reversing cables. From above, Luke could hear, if he stretched out his perceptions, the breaths and heartbeats of the guards at the upper levels of the shaft. The dim glow of his staff showed him the fused patches of ricochets on the shaft walls, the black scars all around the lift doors where the clags had practiced their aim. In the slow rise of the Antigraph sled, the Gakfeds would be sitting targets. 1,525. Luke took the Footwitter's trackball from his pocket. As he pressed the activation toggle, he reached out still farther with his senses, listened to the hollow of the shaft, praying that the inclusion grid hadn't shorted the voter circuits. Nichas! Distant, echoing. Reduced to a half-heard wailing breath, the cry still came to him, a hideous echo of terror, despair, and fury. Luke's breath caught painfully as he heard half-heard, maybe only felt the scuffle and clang of boots, the hiss of a door. Nichas, damn you, act like a man if you remember how. And closer, the sudden drift of a guard's voice. What's that? Luke heard nothing. But after a moment someone else said, Stinkin' pond scum gackfeds are up here. There was a rush of retreating feet. Now! Luke hit the activators on the sled's motors as two gackfeds slid it out over the edge into the lift shaft. It balanced, bobbed, like a rowboat in a well. Luke graded the power up on a slow curve as the airzat stormtroopers piled into the sled. He was horribly aware of the dark drop of 80 meters or more beneath him. The sled sank a little under their weight. Then held steady. The shaft carried few echoes, but far off, if he shut his eyes, stretched out his awareness, he could hear the clags cursing as they followed the drifting footwitter through silent halls and storerooms lit only by the feeble penny dips of emergency lighting could almost hear a breath within his mind the reverberation of Callista's silent laughter as she maneuvered the tracker ahead of them, like a child pushing a balloon. Then Cray's voice again, bitterly cursing the man who could not help her as they dragged her through the halls toward her death. No, thought Luke despairingly, as he upped the slow feet of power into the repulsor lifts. No, no, no. The engines whined a moment, desperately fighting weight twice their design capacity on a gravity column already dozens of times higher than they were intended to rise. Luke shut his eyes and drew on the strength of the force. It was hard to concentrate, hard to focus and funnel the glowing strength of the universe through a body crumbling with fatigue and a mind clouded with growing pain. Hard to call into jewel-clear power the lambent energies of stars and space and solar winds of life even the sweaty, smelly, angry, and desperately confused creatures around him. For the Force was part of them, too. Part of the tripods, the Jawas, the sand people, Kidanax. All of them had the Force, the glowing strength of life. Concentrating was like trying to focus light through warped and dirty glass. Luke fought to clear his mind, 
to put aside Cray and Nichas and Callista, to put aside himself as well. Slowly, the sled and its burden began to rise. Only the lift, only the rising, thought Luke. They are the only things that exist. No before or after. Like a glittering leaf ascending in darkness. The yells of the clags grew louder. As if looking at a gauge that had nothing to do with the body or the soul of Anakin Skywalker's son, Luke observed the orange torch-lit doorway sinking toward them and readied his hand on the repulsor lift controls. The idiots are going to jump on each other's shoulders to get to the doors first. It would capsize the sled and spill them all down nearly 100 meters of shaft, but he couldn't break his concentration enough to say so. Instead he slowed his mind, sped his perceptions, trimming the sleds for lifters separately to compensate as right on schedule the Gamorreans leaped and grabbed and piled on each other's shoulders to be the first ones through the doorway. Squealing, cursing, waving axes and shoulder cannons, heedless of Luke's execution of maneuvers that would have made a transport tech blench. The sled rocked and heaved but nobody fell. The Gakfeds, accepting the navigational near miracle as a commonplace, were all out of the sled and gone before a true commander would have let any of them stand. Panting, shaking, sweat burning in the cuts on his face, and cold in every extremity, Luke timed the power dim precisely with their departure so that the sled wouldn't shoot up through the end of the shaft, and then steadied the much-lightened vessel into the torchlit guard lobby of Deck 19. He collected his staff and rolled over the side, too weary to open the tailgate, lay on the floor, fighting the wave of reaction, the weakness of calling on the force far beyond his current strength. On the wall, the chronometer read 1550. Cray, he thought, breathing deep of the stuffy, smoke-filthy air. Cray. And Cray will help me save Callista. I'll pay for this later. He climbed to his feet. Now. In a way it was harder to focus the force in his own body, to call strength from outside himself, channeling it through muscles burning with the toxins of fatigue and infection and a mind hurting for rest. But that, too, he put aside, moved forward with a warrior's light strength, barely aware of the lurch and drag of his injured leg, the awkwardness of the staff. The corridor around him rang with the sudden cacophony of battle. He flattened to the wall as Gamorreans fell out of the hall before him. Hacking, yelling, firing almost point-blank with blasters whose shots ricocheted crazily or ripped long burns in the walls gouging at one another with tusks and raking with stumpy claws, then screams like the rip of metal and canvas, and stray gouts of blood stinking like hot copper in the air. Luke dodged, swung around the corner and into the heat of the fray, but saw no glimpse of the green uniform Cray had been wearing, no cornsilk flash of hair. A nightmare vision of Cray lying bleeding in some corridor flashed through his mind then from the door of a through-passage Callista yelled. Luke. And he ran, holding himself up against the wall, barely feeling the sawing pain. This way. All personnel are to report to the section lounges, said the tannoy clear now, and Luke thought, this part of the ship is still alive. The will is here. All personnel are to report. Luke. He skidded to a stop around a corner facing the shut black double door of what was labeled Punishment 2, over whose lintel a single small light burned amber. Nichas stood against the wall, a statue of brushed silver, the only thing alive in his face the desperate agony of his eyes. In front of the door stood a human stormtrooper in full armor, blaster carbine ready and pointed in his hands. Just stay where you are, Luke, said Triv Pothman's voice. The helmet altered it, rendered it tinnily inhuman, but Luke recognized it all the same. I know you feel loyal to her, but she's a rebel and a saboteur. If you back off now, I can testify in your favor. Triv, she isn't a rebel. Luke scanned the hall with his eyes and mind and detected not a fragment of loose metal, 
not even a gutted MSE or a mess room plate. There are no rebels anymore. The Empire is gone, Triv. The Emperor is dead. He literally didn't think he had the strength to rip the carbine out of Pothman's grip by the force alone. Over the door the digital readout changed to 1556, and the amber light began to blink red. Triv hesitated, then repeated in precisely the same tones. I know you feel loyal to her, but... That was a long time ago. Luke reached out with his mind, feeling his way to the older man's thoughts as if physically trying to penetrate the white plastic of the dog-faced helmet, the guarding darkness that armored his thoughts. Six meters separated them. Exhausted, blank, vision tunneling to grayness, he fumbled to collect the force and couldn't, and knew he'd be shot before he covered half the distance. And he wasn't sure he had the strength for even that. The Empire left you alone, he said softly. Alone to be yourself. Alone to do what you wanted, to grow a garden, to embroider flowers on your shirts. He could almost hear, in the dark of the old man's mind, the shrill voice of the will, the Jedi killed your family. They descended on your village in the night. They slew the men in the space among the houses, rounded up the women under the trees. You fled in the darkness, stumbling in the mud and streams. Remember your captain and the other men killing each other? Said Luke, conjuring the green shadows of the shelter, the gleam of those forty-five white helmets on a plank. The crunch of leaves underfoot and the smoky smell they produced. Remember the camp you made, and the meadow by the stream? You lived there a long time, Triv. And the Empire disappeared. I know you feel loyal to her, but she's a... Vines. The Earth. A tiny reptile with jewel-colored feathers picking up a thrown breadcrumb in the doorway. The smell of the stream. The reality of what had been. The years of peace. She's a rebel and a saboteur. His voice trailed off. What had really been, thought Luke. He held it out to Pothman, shining memories of place and time. Memories of those things that he himself had actually seen and knew, like a slice of sunlight piercing the digitalized tape loop in Pothman's mind. The light above the door blinked faster. 1,559. Festering skybolts. Luke sprang, scrambled to help him, the rings gripping fast, refusing to budge, as if held from the other side or from within the walls themselves by the will. Nichos seized them, twisted with the sudden, inexorable, mechanical strength of a droid. Air hissed as the seals broke. It's fighting me! yelled Nichos, dragging the door open, and indeed, the heavy steel leaf was pulling visibly at his grip. It's trying to close. Luke's lightsaber whined to life in his hands. Cray stood manacled between two support posts, face white with shock and exhaustion in the charcoal sheen of the grid's strange light. She yelled, It's too late! As Luke limped, stumbled in, slashed at the steel that held her wrists. It's too late, Luke! With the last of his strength Luke blasted at the grid with his mind misfire, flawed connection, a crucial jump of energy not jumping. A searing, single bolt of lightning pierced the calf of his bad leg like a white needle as Cray dragged him out through the door. Chapter 20 Cray said softly, He was there. She wrapped her arms around herself, pulling close the thermal blanket he'd brought her bowed her head until her cheek rested on her drawn-up knees. He was there the whole time. He kept saying he loved me, he kept saying be brave, be brave. But he didn't do one damn thing to stop them. With her chopped-off hair ragged and dirty and her face haggard with exhaustion and emotional ruin, she looked much younger than she had when Luke had seen her on Yavin, or in her home territory at the Institute, 
or in Nichasa's hospital room. In all of those places, for all of her life, she had worn her perfection like armor, he saw. And now that, and all things else, were gone. Smoky light wavered from the crude lamp in the corner, the only illumination in the room. The air in the cul-de-sac of the quartermaster's office and the workrooms beyond it had gotten so bad Luke wondered if he should take the time to wire the local fans to cannibalize power cells, provided he could find them. If there was time. Heart and bones, he felt there wasn't. He had a restraining bolt. I know he had a scum-eating motherless restraining bolt, you jerk. She screamed the words, spat them at him, hatred and fury a bitter fire in her eyes, and when the words were out sat staring at him in blind, helpless rage behind which Luke could see the fathomless well of defeat and grief and the ending of everything she had ever hoped. Then silence, as Cray turned her face aside. The nervous thinness that had advanced on her during Nichasa's illness had turned brittle, as if something had been taken, not just from her flesh, but from the marrow of her bones. Over the torn uniform, grind with blood and oil, the blanket hung on her like a battered shroud. She took a deep breath, and when she spoke again her voice was perfectly steady. He was programmed not to obey anything I said. He wouldn't even get me food. Luke knew this Nichos had told him. The tray 3PO had brought from the mess hall was untouched. Don't hate him for being what he is, he said, the only thing he could think of to say. Or for being what he's not. The words sounded puerile in his own ears, like a half-credit computerized fortune teller at a fair. Ben, he thought, would have had something to say, something healing. Yoda would have known how to deal with the wretched ruin of a friend's heart and life. The mightiest Jedi in the universe. He reflected bitterly that he knew of, anyway the destroyer of the Sun Crusher, the slayer of evil, who defeated the recloned Emperor and the Sith Lord Exercuin, and all he could offer someone who had been disemboweled was, gee, I'm sorry you're not feeling so well. Cray brought her hands up to her head as if to press some blinding ache from her skull. I wish I did hate him, she said. I love him and that's worse to the power of ten. She looked up at him, her eyes tearless stone. Get out of here, Luke, she said without animosity, her face like flash-frozen wax that would crack at a breath. I want to go to sleep, Luke hesitated, instinctively knowing that this woman shouldn't be left alone. At his side, Callista said softly, I'll stay with her. Nichas, Pothman, and 3PO were in the fabrication lab outside. 3PO was explaining, They're quite the slowest and most deliberate race in the galaxy. To the best of my knowledge, all of the Kittenaks are still grouped in the section lounge exactly where the Gamorreans put them, still discussing their grandparents' recipes for Damit. It's most extraordinary. And yet during their mating season during the rains they move with quite amazing speed. They all turned as Luke came through the office door, and Nichas stepped awkwardly forward, holding out one hand. Cray had taken the mold for it when he was in the hospital, accurate down to the birthmark where the V made by thumb and forefinger came to a point. Accurate like the blue eyes, the mobile fold at the corner of the lips. Like the gigabytes of digitalized information on family, friends, likes and dislikes, who he was, and what he wanted. She all right? Asked Pothman into the silence. Come on, Nick, said Luke quietly. Let me... Let me get that restraining bolt off you. Nichasa's eyes went past him to the shut door. I see. Luke drew breath to speak though he didn't know what he was going to say, what he could say but Nichas held up his hand and shook his head. I understand. I expect you will not want to see me ever again. 
as he fetched the toolkit from the locker on the wall, and the old stormtrooper brought one of the flickering battery lights to illuminate his work, Luke honestly didn't know whether, given Cray's parting words to him, she would want to see her fiancé again or not. He took refuge in the task at hand, which was more complicated than a simple pop-on, pop-off bolt usually employed with droids. This one was dogged in with minute-magnetized catches, and Luke could see, programmed in a number of specific ways. The will had to have instructed the clags in its installation. He ran a quick integral test on it to make sure it hadn't been booby-trapped, then collimated the probe down to the smallest increment, and began to pull the internal relays. There was a certain amount of comfort to be obtained from purely mechanical tasks. He told himself to remember that for another time. Luke! He looked up quickly, to meet the blue glass eyes. In the shadowy gloom the face that he'd known so well was almost a stranger's, affixed monstrously to the silver cowl of the metal skull. Am I really Nichas? Luke said. I don't know. He had never in his life felt so helpless, because in his heart in the secret shadows where the truth always lay he knew that this was a lie. He knew. I was hoping you would be able to tell me, said Nichas softly. You know me or you knew him. Cray programmed me too. To know everything Nichas knew, to do everything Nichas did, to be everything Nichas was, and to think that I really am Nichas. But I don't know. What do you mean? Protested 3PO. Of course you're Nichas. Who else would you be? That's like asking if the fall of the sun was written by Erwathat, or another Karelian of the same name. Luke? Luke concentrated on pulling out the minutely programmed fiber optic wires. Am I another Karelian of the same name? I'd like to tell you one way or the other, said Luke. The bolt came away from the brushed steel chest, lay thick and heavy in Luke's hand. One hand real, one hand mechanical, but both his. But I... I don't know. You are who you are. You are the being, the consciousness, that you are at this moment. That's all I can tell you. That fact, at least, was true. The smooth face did not alter, but the blue eyes looked infinitely sad. I had hoped that, being a Jedi, you would know. And Luke had the uncomfortable sensation that, having been a Jedi, Nichos knew perfectly well that he was keeping something back. I love her. Nichos looked again toward the doorway, his face the calm face of a droid, his eyes the eyes of a desperately unhappy man. I say that I know that yet I cannot tell the difference, if there is one, between the devotion, the loyalty, that R2 and 3PO feel toward you. And I don't remember whether that's love or something else. I can't set them side by side to compare. When they were holding Cray a prisoner, when they mistreated her, struck her forced her to go through those stupid parodies of a trial I would have done anything to help her. Except that, since I was programmed not to interfere with them, it was literally something that I could not do. I could not make my limbs, my body, act in a fashion contrary to my programming not to interfere. He took the restraining bolt from Luke's hand, held it between thumb and forefinger, examining it dispassionately in the jaundiced glare of the lamp on the table beside them. The terrible thing is that I don't feel bad about it. Why in the universe should you? Asked 3PO startled. No reason, said Nichas. A droid cannot go against his basic programming, or restraints placed upon his programming if they do not conflict with the deepest level of motivational limiters. But I think Nichas would have. She's asleep now. Luke was as aware of her entering the room as if she'd come through the shut door that separated it from the tiny office. He was alone. In the dense shadows the batteries on the lamp had gone. 
finally. And the only illumination came from the emergency supply of grease. Burning with makeshift wicks and two big red plastic mess hall bowls on the work table he could almost trick himself into believing he saw her, tall and lanky with her brown hair hanging down her back in a tail as long and thick as his arm. I can't let her be destroyed, he thought, and his heart twisted with despair. Is Nichas all right? Luke nodded then caught himself and shook his head. Nichas is a droid he said. I know. He felt her presence beside him, as if she had hiked herself up to sit next to him on the edge of the workbench, booted feet dangling, as he was sitting. The warmth of her flesh came back to him from his dream, the passionate strength with which she'd clung to him, the sweetness of her mouth under his. Luke, she said gently. Sometimes there is nothing you can do, he expelled his breath in an angry gust, fist clenched hard, but he did not, after all, speak for a time. Then it was only to say, I know. He realized he hadn't known that two weeks ago. In some ways, learning about Sith lords and clone emperors had been easier. He made a crooked grin. I guess the trick is learning when those times are. Jin Altus used to teach us that said Callista softly. We have been for ten thousand years the guardians of peace and justice in the galaxy. He always used to preface his stories and his teaching with that. But sometimes justice is best served by knowing when to fold one's hands. And he'd come up with some illustrative story from the archives and the oral tradition of the Jedi about some incident where what appeared to be going on wasn't actually what was going on. He felt the rueful chuckle of her laughter. It used to drive me crazy. But he said, every student is obliged to make 1,080 major mistakes. The sooner you make them, the sooner you will not have to make them anymore. I asked him for a list. He said, thinking there's a list is mistake number four. How long were you with him? Five years. Not nearly long enough. No, said Luke, thinking about the few weeks he'd spent on Dagobah. He sighed again. I just wish some of those 1,080 mistakes didn't involve teaching students, teaching Jedi, transmitting power, or the ability to use the Force. My ignorance, my own inexperience, cost one of my students his life already and threw another one into the arms of the dark side and caused havoc in the galaxy I don't even want to think about. The whole thing the Academy, and bringing back the skills of the Jedi is too important for. 4. Learn while you teach. That's... He hesitated, hating to say it of his teacher but knowing he had to. That's the mistake Ben made, when he taught my father. There was silence again though she was as near to him as she had been in the landspeeder on the canyon rim, passing Binox back and forth while they watched for sand people. If Ben hadn't taught your father, said Callista softly, your father probably wouldn't have been strong enough to kill Palpatine. Nor would he have been in a position to do so. You couldn't have done it, she added. Not then, no. He'd never thought of it that way. She went on. I'm recording everything I remember about Jin's teaching. Her voice was very quiet, like the offer of a gift she wasn't sure would be well received. I've been working on this, on and off, since you first told me about what you're doing. Techniques, exercises, meditations, theories sometimes just the stories he tell. Everything I remember. Things that I don't think should be lost. Things that will help you. I understand that a lot of the techniques, a lot of the the mental powers, the ways to use the force can't be described, can only be shown one person to another, but they may be able to help you after you leave here. Callista, he began desperately, and her voice continued resolutely over his. I'm not a master, and my perception of them isn't a master's perception. 
but it's all the formal training that you didn't have the chance to receive. I'll make sure you have the wafers of as much of it as I can finish before you leave. Callista, I can't. He felt her gaze on him, rain gray and steady, as she had looked at Geith, and he couldn't go on. You can't let this battle station fall into the hands of whoever it is who's learned to use the force to move electronic minds, she said. She was so real she had come back so far along the road that he would have sworn he felt the touch of her hand on his. I traded my life for it thirty years ago, and I'd trade yours and Craze and whoever else is on this battle station if I if we have to. Where did you send the others? He recognized it as a shift of topic, a deliberate looking away from the realization that he would have to destroy her. Or perhaps, he thought, it was just that she knew as he knew that time was too short to waste words when they both knew she was right. He took a deep breath, reorganizing his thoughts. To the main mess hall, he said. I've figured out how to neutralize the sand people and get at the shuttles. If she's angry at you for only doing what you had to, said Triv Pothman, his soft bass voice echoing strangely in the utter silence of the lightless halls. She's not going to want to even see my face. And I don't blame her. C-3PO's hypercute hearing dissected the tight shrillness of anguish in his voice, and the sensors on his left hand which the human was clasping, since the corridor was pitch dark registered both abnormal cold and greater than usual muscular tension, also signs of stress. That Pothman would experience stress in the circumstances was of course understandable. 3PO had learned that total darkness created disorientation and symptoms of fear even when the human involved knew that he was in perfect safety which was certainly not the case on this benighted vessel. But he gathered from the context of the words that the darkness. The realization that air was no longer circulating on these decks and available supplies of oxygen would be exhausted in eight months even with the small amount of photosynthesis being produced by the Aphitekans and the knowledge that sand people occupied the vessel. Were not the main sources of the former stormtroopers' distress, though in 3PO's opinion they should have been. Surely she realizes that the indoctrination process rendered you no more capable of independent action than Nichas was while under the influence of the restraining bolt? 3PO kept his voter circuits turned down to 18 decibels, well below the hearing threshold of either Gamorreans or sand people, and adjusted the intensity so that the sound waves would carry exactly the point seventy-five meters that separated his speaker from Pothman's ear. I hit her, I. I insulted her, said things I wish I'd cut out my own tongue rather than say to a young lady. She was indoctrinated herself, and will be familiar with the standardized secondary personality imposed by the programming. 3PO, said Nichas's quiet voice from the darkness behind. Sometimes that doesn't matter. Pale light dimmed the darkness up ahead, delineating the corner of a cross corridor, the appalling mess that littered the floor plates, gutted MSEs and SPs, shell casings from projectile grenades, broken axe handles, and spilled food and coffee. Mort scuttled among the filth and their Swedish stink, like dirty clothes, added to the general offensiveness of the scene. The soft murmur of air circulating equipment became audible, if one could separate it out from the truly appalling clamor coming from the mess hall, squeals, shrieks, and drunken voices singing, pillaging villages one by one. Pothman closed his eyes in a kind of embarrassed pain. Nichas remarked, Well, I see everybody made it back from the battle. Awful thing is, said Pothman, I suspect Kinfarg and his boys are doing the same thing up on Deck 19. Mudshub was pretty sore at them for not doing their duty by her and getting into fights with everybody they saw. Really, said 3PO in prissy disapproval, I doubt that I shall ever understand organically based thought processes. You'd better stay out in the corridor, whispered Nichas to Pothman. In the dim glow from the mess hall door the only area on deck 12 that retained any power the antigraph sled bobbed behind them like a dory at a wharf. 
The overburdening it had taken in the lift shaft had left it with a blown stabilizer, but it was still easier to tow it than to carry what Luke had instructed them to bring back to the fabrications lab. 3PO and I are perceived as droids that is, something they don't have to worry about. Indeed, with the fine metal mesh that had covered his joints and neck torn away and hanging in rags to expose the linkages and servos beneath, he looked more than ever like a droid. I don't think they'll even notice us or ask us about what we're doing. They might recognize you as a clag. Pothman nodded. He was rather like a shining robot himself in the white armor of a stormtrooper, a blaster slung at his side, except for the thin dark face with its lines of age, its gentle eyes and fluff of graying hair. I'll make sure the coast stays clear, he said, and gave a shy half-smile. You boys be careful in there. Three Pio halted in turning away, running a swift skin of possible intentions to see if the slight sensation of offense he experienced was appropriate, but Nichas, in a sudden rare flash of humanity, grinned. In the mess hall, the celebration was going full swing. Imperial battle stations and cruisers were equipped with automatic limiters on the total amount of alcohol they could produce at any one time, but the eyes designers had reckoned without the brewing skills of Gamorrean females. Dish after brimming dish of heady papa beer were dippered out of the giant plastic oil drum that stood in the middle of the room. The tables were strewn with stews, steaks, and fragments of sodden bread. A bowl of beer clattered off the wall beside 3PO the moment he put his head around the door, and he drew back hastily. There were shouts in the room. I got him! No, you didn't. Well, I'll get him this time. Come on, 3PO, said Nichos resignedly. We've got sealed circuits. We might as well get this over with. Really, the things I've had to put up with, 3PO braced himself visibly and stepped back through the door. Bowls of beer and plates shy discus-wise clacked and bounced off the wall beside him as he made his way toward the food slots, Nichas in his wake. The Gamorreans weren't any better with tableware than they were with blaster carbines or handguns. One bowl caught the golden droid glancingly on the back and doused him with beer, but that was the extent of it. An argument immediately developed among the Gamorreans as to whether the hit counted. It turned violent, gakfeds hammering one another with plates, axes, and chairs, screaming and squealing, while Bullyaks sat back and smiled benevolently upon the scene in utter content. Part of the programming of a protocol droid was to understand not only the language, but the customs and biologies of the various sentient races of the galaxy. Though he understood that intense sexual competitiveness for the attention of the alpha female underlay all the outrageous violence of Gamorrean society though he realized that. Biologically and socially, the Gamorreans had no choice but to behave, think, and feel as they did the droid felt a momentary flash of sympathy for Dr. Mingla's irrational prejudices against individuals who behaved exactly as they were programmed to behave. 3PO bypassed the limiters on the food slots with a few simple commands the language was absurdly easy and asked for 20 gallons of scale 5 syrup. When the half-gallon containers started appearing behind the plexi shields, he drew them out and handed them to Nichas, who carried them back to the hall where Pothman waited with the sled. A large number of morts shaken off their hosts during the fight and evidently drawn to the sugary smell of the syrup scurried over to investigate. Get away from here! 3PO waved angrily. Filthy things. Shoo! Shoo! They sat up and regarded him with beady black eyes, tongues flicking in and out of the toothed lances of their probasi, but took no further notice of his gestures. The Gamorreans, now happily smashing one another over the head with tables, took no notice of him at all. When 3PO had borne the last of the containers out into the darkened hallway, he found Pothman and Nichas flattened. With the sled, against the wall to let an armed column of Aphitekans pass 188 of them, 3PO counted, 
and armed with brooms, fragments of dissected SPs, pieces of pipe, and blaster carbines gutted of their power cells, all held weapon-like over their shoulders. Right turn! Parade march? Their commander's voice snapped briskly as they vanished into the utter darkness of the hall. Really, said the protocol droid disapprovingly, as he set the last of the syrup canisters on the sled. Though I find laudable Master Luke's desire to remove all the passengers from this vessel before destroying it, I must admit to a certain amount of doubt about whether it can be achieved. A bowl of beer came flying through the mess hall doors and crashed sloppily into the wall. There has to be an alternative to blowing up the ship. Not one that's foolproof. Not one that's chance-proof. It doesn't need to be proof, said Luke desperately. Just enough to cripple the motivators, to disengage the guns. Whoever has summoned it, whoever has learned how to manipulate the force to this extent is going to come looking for it, Luke. And he or she is powerful. I can feel that. I know it. Luke knew it, too. The station has to be destroyed, Luke. As soon as it can be done. It takes two people, one of them a Jedi. The Jedi uses the force to interfere with the firing of the inclusion grid above the gun room ceiling long enough for the other person to climb. That's how Geeth and I were going to do it. I can tell you, or Cray whichever one of you is going to do the climbing which switches to pull, which cores to overload once you get to the top. Whoever stays at the bottom. There's a mission log jettison pod in the bay at the end of the corridor by the gun room. I didn't know about it when Geeth when Geeth and I. Her voice hesitated over the name of the lover who had abandoned her to die. Then she went on. Anyway, I've found it since. It can be fitted with an oxygen bottle and the person who stays at the bottom can make it to that tube, if they run. There was silence, shaped by her presence beside him. It has to be that way, Luke. You know it, and I know it. Not right away. Eventually, yes, when I've had time. There is no time. Luke shut his eyes. Everything she said was true. He knew it, and he knew she was aware of it. At last he could only say, Callista, I love you. Who had he said that to? Leia once, before he'd known. And he loved her still, and in pretty much the same way. This was something he'd never felt, he'd never known that he could feel. I don't want you to die. Her mouth on his, her arms around his body. The dream had been real, more real than some experiences of the flesh. There had to be a way. Luke, she said gently, I died thirty years ago. I'm just... I'm glad we had this time. I'm glad I stay too. To know you. There has to be a way, he insisted. Cray. Cray what? Luke turned sharply at the new voice. Cray leaned wearily in the door of the office, the silver blanket that half hid her torn and dirty uniform gleaming like armor, the marks of exhaustion and bitterness, and the death of hope gouged into her bruised face as if with knives. To turn her into what Nichos is? To cannibalize parts from the computers. Wire together enough memory to digitalize her, so you can have the metal illusion around to remind you what isn't yours and can't be yours. I can do that. If that's what you want. You said Jin Altus showed you taught you to transfer yourself, your consciousness, your... your reality to another object. You've done it with this ship, Callista. You're really here, I know you are. I am she said softly. There's enough circuitry, enough size, enough power in the central core. But a thing of metal, a thing programmed and digitalized, isn't human, and can't be human, Luke. Not the way I'm human now. 
Not the way you and I are human. Cray came over to them, her blonde hair catching fire glints in the greasy light. Not the way Nichos was human. I should never have done it, Luke. She went on. Never have. Tried to go up against what had to be. My motto was always, If it doesn't work, get a bigger hammer. Or a smaller chip. Nichos. She shook her head. He doesn't remember dying, Luke. He doesn't remember a switchover of any kind. And as much as I love. Nichos. As much as he loves me. I keep coming back to that. It isn't Nichos. He isn't human. He tries to be, and he wants to be, but flesh and bone have a logic of their own, Luke, and machinery just doesn't think the same way. Her mouth twisted, her dark eyes chill and bitter as the vacuum of space. If you want me to I'll make you something that'll hold a digitalized version of her memories, her consciousness. But it won't be the consciousness that's alive on this vessel. And you'll know it, and I'll know it. And that digitalized version will know it, too. No, said Callista, and Luke, through a blind haze of grief, still noticed that Cray and he both looked at the same place, as if Callista were there. And she was, indeed, all but there. She went on. Thank you, Cray. And don't think I'm not tempted. I love you, Luke, and I want... I want not to have to leave you, even if it means being what I am now forever or being what Nichos is now forever. But we don't have the choice. We don't have time. And any components, any computers you take from this ship, Cray, will have the will in them as well. And if you disconnected the weapons, if you disafford the motivators, if you pulled the cores, to leave the eye floating in the darkness of space until you could find some way to build another computer, or droid, unconnected to the will. I think the will would lie to you about being disaffore. I think it would wait until your back was turned, and seek out whoever it was that called it. It has to be destroyed, Luke. It has to be destroyed now, while we can. No, he was screaming inside. No. She'd said that she loved him. He knew she was right. Cray went on tiredly. I'll be the one who goes up the shaft, Luke. Your command of the force is world stronger than mine, she added as Luke started to protest. But I don't think you can levitate that far, and I can't hold it off you long enough for you to make the climb with a bad leg. If we're going to blow off all three of our lives, we can't risk you losing strength halfway. Luke nodded. With the little rest he'd been able to get, he felt stronger, but it took everything he could summon of the force to keep the pain in his leg from utterly swamping his mind. He would probably, he thought, be able to misfire the grid, but in spite of what Yoda had taught him, levitation took a lot of energy. We can program the lander to take off with the sand people in it. She went on. If you insist on getting them off the ship. If it's at all possible. Said Luke. I think it will be once 3PON. And Nichas. He hesitated to speak her lover's name to her. But though her eyes moved from his she didn't flinch. Get back here with the syrup. It can be picked up and towed back to Tatooine. Triv and Nichas can each pilot a shuttle. Once they're out of the ship's jamming field they can transmit distress signals, though somebody's going to have their work cut out for them deprogramming the Gamorreans. Not to mention convincing the Aphitekans they aren't stormtroopers. They're multiplying too, you know. I know. Luke sighed. How you're going to get the Kittenax on the shuttles? I think I've got that figured out too, he said. It was in his mind that even as he couldn't drag his staff up the shaft with him even as he wouldn't be able to move quickly enough among the stations at the computer core he probably wouldn't be able to make it down the long corridor to the jettison pod before the engines blew. But that, he understood, 
was a technicality. Callista. He didn't know what he would have said. Tried to talk her, one more time, into letting Cray try to make some kind of computerized vessel for her mind and memories, her thought and heart. Tried to talk her into escaping. But the bench on which he was sitting gave a sudden, jarring lurch, almost throwing him to the floor, and the cold sickness of gravity flux drew at his belly, dizzying. Another lurch and he caught at one of the lamp bowls as Cray grabbed the other halfway to the floor. Far off they felt the humming vibration rising within the ship's bones, the drag of power shifting. Callista said quietly, That's it! Hyperspace Chapter 21 Even before he and Chewie got up the steps of the lightless house, Han had a bad feeling about things. I'm terribly sorry. General Solo. The Bith in charge of the Muni Center Records Office and of the Sales. Invoice. And Workers Benefits Archives of the three major corporations that actually own Plow's central computer tilted its domed, putty-colored head in the dim shiver of the hollow field and regarded with huge black oil slick eyes the point before it where Han's holophone image would be. Her Excellency does not appear to be in the building. Han glanced out the long windows, to the black fog pierced only by the reveled blurs of the orchard lights. Chewbacca, standing beside the glass, turned his head with a sound between a growl and a moan. Can you tell me when she left? It was even possible, thought Han, that she might have stopped at the bubbling mud which did serve pretty decent meat pies for dinner, though that was something she liked company for. My apologies, said the Bith politely. Her Excellency does not appear to have been in the building all day. What? There is no record of her access card in any of the file banks, nor has. Get me Javax. The Bith inclined its head. I will endeavor to do so, sir. Will you remain at your current location? Yeah, just find him and get him. Ah, uh, thank you, added Han belatedly remembering Leia's repeated admonitions. I appreciate it. I knew it, Chewie, he added as the slight image faded. I knew she shouldn't have gone out with R2. The Wookiee made a questioning noise and flipped in his paw the restraining bolt they'd found on the table. Of course she pulled it off him, said Han. She wouldn't think any harm of that little can of bolts if he... Well, he did try to murder her, damn it. He surged to his feet, paced like a caged indoor and Vethoraptor to the table where the bolt had lain beside Chewie's open toolkit. The Wookiee growled again. I know she stands by her friends. But she... The hollow phone blipped again, and Han leaped at the pickup switch as if it were the cancel toggle on a planet-wide self-destruct cycle. But instead of the green local light, the blue star of the subspace receiver flickered on. A moment later Mara Jade's slim, leather-clad form appeared in the booth. Got your coordinates for you. She held up a yellow plastine wafer. What's your receiving speed? Why didn't you tell us you were after Nublik the Slight? Demanded Han roughly. Because I don't lie to my friends, replied Mara sharply. And if that's all you've got to say. I'm sorry. Han looked away, angry with himself. But I heard. What's the matter, Solo? She took another look at his face and all the sarcasm sponged away like yesterday's makeup. Leia's disappeared. She went up to the Muni Center this afternoon and I just found out she never made it there. She's with Arturita. He went haywire last night and tried to kill us. We had him in a restraining bolt, but it looks like Leia pulled it off him and took him with her. Mara made an extremely unladylike comment and Lando Calrissian appeared behind her shoulder, waxed and combed and dressed in his best purple satin for an evening out. What is it? Han told him, adding, We're waiting on Javax now. 
She talked about visiting the city repair center, so maybe she took Arto with her to get him checked. But it's after dark already and there's been too many weird things going on lately. Why'd you ask about Nublik? Asked Mara. Who told you I was after him? I spent all of about 12 hours on that ball of ice and I don't think I could finger Nublik in a lineup if he picked my pocket. He told his toady the Emperor's hand was after him, said Solo. The Emperor's hand was on the planet and he had to get out of there before she found him. Nublik disappeared about seven years ago after you'd said you'd been and gone. I figured you'd come back. He fell silent, just from the change in her eyes. For a moment she said nothing, but even through the medium of the subspace hollow, her rage was tangible, like the shock wave of a thermonuclear blast. When she spoke her tone was deceptively normal, and very calm. That reptile, she said. Her eyes stared out unseeingly, filled with a sudden, vicious, killing hate. That son of a slime crawler. What? Lando stepped quickly back, almost out of range of the hollow. What? He told me I was the only one, said Mara, still in that calm, almost conversational voice. The only hand of the Emperor. His weapon of choice, he said, when he needed a scalpel rather than a sword. His trusted servant. The set of her red-lipped mouth was hard, the settled rage of one whose position had been not only her pride, but her entire life. That lying, drooling, scum-swallowing, superannuated, underhanded, festering, filth-sucking parasite. He had another hand. Her voice sank to a deadly whisper. He had another hand all along. She had not moved from her seat, but the fury that radiated from her was like the pressure drop before a storm. Though it was directed against a dead man and made Solo very glad he was several hundred parsecs away in another star system entirely. He lied to me. He used me. His trusted servant. Everything he told me was a lie. Everything. Mara, said Lando uneasily. Mara, he's dead. You know what that means, don't you? She turned cold-eyed upon Lando, who backed a step. Neither man had ever seen Mara this angry, and the sheer intensity of it was terrifying. It means he had her in reserve to use against me. Or to use me against her. Or who knows who else to keep either of us from being anything more than the pawns of his lies. She was almost trembling with rage, the rage that had once led her to direct all her energies toward killing Luke Skywalker for taking from her the position that had been her life. Is she still on the planet? I don't know. I? For some reason he remembered Leia telling him of the Emperor's concubine, a member of the Emperor's court a woman who claimed to be working in a place where she wasn't working. A woman who'd shown up suddenly, bare weeks after Nublik's disappearance, knowing exactly what house it was she wanted to rent. Yeah, he said. I think so. Woman named Roganda. Mara's eyes widened as she recognized the name, then narrowed to green and glittering slits. Oh, she said softly. Her. The hollow image reached out to where the transceiver switches would be, beyond the range of the transmitters. The image vanished. We simply cannot take the risk. Roganda Ismarin opened the plastine case she carried, took from it the slim silver wand of a drug infuser, and fitted an ampoule into its slot. Hold her. Orin Kelder stepped warily toward Leia who had risen from her chair at the sound of the door lock switching over. She backed to the wall, but Lord Garanin stood in the doorway, stunt pistol in hand. Kelda hesitated though small, Leia was fit, wiry, thirty years younger than he, and quite clearly ready to fight and Garanin said, If it's risk you're worried about, madam, I'd say using that drug on her is more risk than I like to see. You don't know what it is. I know that it works retorted the concubine. 
I know it will keep her quiet while our guests are here. We know that it works sometimes. On some people. In some doses. It's been in those deserted laboratories in the crypts for 30 years at least, maybe twice that. We don't know whether it's deteriorated with time, whether it's become contaminated. That smuggler we used it on four or five years ago died. He had a weak heart, said Roganda too quickly. Oh, Lord Garanin, she went on, her soft voice pleading. You know how much depends upon those who will be here tonight. You know how desperately we need backing if your cause our cause is to succeed. You know Her Highness's reputation. We cannot risk even the chance of her somehow escaping and interfering with the reception of our guests. The Senex Lord's flat, cold eyes rested on Leia. The muzzle of his stunt pistol was unwavering. Then he nodded. Kelda stepped forward. He was expecting Leia to duck away, so she sprang into his advance, hooked his ankle, and shoulder blocked him hard and as he fell doubled and darted for the door. She thought the movement would take Garanin at least a little by surprise, enough for his first shot to go wild, to give her a chance to get past him, but it didn't. The stun blast hit her like a blow to the solar plexus, winding her at the same moment that her whole body felt as if it had been pulled inside out. Even on mildest stun the effect was awful perhaps worse than a heavier blast, because she didn't even lose consciousness. She just collapsed to the floor, her legs twitching with pins and needles, and Kelder and Roganda knelt by her side. Stupid, remarked Kelder as the infuser was pressed to the side of Leia's neck. A blast of cold. She felt her lungs stop. She was submerged, she thought, in an ocean of green glass a thousand kilometers deep. Because glass is a liquid it filled her lungs, her veins, her organs, it permeated the tissues of her cells. Though she was sinking, very slowly, the glass was shot through with light from above, and she could hear the voices of Roganda, Kelder, and Garanin as they left the room. His antidote as soon as the reception is over. Roganda was saying, We simply haven't the personnel to keep her under constant guard. But the drug's effects aren't as unpredictable as you fear. Everything will be perfectly all right. Your cause. Our cause. Kelder. Elegen. Irek. She had to get out. The force, thought Leia. Somehow, with her body suspended in this dense, unbreathing, light-filled silence, she could feel the force all around her, sense it within reach of her fingertips, hear it like music, a tune that she herself could easily learn. If she touched the force if she drew the light of the force into herself she could see the room in which she lay on Nastra Magritte's bed, one hand resting on her midriff and dark auburn hair tangled around her on the discolored pillow. Cray's right, she thought. I really do have to be more diligent about applying that Slitherberry wrinkle cream around my eyes. I wonder if I can get up. She breathed experimentally, drawing the force into her like a kind of strange, prickly light, and stood up. Her body remained on the bed. Panic seized her, disorienting. She called to mind some of the disciplines Luke had taught her, calming, steadying and looked around her at the room. Everything seemed very different, seen without physical eyes. Other times, other eras were present, as if she viewed through pain after pain of projection glass. An elderly man with graying hair sat writing on the back of green flimsiplast notes at the table, and broke off to lay his head on his arms and weep. A slim blonde Jedi knight lay in the bed which had been on the other side of the room then reading stories to her husband, who was curled up next to her with his dark head pillowed on her thigh. Leia looked at the door, and knew she could walk through it. I'll get lost. Cold panic again, the sense of being naked, unprotected. No, she thought. She stepped back to the bed, touched the body that lay there. Her own body. 
The scent of her own flesh, the sound of her own heartbeat, was unmistakable. If she concentrated, she could find her way back to it, even as she'd followed the far fainter and less familiar traces of Elegin and Kelder in the tunnels. Terror in her heart, she stepped through the door. Immediately, she was conscious of voices. This part of the passageways had been the living quarters of the Jedi, converted from Plet's endless greenhouse caverns, the dreamy consciousness of the plants and the weary, bittersweet benevolence of the old Hoden master permeated the rock of the walls. She followed the voices to a long chamber illuminated not only by a ceiling full of softly radiant glow panels, but by half a dozen windows of various sizes, thickly glazed against past storms and, like those of her own chamber, concealed in the rock and vine curtains of the valley wall. She recognized a good two-thirds of the people present. Some of them had aged in the eleven years since she'd seen them at the Emperor's court. Others like the representatives of the Mikuan Corporation and the president of the board of directors of Sena were of more recent acquaintance. Lady Dalla Vandran Acknowledged superior among the Senex lords by virtue of heading the oldest and noblest of the ancient houses. Had visited the Senate quite recently, to answer charges of inhumanity and planet stripping brought against her by the High Court, she'd seemed surprised that anyone had considered it his business if she let slavers run breeding farms on her homeworld of Carfedian. Your Highness, they're only Asin and Bilanaka she'd said, naming those two sentient but low-cultured races as if that placed the matter beyond need of further explanation. A heavy-set, stately woman in her forties with a blandly superior stubbornness in her blue eyes, she was further expressing her views on the matter to a small group comprised of Roganda, Irek, and Garanan. It's simply useless to discuss these matters with people in the Senate who refuse to understand local economic conditions. A little R-10 unit rolled up to the group with a tray of glasses, and Roganda said, You must sample the wine, your highness. Selenon semi-dry, an exquisite vintage. Ah. Vandran tasted a minute quantity. Very nice. Leia heard in her mind and rouge. Only spaceport types go in for the semi-dries, my dear. You really must cultivate a more refined taste. Every word of it was compacted into the slight lowering of the painted eyelids and the fractional deepening of the lines around Lady Vandran's mouth. An Algarine, perhaps? inquired Garanin. Algarine wines had been her father's favorite vintage, Leia recalled. Of course. Roganda addressed the R10. Decant the Algarine from the cellars, chilled to fifty degrees and the glass to forty. The cellar droid rolled quickly away. It isn't as if we were kidnapping people from their homes, Lady Vandran went on indignantly. These creatures are specifically bred for agricultural work. If it weren't for our farming they wouldn't be born at all, you know. And Carfedian is in the midst of severe economic depression. Not that they care, on Coruscant. Lord Garanin set his own glass down on the sideboard of marble and bronze, a travian of the best period, one of the few pieces of furniture in the long, stone-floored room. Which is why, your highness, said Roganda in her low, sweet voice, we must deal with both the warlords and the senate from a position of strength, rather than one of the hat-in-hand subservience they seem to expect. We will be a power to reckon with. She laid her hand on her son's shoulder, her red lips curving in a proud smile, and Irek modestly cast down his eyes. Close to the buffet, which was laden with a collection of confections and savories clearly put together by a droid of some kind, a bio-assisted Celestin executive asked Drosteligen. Doesn't look much like the Emperor, does he? In the softest of undervoices. The Celestin glanced across the room at Irek and his mother, both conservatively clad, he in black, she in white. Irek had gone to speak to one of the Juvex lords whom Leia recognized dimly as the head of the more militant branch of the House Srethan. It was clear the boy had a great deal of charm. Elegin shrugged. What does it matter? If he can do what she says he can do, 
He nodded in Roganda's direction. She was still working hard on getting Lady Vandran to unbend. Leia could have told her she might as well have tried to stuff a full-grown hut into her pocket. Ladies of the great houses do not unbend to women who have been concubines, no matter whose, and no matter what their sons can do. Well, said the Celestin doubtfully, and adjusted the gain on the eyepieces he wore. If the great houses back him. Elegin made a gesture with his eyebrows, dismissing or almost dismissing the dark-haired boy. At least his manners are good, he said. Don't worry, Nathal. When the ship arrives, we'll have the nucleus of a true fleet, more powerful than anything those scattered jarheads can command these days. And indeed, he added with a malicious grin, once the various warlords have had it demonstrated to them exactly what Irek can do, I think they'll be most eager to ally themselves with us and listen to what we have to say. Ship? Thought Leia uneasily. The Celestin turned toward the buffet again and paused, the enhanced visual receptors he wore probably to compensate for the corneal defects many Celestins developed after the age of thirty turned in Leia's direction. She wasn't sure what he saw how, or if, the psychic residue of the drug made her register on the pickup but with a little shrug he went on toward the food. But it was enough to make her move off, drifting like a ghost among the other. Fainter ghosts that flickered in this room, dim echoes of children playing obliviously on the floor between the cool aristocrats and the watchful bureaucrats, secretaries, and corporate scouts. Irek, Leia noticed, was working the room with the adeptness of a candidate for the Senate, deferring politely to the lords and ladies of the great houses, condescending with just unnoticeable noblesse obliged to the corporates and to the secretaries of the lords. As Drost Elegin had remarked, he had beautiful manners. Since formal dueling was one of the accomplishments valued by the lords among their own class, the boy was able to discuss this with the younger aristocrats. We've heard all about this ship, said Lord Vensel Picutorian, who had been one of those presented at the same time as Leia's senatorial debut. What is it? Where is it coming from? Are you sure it's large enough to give us the power, the armament, to create our own allied fleet? Irek inclined his head respectfully, and the other Senex lords gathered around. It is, quite simply, the largest and most heavily armored battle moon still in existence from the heyday of the Imperial fleet, he said in his clear, carrying boy's voice. It was the prototype transition between the torpedo platforms and the original Death Star. It doesn't have the focus power of the destructor beams, he added, and Leia detected a note of apology in his voice, but it has almost the power capacity of the Death Star. I think we're all agreed, put in Lord Garanin. That planet killer technology is wasteful, to put it mildly. But you must admit, said Irek, a gleeful glitter far back in his blue eyes, it makes a wonderful deterrent. In fact, it doesn't said his lordship bluntly. As events leading to the breakup of the empire can attest. And when Irek opened his mouth to protest, he went on. But be that as it may, he turned to the other lords. The Battle Moon Eye of Palpatine was originally constructed for a mission thirty years ago, he said. It was built and armed in absolute secrecy, so that when the mission itself was aborted unfulfilled, Almost no one knew of the Battle Moon itself, and all record of its hiding place in an asteroid field in the Moonflower Nebula. Lost. Careless of them, commented a younger lady, whose tan muscles spoke of a lifetime in the hunting field. Several laughed. Garanin looked annoyed, but Roganda said smoothly, Anyone who's dealt with a really large ancestral library will know that one small defect in the computer can result in the disappearance of, for instance, an entire set of wafers, or a good-sized book. And the size ratio between one book and, say, four or five rooms is much smaller than between even the largest battle moon and twenty parsecs of the outer rim. She would know, thought Leia, remembering Nastra Magritte's despairing words. A battle moon. 
And it's on its way here? Asked Lord Picutorian. Irex smiled, smug. On its way here, he said. And at our service, Roganda put her hand on his shoulder and smiled again, that proud smile. Our guests are thirsty, my son, she said in her soft voice. Would you go see what's become of that R10? A nice personal touch, thought Leia, observing the approval on the faces of Lady Vandran and Lord Picutorian. Irex suppressed a wicked grin and said, Certainly, mother. There was a soft murmur at the back of the group about how well brought up and malleable he was as the slender boy strode from the room. Leia followed, uncertain but not quite liking the look in his eyes. The R-10 unit was trundling up the corridor, small and square, about a meter tall and rimmed around its flat top with a decorative brass railing. The top itself was black marble electronically charged to grip drinks. Glasses, and anything else set on it, Leia had watched almost without consciously noticing the slight rotation with which everyone in the room took up his or her glass from it she barely noticed herself when she did it back home. It was second nature to anyone with a modern R10. It bore on its surface now the appointed bottle a 12-year-old algerine dry, suitably dusty and a frosted glass, solitary tribute to the importance of Lady Vandrin, as Roganda intended. Irek folded his arms and stood in the middle of the corridor with that same evil grin. Stop, he said. The R10 word to a halt. Pick up the glass. It extruded one of its long, multi-jointed arms with their slightly sticky velvet pads and obligingly picked up the chilled wine glass. Throw it on the floor. The droid froze in emotion. Breaking glasses breaking any sort of dish or utensil. Part of the black box code hardwired into any household droid. Irex's grin widened and he fastened his gaze on the R-10. Leia felt the shiver of the force in the air, reaching into, digging at, the droid's programming, forcing its synapse by synapse to rearrange its actions in spite of multilayered restraints against it. The droid reacted with great distress. It backed, Rock turned in a circle. Come on, said Irex softly. Throw it on the floor. While his mind, as Roganda had instructed no doubt as Magrity had taught him formed the sub-electronic commands necessary for the implementation of the act. Jerkily, with a flailing movement, the droid hurled the glass down. Then it immediately extruded a brush-tipped arm from its base and a vacuum hose to clean up the broken glass. Not yet. The implement stopped. Now take the bottle and pour it out. The droid rocked with wretchedness, fighting the most absolute of its programming not to ever, ever, ever spill anything. Irek was clearly reveling in its confusion. His blue eyes did not waver bending his concentration on the force, channeling it through the implanted chip in its mind. Then his head turned, suddenly, and Leia felt his concentration leave the droid as if the boy had simply dropped a toy he'd been playing with. The droid replaced the wine bottle on its top and bolted for the party as fast as its wheels would carry it, but Irek did not even notice. He was turning his head slowly, scanning the corridor. listening. Sniffing. You're here, he said softly. You're here somewhere. I can feel you. She felt him gather the strength of the force around him, like a terrible shadow, saw him with changed eyes, like a wraith of mist and coals. I'll find you. Leia turned and fled. Behind her she was aware of him striding two paces to one of the small red wall buttons that were mounted at intervals on the dark stone of the corridor walls, heard him slap it, and then heard the stride of heavy boots and Garanin's voice. What is it, my lord? Get my mother! And fetch the smallest steel ball from the toy room to the princess's prison. Leia bolted down the corridors, twisting, weaving through the maze. She felt Irex's mind invading them, searching for her, 
reaching like vast wings of smoke to fill the ill-lit passageways with shadows she knew could not be real but which terrified her anyway. It was hard to sense in which direction her body lay, hard to hear the distant heartbeat she followed. She skidded to a stop in horror as the floating black ball of the interrogator droid drifted out from around a corner, lights flashing, flickering. Not real, not real, but even knowing this she turned aside. Down another corridor the huge, heavy, stinking shape of a hut reached for her with a quivering prehensile tongue, copper eyes dilating and contracting with ugly lusts. She turned aside from it, sobbing, trying to find some way around, and in her mind she heard Irex's voice whispering, Irex's shrill boy's laugh. I'll trap you. I'll find you and trap you. You'll never get out. The drug, she thought. The drug they'd given her must have left a psychic residue he could track. She couldn't let him catch her. Couldn't let him overtake her. Blocks and slabs of darkness loomed in front of her, walls of stench overpowering her ability to track where she should go. The smell of cretch, of roses, of filth. Great, howling waves of power jerked and dragged at her, pulling her back, washing her sideways. In the back of her consciousness she was aware of Irek running lightly, skipping and hopping down the corridors with the sheer delight of trying to find her, trying to track her, trying to block her from the room where her body lay. Luke, she thought desperately, Luke, help me. And like a mocking playground echo, Irek mimicked jeeringly, Oh, Lukey, help me. There. That corridor there. She knew it, recognized it, flung herself around the corner. And he was standing in front of the door. The towering black shape, the glister of pallid light on the black helmet, the evil gleam of lights within the shadows of his great cloak, and the thick, indrawn breath. Vader. Vader was standing before the door. She swung around in terror. Irek stood in the passageway behind her, the dark radiance that surrounded him seeming to pulse with lightning. In his hand he held one of the steel balls that had so puzzled her in the toy room, but now, with her disembodied consciousness, she saw that there were entrances to it, entrances invisible to eyes limited by the electromagnetic spectrum. Entrances that did not serve as exits. And within the ball itself, maze after maze of concentric, ever tinier labyrinth balls, he smiled. You're here. I can tell you're here. Leia turned. Vader still stood before the door. She could not pass him. She could not. Mother can't stop me, said Irek. She won't even know. He held up the ball, and his mind seemed to reach out into the corridor like a vast net drawing at her. Leia felt herself dissolving like a smoke wraith, an unskilled illusion, drawn as if by a vacuum toward the steel ball, dissipating into the power of the dark side. There had to be a way to use the force to protect herself, she thought. To get past the dark terror that stood before the door. But she didn't know what it was. The boy puckered his lips and inhaled, pulling her in with his breath. I wreck! Roganda appeared in the corridor behind her son, her white dress gathered up in her hand as if she'd been running. Irek, come at once! He swung around, his concentration broken. The shadow of Vader vanished. Leia flung herself at the door, through the door, hurled herself to the sleeping form on the bed. With human perceptions once again she barely heard the voices through the door, but she recognized, nevertheless, or in Kelda's voice. Lord Irek, we've picked it up on the scanners. It's here. The Eye of Palpatine. Chapter 22 Master Luke, are you quite certain this is going to work? You got me. The logistics of managing a staff and the rope with which Luke was towing the small pump salvaged from a laundry room were not the best in the world. But at this point Luke was simply delighted to have located a pump that still worked. 
very little on the eye of Palpatine still worked. Except the guns, he thought. Except the guns. How much time will it give us? Inquired Nichas, striding silently along under his load of two oil drums filled with sugar water. Provided it works at all. Maybe an hour clear. The lights on his staff were failing, too, and the service corridor, with its low ceilings and bundles of conduit lines, was beginning to take on the appearance, dampness, and smell of some cavern far below ground level. Here and there water dripped down the walls. Luke examined the places and nodded with satisfaction. They were certainly on the line of the main water trunk for this section of the ship. That isn't much to check the lander and the two shuttles, remarked Triv Pothman. Luke shook his head. Every step was like having pieces of bone ripped out of his thigh. It'll have to do. The last of the Paragon was long gone. The force alone kept him from going into shock, kept the fever of internal infection at bay. Cray. Walking behind them with a five-gallon bucket of sugar water in each hand. Said nothing. Had said nothing while Luke outlined his plans for getting the ship cleared, and very little more during the process of cutting into the main sensors for a reading of their position and an estimate of how much time before the shelling of Belsavis would begin. Only when Callista said, That's too much time. At the display of twelve hours, thirty minutes, had Cray spoken. It's what the file says. It's what the will says the file says. Don't you see? Callista had gone on. The will's going to do whatever it can, use whatever it can, to delay us and fulfill its mission. Mission control would never have left a delay of twelve and a half hours after coming out of hyperspace. Not with Jedi on the planet. Not with the fleet of ally wings they have. Had. She's right, Luke had said, glancing over at Cray. He'd expected an argument, since Cray had never believed that computers could or would lie. But since leaving the security of her laboratory, Cray had been through trial by the will, and her only reaction was a slight, bitter tightening of her lips. She had watched in silence when Luke and the others had mixed the syrup with water to produce a thick, hypersweet mixture, had taken her share of it when the anti-grav sled had proven too large to enter the service corridor vent. She moved as if every step, every intake of breath, was a chore she had to get through, and she would not, Luke saw, meet Nichasa's eyes. Thank the Maker, exulted 3PO, as they turned a corner and dim work lights gleamed along the ceiling overhead. I was beginning to fear this quadrant of the ship around the shuttle bays was without power as well. Jawari probably too scared of the sand people to get close enough to raid it. Luke turned down a side corridor, following the main conduit. Yet, remarked Callista, her voice coming from beside him, as if she walked close by. I like a cheery girl. She sang two lines of an old nursery song. Let's everybody be happy, let's everybody be happy. And Luke, in spite of the agony in his leg, laughed. It must be driving them crazy, Callista went on after a moment. The sand people. If they're as... As rigidly bound to tradition as you describe, they must hate the fact that everything is different here, with no day and no night, and only walls and corridors to hunt in. As time goes by I'm less and less thrilled about it myself. The door to the main pump room was locked. 3PO convinced the lock program that a key had been inserted and the door whooshed open. Break the mechanism, Nichas, said Luke quietly. You're right, Callista. I don't trust the will any farther than I can throw this ship, uphill and against the wind. Funny, said Pothman, looking around him at the oily black root system of pipes and vents, as Luke hooked the small portable pump into the main mechanism. I never thought about it while I was a trooper. But now, looking back, I think I never could get used to living in corridors and rooms and ships and installations. I mean, it seemed normal at the time. 
Only after I was living in the forest on Zab I realized how much I loved it, how much I'd missed the woods and the trees of Shandrila. You miss the oceans, Miss Callista? Cray, standing in the doorway, only leaned her forehead against the jam and said nothing, watching while Luke hooked the makeshift power cables into the main outlets, pressed the switch. The dry, whirring rasp of the motor fired up, small and shrill against the deeper, calmer throb of the main pump that half filled the room before them. Luke breathed a sigh of gratitude and unshipped the small pump's hose. Here goes. He plunged the hose into the first of the sugar water drums, watching the connection between the small pump surge and stiffen with the pressure of the stuff, then, a moment later, the line between the small pump and the large. Callista called up, softly, to the oblivious sand people inhabiting the regions above the pump room. Here's looking at you, kids. They pumped, and all, close to twenty gallons of concentrated sugar water into the sand people's water supply. Leave it, said Luke, as Nichos turned back from the door to fetch the portable pump or tidy the buckets. We're not coming back. Ah, said Nichos, remembering that everything was going to be ion vapor this time tomorrow, and shook his head deprecatingly. Perhaps a touch too much tidiness programmed in. The next moment he glanced sidelong at Cray realizing that the jest might have been construed as a criticism or simply as a reminder that he was, in fact, a collection of programs but she managed a smile, and for the first time met his eyes. I knew I shouldn't have cribbed that part out of one of those SP-80 wall washers. They stood looking at each other for a moment, startled and not quite certain how to deal with her admission of having programmed him, of his being a droid. Then she reached out and touched his hand. Think they'll mind if we crash their party? Whispered Callista when they reached the top of the gangway. The noise from the shuttle hangar the sand people had taken for their headquarters was tremendous. Groaning, grunting, howling, whoops and clatters as machinery or weapons gaff sticks. Rifles? Were hurled here and there. Every now and then they'd all begin to yell together hair-raising ululations that rose and fell in volume and pitch and then died away into raucous shrieks and crashes. Let's sit this one out. Luke leaned back against the wall, aware that he was trembling and that sweat rolled down the sides of his face, glittering in the chill of the corridor lights. He wanted to sit down, but knew that if he did he'd probably never get up. He was burningly aware of Callista beside him, close by him as if she were merely invisible and would become visible again later. He pushed the thought away. Triv hunkered down, listening but coiled to spring up again, his blaster in his hand. Three P.O. stood a meter or so away down the corridor to their backs, auditory sensors turned up to highest gain. Awkwardly, Cray and Nicha stood together, as if not certain what to say. Cray asked, Will you be okay, Luke? And Luke nodded. This shouldn't take too long. A bunch of deep water sighing herders have these boys under the table before they'd even warmed up their elbows, commented Callista. More whoops. Maybe that's why they killed that storekeeper. The riot subsided. A few broken grunts and shouts, then silence. Someone yelled his opinion about something to his by now oblivious fellow tribesmen, and then there was a clatter, as if of a dropped metal drinking vessel. Right, said Luke. Let's go. We don't have much time. 3PO, get the talls. Certainly, Master Luke. The droid creaked off briskly into the darkness. The shuttle hangar was carpeted in somnolent sand people. Sugar water was spilled everywhere, soaking into the dirt-colored robes and head wrappings, and several bore dark, harsh-smelling stains on their robes, as if of ichor or blood. A small, 
Square's service hatch on one wall was scratched and dented as if hacked at by maniacs' gaff sticks and spears strewn like jack straws all around it amply indicated that someone had thought it a useful target to demonstrate everyone's skill. The wall around the square hatch bore considerably more damage than the hatch itself. Swell party, commented Luke, and scrambled painfully up the ramp into the first of the shuttlecraft, while Triv and Nichos prudently collected every weapon in sight. The gauges looked all right under Cray's expert cutting the onboard computer woke up without reference to its passwords and expressed itself ready for action. Doesn't seem to be hooked into the will at all, she commented. About time something went our way. I warn you, said Triv Poffman worriedly from the door. I was never trained to run one of these things. And those readouts of the surface you're getting aren't making me feel any better about learning. I'll slay this shuttle to the other so Nichos can control them both. Cray settled into the pilot's chair. Ran her hands through her hair with the old gesture of tucking aside stray tendrils and winced a little at the touch of the sawed-off bristle then called up the core program and began tapping instructions in. The gesture of tidying her hair filled Luke with an odd sense of relief, of gladness. Whatever she'd been through, its darkness in her was lightning. She was returning to herself. Nichos isn't a hotshot jet jockey like Luke, she went on. But he can take both and even through that mess if somebody on the ground can talk him down. A lot of the stabilization's pre-programmed for the planet, of course. And believe me, when the main ship blows, there'll be somebody out here to investigate. Great, said Luke. I need to talk to you about that. She didn't so much as spare him a glance. Later, she said. First, let's hear your plan for getting those Kittenax down here and into a shuttle in something under two weeks. Outside, there was a groaning clamor, a bellowing war cry. Luke and Cray, stumbling to the door of the lander, were just in time to see a Tuscan raider launch itself at Triv Pothman swinging its gaff stick in such a fashion as to present considerably more danger to itself than to the former stormtrooper. Nichos leaped over two intervening slumberers and caught the Tuscan's arm, pulling the weapon from its fumbling hand. Triv was saying, Hey, 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 my friend, just relax, okay? Have another little shot. The raider accepted the silver cup half full of sugar water from the trooper's hand, downed it in a gulp, and subsided once again to the floor. Master Luke! Three Pio appeared in the doorway of the hangar, followed by a half dozen fluffy white talls. Great! Luke scrambled down from the shuttlecraft, stumbling as his leg gave under him with a shocking blast of pain. Cray caught his arm, and three of the talls were immediately at his side, steadying him and crooning worriedly. Thank them, said Luke struggling to control his breath, to fight off the pain that threatened to blot his consciousness. Thank you, he added, speaking directly to the tall creatures, as 3PO produced a succession of hoons and hums. Tell them that without their help I could not possibly hope to save all those here who need to be saved. 3PO relayed Luke's message to the talls, who replied with snufflings, hoots, and heavy, patting hugs. Then without further ado the Talls began to pick up sand people and carry them out of the hold, heading for the lander on deck 10. You know that even with my reprogramming that lander won't do anything but head out a couple of kilometers and hang there, Cray said watching them go. It can't be steered. That'll do, said Luke. I'll leave instructions with Triv and 3PO that nobody's supposed to open the thing till it gets to Tatooine anyway. You really think anybody'll tow it to safety, once they know what's inside? She put one fist on her hip, turned to look at him sidelong, weary and bitter. I don't know, said Luke quietly. If I make it out, he hesitated. Or if you make it out, please see to it that someone does. Her face softened with the wisp of a smile. You never give up, she said. Do you, Luke? He shook his head. Funny, Cray said, 
as they walked up the ramp into the second shuttle. You'd think that since we appeared in the sector somebody be out from Belsavis to check on who we are anyway. But there's not a thing. I've never seen anything like it. Javax flicked through another series of screens, the two technicians in other lucky and a glum-looking Durosian leaning over his shoulders. None of the three looked up as Han and Chewbacca thrust their way through the door and into the port's central control. The Durosian shook his head. It has to be a malfunction somewhere in the slave relay to the bay gates themselves, he said. The program tests positive. All the gates couldn't malfunction mechanically at the same time. His earth-colored brow furrowed down over opalescent orange eyes, and he rubbed the hard beak of his mouth. What's going on? Javax looked up, seeing Solo and the Wookiee for the first time, and got to his feet. I hope you're not coming for takeoff clearance, he said in a tone of voice half jocular, half puzzled nobody in his right mind would take off into the nightly inferno of Belsavis's winds. Did Her Excellency find what she needed in the Muni Center records? I'm afraid I wasn't able to. Leia never got to the Muni Center at all, said Han. The Mluki's eyes widened with shock, then flickered to the chronometer on the wall. There's a woman living on Painted Door Street, in the house Nublet the Slight used to own Roganda Ismarin. Came here about seven years ago. Ah, uh, said Javax thoughtfully. Roganda Ismarin. Woman so high. He gestured to someone about Leia's small height. Black hair, dark eyes. I don't know. I've never seen her. She used to be one of the Emperor's concubines, so she's probably beautiful. The human males who come into port treat her as if she's beautiful, said Javax with a small smile. When she's seen, which is rarely. We're a small town, General Solo, and everyone ends up knowing a great deal about everyone else's business. And though it's none of my business, I admit I have always nursed a deep curiosity about Roganda Ismarin. You know where her house is? Javax nodded. At the chief person's suggestion, they stopped at a small apartment block to include in their party Stuschewski, a meter tall, dark furred charter fan who worked in the Vine Coffee Gardens as a sniffer. Some things you just can't explain to supervisors, sighed the little creature as he bid a quick goodbye to the group of convivial friends who'd gathered in his apartment for a wine and grooming party. He trotted down the outside stair at Javax's side, big, clawed hands making quick work of the complicated latches on the silk vest he was donning. The new girl keeps asking why the beans shouldn't be harvested yet. They're the right color, she says. Right color my left ear. As if called upon for corroborative evidence, his left ear twitched. They're more or less the right color outside, but they smell green inside. Well, she'll learn. What can I do for you, chief? Black fog shut them in, huge moths and glowbugs dancing around the blurred yellow wool of street lamps and windows. Overhead the lights on the hanging gardens twinkled dimly through the mists, like alien galaxies of flowering stars. Javax gave him a swift and bodlerized version of the problem, ending with, We have reason to believe the house itself is wired with alarms. Before we go and before we tip anyone off as to our presence we'd like to know whether anyone's home or not. Can you do that? Humans? The charter fan's huge ears cocked forward, and he glanced from Han to Chewie. Javax nodded. Stuschewski gave him the circle finger sign universal among those races with opposable thumbs, no problem. They turned to cross the market square all lights retreating into dim smudges in the hot, eerie dark. So what's this I hear about the landing silos being locked up? The chief person gestured helplessly. We think it's a malfunction in the programming of the central servo between the computer and the doors over the silos. It looks like it fired and locked at once, and ground the main gear to pieces. 
Chewie turned his head sharply, with a long, rumbling growl. We don't know, said Javax. That's what's driving the tech crew crazy. It shouldn't have happened. None of the cutouts operated. They're going to have to go in and pull the whole mechanism and open the gates manually which means I hope you like the food here, General Solo, because it'll be at least 24 hours. Wait a minute, said Solo, pausing at the foot of the steep slope of Painted Door Street. You're telling me that there's been another case of... of a fairly complicated freak malfunction? Like our astromech droid trying to murder us? That's two in twenty-four hours. Javax's snowy brow ridge folded upward in the middle as he considered the matter in that light. Then he said, Three. The calm system's down again. But that happens so often. There was momentary silence as they regarded each other in the heavy gloom. Then Solo said softly, I've got a bad feeling about this. In swift silence, they felt their way from pillar to pillar of the foundations of an old building, following the course of the street. It was a neighborhood of ancient houses, prefabs rising out of the bomb damage like white ships stranded on high rocks. Vines growing over the old lava blocks rustled wetly as the party passed along them, and somewhere a warm spring welling up from an old foundation bubbled in the dark. The higher altitude, on the bench beneath the citadel ruins, thinned the fog a little, and when they stopped at the turning at the top of the street, Solo could even see the house Javax pointed out. Han felt a cold snake of uneasiness corkscrew down his backbone. If Roganda Ismarin was the emperor's hand, it meant she was force strong. Not something he wanted to go up against. But if she'd hurt so much as a hair on Leia's head, he'd... That's hers. Javax looked down at Stuschewski. Anyone home? The Chatter fan closed his huge dark eyes, flared his four large nostrils, and stood, breathing and listening to the night. Solo couldn't see how the little creature could be sifting out the odors of a single house from all others, for the night was redolent of greenery, wet stone, the faintly sulfurous pong of the hot springs and the overpowering sweetness that hung in the air near the packing plants. But Stuschewski opened his eyes after a moment and said, Nobody home, chief. Chewie grumbled a little and checked the pockets of his utility belt for his wire bridging kit, preparatory to making an assault on whatever security system the house might have. I'll tell you this, though, said the chowder fan. Somebody in that place has been wearing awfully expensive perfume whisper or lake of dreams which I know for a fact nobody sells on this entire planet. With startling suddenness, the door at the top of the steps whooshed open. I thought you said there was nobody home. Hissed Han as the four of them flattened into the shadows of a shell-ravaged old colonnade. Nobody human, retorted the Chadra fan. I can smell. There was a faint whirring in the shadows of the vines that half-masked the doorway, and the movement of something pale. Then a small form appeared at the top of the steps and paused as if intensely weary, or considering what to do next. Battered, dented, covered with filth and slime, it was Artudita. Chapter 23 Commander, announced the stormtrooper with a sharp salute. Emergency orders have arrived from the Grand Moff of the entire Imperial Battle Fleet. Priority 1, Sir. The commander straightened up from grim concentration on the blacked-out control screen of a library reader and returned the salute with the three long and gaudily blossomed yellow pellicules on its right side. Several officers engaged in manning the gunnery and navigation consoles at the dead readers and vids along the library wall turned in their chairs. Stems, stamens, and clusters of flowers swiveled in the direction of their commander. They were all a little pale from lack of sunlight, but still very much on the alert. Luke, leaning in the doorway watching the scene being played out by the dim glow of his staff the Aphitekans had been engaged in their imaginary space battle and total darkness before his and Pothman's arrival wondered for the hundredth time exactly how sentient these beings were. 
The Clags and the Gakfeds had remained Gamorreans, albeit convinced most of the time that they were stormtroopers. They had been aware of the slow destruction of the Eye of Palpatine, though they had attributed it, under the instructions of the will, to the rebel saboteurs familiar to them from their programming. Ugbuz had remained Ugbuz, and though his aim continued to be truly dreadful he understood the difference between a charged blaster and an empty one. To the Afatekans, their programming seemed to be so thorough that what they were programmed to believe took precedence over the actual structure of the ship itself. If they had possessed any individual personalities before induction in the lander, those had been completely subsumed. And Luke noticed those Afatekans who had sprouted on board and he'd come across at least five nurseries, mostly in lesser mess rooms rigged with emergency lighting seemed to believe themselves to be imperial troopers with the same utter absorption as their seniors. Triv Pothman, resplendent in his white armor, stepped across to the dead control screen in front of the yellow and black captain. With your permission, sir. He touched a switch. Fleet Communications Urgent and Priority One It is the intent of the will that all ship's personnel evacuate to the shuttlecraft on Deck 16 immediately. All personnel currently in sick bays and other locations to be moved with necessary life support. The bearer of these orders will serve as director of the evacuation and pilot the shuttlecraft during and after launch. Not bad, approved Luke softly. Are you kidding? Returned Callista's voice in his ear. For thirty years the will is the only thing I've gotten when I try to break into the computer. You bet I know how to do an imitation. You should see me do Pecky Blue and the Starboys. Luke had never heard of Pecky Blue and the Starboys, but he would have crossed the Dune Sea on foot to hear her do an imitation of anybody. Is this... A trooper? The captain's voice was grave. Neither Pothman nor Luke knew precisely what it was, but the former trooper nodded. We have our orders, he said. The captain returned the nod, grave and manly despite the huge coronal fluff of white tassels. All right, men, he said. This is it. Pack it up. Move it out. In the Deck 12 portside section lounge, and the corridor adjacent, the Kittenaks were still talking. They're still exchanging recipes, most of them, explained 3PO, when Luke appeared. Although that group in the corridor has begun telling one another about last summer's run of Chuba slugs, an experience that all of them, apparently, shared. They're all here, said Callista. Forty-eight of them. A group of Afatekans passed them, marching in brisk military fashion, nearly seventy strong including a whole squad of seedlings less than a meter high. Right square turn! Barked the sharp voice of the lieutenant in charge, and they vanished around a corner. Luke shook his head. Somebody's gonna have a job deprogramming them. Her yelp of laughter rippled in the air. Yikes, I hadn't even thought of that. Okay. Corridors are clear between here and the shuttle bay. Gangways are open. That one elevator shaft they'll have to climb is roped. Can they climb an elevator shaft? Oh, yes. Luke took a deep breath. He was achingly conscious of the fact that every fragment of his strength that he expended on other matters meant that much less for the final effort, the final exertion. 3PO, you ready? I believe my grasp of the Kittenak language to be sufficient for the needs of the moment. Yeah, said Luke, but you better get out of that doorway. The droid stepped hastily aside. He knew what was coming. Okay said Luke. Here goes nothing dot. Closing his eyes, he concentrated on the heat sensors of the fire prevention system of the lounge and the corridors around it. It was the simplest of all Jedi powers directed against the most basic system in the ship and the result was utterly galvanic. The sprinkler system burst into gushing life. 
A rainstorm of water poured down over Luke, Freepio, and every squatty, mushroom-shaped, putty-colored kittenack in the section. Deck 16! cried Threepio in the kittenack tongue. Deck 16! The water is in the shuttlecraft. And he sprang back, dragging his master to safety as the thundering tide of kittenacks not only slammed through the door, but broke down the walls on either side of the entryway and went lumbering and slipping up the corridor in the direction of the shuttle decks. Luke cast his mind ahead, visualizing every carefully memorized foot of the corridors, gangway, elevator shaft between the port side section lounge and the deck 16 shuttle hangar, superheating the thin layer of air at the top of the hallways to fire the sprinklers along the way. Kittenax mate in water. Rain, to them, is the trigger for startling and enthusiastic speed. You think Cray and Nichos will be able to handle getting them in the shuttle? Should be no problem said Callista. I'll go along, but I don't think it's anything a well-bred person should see. I'll be back with you by the time we need to convince the Clags and the Gakfeds to go on board. I can't do it, thought Luke, watching the ghostly flicker in the whirling rain retreat along the corridor in the wake of the lubricated and lust-crazed mob. I can't. Not save her. He stood with the water coursing down his hair and face trying not to think about not ever speaking with her again. Master Luke? Threepio's voice was diffident. With an almost physical effort he shook himself free of that grief, the sense that there was nothing in him, body or soul, that did not consist entirely of blinding pain. First things first. Yeah, he said softly. Let's go get the Jawas and move the tripods out. Roganda and her son were forging an alliance with the Senex lords. Leia struggled, trying desperately to return to consciousness, but her mind felt as if she had been frozen in that jelly green ocean. She was aware of the room around her still dimly aware of the shadows of others who had occupied that room but could neither sink back into her original coma nor rise to wakefulness. And she had to wake up. She had to get out. They were creating a power base to give them position with the warlords Harsk and Teradoc and the other remaining branches of the Imperial fleet. And around that power base, the Imperial fleet might very well coalesce once more. And that coalition would be armed with the wealth of the Senex lords and the massive weaponry of the Eye of Palpatine, drawn from the darkness of the past by a fifteen-year-old boy whose powers could cripple the Republic's unprepared defenses. To gain the eye, and Irek, as secret weapons, a man like High Admiral Harsk might surrender power that he would not have given over to a child's regent a few years ago. She had to get out. Or get a message out, even if it cost her her life. Han Solo. Itha. Time of meeting. Once he'd stumbled onto some cache of Irek's Yarek hidden in the tunnels, once his mind had been cleared a little by the counterreaction of the drug, Drub had done everything in his power to warn his friend. To help the Republic that he knew was Han's new allegiance. He, too, knew they had to be warned. She wondered at what point they'd gotten rid of Nastra Magridi. Probably as soon as Irek was capable of controlling and directing his ability to influence mechanicals Magridi knew far too much to be allowed to live. Like his pupil, she thought. She remembered the report of Stinadrizing Shah's murder. Her room had been gone through, her papers destroyed. Magridi must have worked on the initial phases of the implanted brain chip with her, or talked to her about them. And hadn't there been some other physicist, some other student of Magridi's, who died under mysterious circumstances a few years ago? Leia didn't remember. That had been back before she'd met Cray. Magridi's other star pupil, Kui Sucks, had probably had her life saved when the renegade adept K.Y.P. Duran had wiped out her memory. And Oren Kelder had been Magridi's pupil as well. The door hissed open, and Leia felt the sharp blast of the warmer corridor air on her face. Though her eyes were closed she could see, 
Lord Garanin and Drost Elegin come inside, the stocky security chief carrying an infuser. The metal of the infuser was cold against her throat. She felt the rush of chemical, of warming wakefulness, stir her veins. The sensation of green glass around her vanished. So did the ghosts, and even the memories of the ghosts, of others in the room. Her head ached as if her brain had been stuffed with desiccant. Your Highness? Leia tried to reply and discovered that her tongue had turned into a three-kilo sack of sand. On. Her eyes were still shut, but she saw Garanin and Elegin exchange a look. Another one, said Elegin, and the security chief frowned. We don't want to harm her. Idiots. He loaded another ample into the infuser and put the metal to Leia's throat again. Her mind cleared with a snap, her heart pounding as if she'd been waked in panic by a loud noise. She flinched, sat up, aware that her hands were shaking. Your Highness? Garanin sketched a military bow and replaced the infuser in his pocket. Madame Roganda wishes your presence. He didn't sound happy about it though it was difficult to tell what emotions passed behind those wet stone eyes. Madame Roganda was a title of courtesy. Roganda was certainly not a person qualified to demand that the last princess of the house Organa come to her. Leia slowed her breathing, raised her eyebrows slightly, as if she had not expected that humiliating a slight, but with an air of gracious martyrdom rose, followed the men into the corridor. She had to call on all the physical training of the Jedi not to stumble, but managed to walk with what her aunts would have called queenly grace, like Palpatine. The men of the ancient houses preferred resigned obedience to defiance, and until she found some way in which to actively escape Leia guessed her best course would be to rack up all the points with these people she could. They were quite heavily armed, with stun guns as well as blasters. She still felt shaky, strange, and a little dizzy, though moving helped. Having no desire for a guaranteed three hours' worth of headaches and nausea, Leia decided to bide her time. Roganda, Irek, and Orin Kelder occupied a small chamber one level up, cold despite the heating unit placed discreetly in a corner. The walls were draped with black. Leia had the momentary impression of the sort of meditation chamber used by some Dathomir sects, which used silence, dimness, and a single-point source of firelight to concentrate the mind. A cluster of candles was grouped on the polished wooden table at which Irek and his mother sat. With such discretion as to constitute almost an apology, a quarto-sized terminal was set up on a bench just within the range of Irek's peripheral vision where Orin Kelder was keying rapidly through a series of calculations and what looked like sensor reports. There were four glass balls of the type Leia had seen in several places in the crypts, set on stands in the corners of the room so that Irek's chair was directly where lines drawn between them would cross. Irek raised his head, stared at her with arrogant, furious blue eyes. I've had enough trouble from you, he said, his juvenile voice cold, and Leia was aware of Lord Garanin's angry frown at the rudeness and lace majest. Now you will tell me. Why wouldn't your droid obey me in the crypts? What had you done to it? You're dismissed, said Roganda quickly, signing to Garanin and Elegin Leia saw the look that passed between them as they left. True. Roganda was in a hurry but as a child Leia had had it impressed upon her that no person of breeding was ever in such a hurry as to speak brusquely to a social superior. Inferiors, of course, and those whom circumstance had placed in the power of a lord were jolly well on their own. She turned to face Roganda, her eyes cold. What guarantees can you give me that I'll be returned to Coruscant safe and sound? You dare ask for guarantees? yelled Irek, slamming his fist on the table, and Roganda held up her hand. I can guarantee you that unless you tell us what you did to your droid that ain't a for it to escape my son's influence, she said with quiet viciousness.
You're going to be blasted out of existence in very short order, along with every living thing in Plowl. Because the Eye of Palpatine is not responding to my son's commands. Not responding? Said Leia startled. I thought your son commanded it to come here. I did, said Irex sullenly. Not. Exactly, corrected Kelda. The little man looked harried, his bald head shining with sweat in the glow of the console lights. We knew that part of the original activation signal relay to trigger the Eye of Palpatine had been destroyed somewhere in the vicinity of Belsavis. By tapping into the strength of the Force, Lord Irek was able to reactivate the relay and bring the Battle Moon here, where it will be close enough for him to control its onboard programming directly. He cleared his throat uneasily and avoided both Roganda's eyes and Leia's. The thing is, Princess, the Eye of Palpatine, a fully automated ship, one of the few designed with a completely automatic mission control in order to obviate security leaks. Originally programmed to destroy all life on the planet Belsavis. Shell out of existence anything that resembled a settlement. Because the Jedi were here, said Leia steadily. Keldus eyes avoided hers. The Emperor took whatever steps he felt necessary to reduce the risk of civil war. Whatever else can be said about them, the Jedi were potential insurgents who he felt could not be trusted with power. And he could be, I suppose? Leia looked across at Roganda. You were one of the children here, weren't you? She asked. It was your family they were attacking. We changed with the times, princess. Roganda folded her delicate hands, the topaz of her ring a sulfurous star in the candle's light. Away from her chief of staff, and the Senex lords whom she sought to impress, all semblance of that shy defenselessness was gone. In its place was a cool vituperative scorn, the power-loving contempt that lay against sprang from envy of those who had looked down on her, and desire to get her own back. If I'd followed the strictest traditions of my family I'd have been destroyed, as they and my older brother Lagan were destroyed. As it was, I adapted those traditions. You followed the dark side, you mean? That stung her. The wing-like brows lifted. What is the dark side, princess? There was a good deal of Irek in her chilly voice. Here was another one, thought Leia, who could not conceive of the possibility of being wrong. Some of us think that fanatic adherence to every jot and quibble of an antiquated code is, if not dark precisely, at least stupid. And from all I've heard, the dark side seems to be anything that disagrees with the hidebound, divisive, every tree and bushes sacred teachings that shackled the Jedi gifts and shackled every political body that had anything to do with the Jedi, whether they agreed with them or not like an iron chain. She gestured, with the small hand that had never done any work in the woman's life, as if summoning the spirit of the clammy old man in the black robe whose pale eyes still sometimes stared at Leia in her dreams. Palpatine was a pragmatist. As am I. And you don't think that pragmatism as you call that form of selfishness I ascend exactly what the dark side is? Madam, said Kel believing it unstated whom he was addressing. It's strictly pragmatic. We have very little time. The eye of Palpatine will be in range of this rift, its principal target, in a matter of forty minutes. His cold colorless eyes fastened on Leia's face, gauging her. Like Moff Tarkin, she thought trying to figure out what would cause her to break. Now, it's very possible that you will escape the destruction by virtue of concealment in these tunnels. But I assure you, and that flicker of spitefulness crept into her voice again, everyone in the valley will die. That presumably includes your husband. And in every other valley on this planet. What did you do to your droid? I didn't do anything said Leia quietly. After his attempt on our lives last night, he had to be rewired. 
You changed its schematic. Irek was shocked. But a droid can't run if you change its schematic. He looked in horror from his mother to Kelder, as if for confirmation of this fact. Old man Magritte said that every droid has a standard schematic and... Professor Magritte, said Leia, obviously didn't hang around much with spaceport mechanics. But that can't be the reason. Irex slewed in his chair to face Kelda again. Nobody rewired the eye. That we know about. The chubby little man glanced once more at his sensor screen, and in the shadowy fragments of light his face looked suddenly fallen in, as if someone had let the air out of him. Leia could almost hear his battle against panic in his voice. But the fact is, my lord Irek, we don't know if the damage to the activation relays was the only reason the Eye of Palpatine didn't rendezvous with the assault wing here 30 years ago. It's just possible that enemies of the New Order did learn what the relays were supposed to summon, and did get a saboteur on board. If part of the computer core was damaged, for instance, in an attempt to overload the reactors. Can you fix it? Roganda put a hand on her son's wrist to forestall whatever he was getting ready to say with his intican breath. Take a ship up there and disable the mission command center? Kelda's eyes shifted. Leia could almost hear him estimating the possible strength of the rock above and around them, measuring it against the firepower of the eye's torpedoes. Of course I can. And if you can't, Leia snapped sarcastically, I suppose you figure you'll be safer up on the ship than down here? Roganda's eyes met Irex. I blew out the central servo on the landing silos, said the boy. Then, defensively, you told me to. The Ollivandran ship is still on the ice pad. Roganda got to her feet, nodded to the portable terminal in the corner. Bring that, she said. She paused, considering Leia for a moment, then said, Bring her. If you can't get that battle moon disarmed, we're going to need a hostage. Irex's lightsaber flashed out, flame-colored in the darkness of the black-draped room. He stepped close to Leia, the cold cautery of the blade hissing faintly as he brought it toward her face. And you'd better not try anything, he said, a glitter of evil glee in his smile because I don't think we need a hostage that badly. The corridor outside was empty. Garanin thought Leia desperately, pushing aside the last traces of the drug's breathless dizziness. There has to be some way to alert Garanin that he's being betrayed. She cast a swift look toward the red alarm buttons every dozen meters or so along the wall, wondering if Irex's reflexes were up to slicing her in two if she lunged for one. She rather suspected that they were. I warn you, madam, panted Kelder, hurrying at Roganda's side with his portable terminal bundled up under his arm and straps hanging in every direction. The gunnery computer was a semi-independent entity from the central mission control computer the will. If there's been a problem with the will itself, it may not even let us on board, much less permit us into the central core. You mean we may not be able to stop the eye? or control it afterwards? Her obsidian black eyes glittered like a snake's, furious at the stupidity that dared to unravel her plans. Kelda flinched. There is that possibility. Then wait here. Roganda ducked through a nearby door in a swirl of white skirts, and Irex stepped closer to Leia and lifted his lightsaber threateningly. The concubine reappeared a moment later with a heavy black box slung over one shoulder by a carrying strap. Her scornful eyes flicked to Leia. More pragmatism, she said dryly. If there's one thing I learned in getting out of Coruscant ahead of the rebels, it was, never be without money. The spite was back in her voice, clearer now. Spite and a world of unspoken resentment, the resentment of a woman who has known what it is to be poor. Just as if, thought Leia, she herself hadn't run ragged through the stars with a price on her head. But Roganda wasn't seeing that. Roganda was seeing the Emperor's levy, too, 
seeing the last princess of Alderan, privileged and pampered, whose aunts wouldn't deign to speak to her, the scion of all those ancient houses who looked down their noses at her choice of wine. And Leia raised her head in just the attitude she herself had hated in every spoiled rich brat she'd gone to school with, and summoned every ounce of their whiny jeers into her voice. You'll need it, she sneered. If your witless incompetence at this stage gets the heads of all the ancient houses killed. Roganda slapped her. The blow wasn't hard, but Leia grabbed the little concubine's wrist, shoved her between herself and Irek, and flung herself the two or three meters down the corridor that separated her from one of the red alarm buttons on the wall. She smacked it hard with the heel of her palm and whirled, raising her hands as Kelder brought up his blaster. And before Kelder had the chance to rethink his automatic response of not shooting in the event of surrender, Lord Garanin appeared down the corridor at a run, blaster in hand. My lady? What? They're deserting you! Yelled Leia. Running out! That battleman's going to blow the daylights out of this place, and they're taking off in the last ship. And whirling, she aimed a single hard lance of the force at the latch of Roganda's black box. Panic, lack of training, and the exhaustion and disorientation of the drugs caused her aim to misfire slightly, but the result was the same. The strap snapped and the box which Leia could tell was extremely heavy crashed to the floor, the latch sprang open and gems, currency, and negotiable securities spilled across the floor between Roganda and her aristocratic security chief. After an endless second of staring into Roganda's white face, Garanin said softly, You faithless drab, and with his free hand brought up his calm link. It was the last conscious movement he made. Irek stepped forward with preternatural lightness and severed him, right shoulder to left hip, the lightsaber cutting and cauterizing flesh and bone like a hot wire passing through clay. Leia stretched out her hand, Garanin's blaster flying free of his dying grasp and into her palm. Even as it did so she flung herself to the floor in a long roll, Kelda's blaster bolt spattering viciously against the rock where a moment ago she'd been standing. Then she plunged down the nearest corridor, heard Irek yelling, Kill her! She'll tell the others and the clatter of pursuing feet. Leia took a flight of stairs two steps at a time, fled down a corridor, past deserted rooms or sealed doorways, musty and lit by the intermittent radiance of glow panels faded with age. She ducked through what she thought was another passageway and found herself in a long room whose single bay window looked out into the lamp-twinkling outer darkness fleeing to the embrasure. Beyond the heavy plex she saw the jet of rocky overhang the dense curtain of vines, and a hanging bed of vine coffee plants, gleaming with work lights, not three meters away. Hanging beds. The supply platform. An emergency ladder to the bottom of the rift. She was prepared to shoot out the window latches, but it wasn't necessary. They were stiff, but not locked. Shouts, running feet outside. Her breath was still short, and uneven from the stimulants they'd given her, but she knew she had no choice. Leia squirmed her way through the narrow opening to the minimal rock of the sill, being very careful not to look down, grabbed a handful of vine, and swung. The vine jerked and gave half a meter under her weight, but somehow the huge steel basket of the bed was safely, easily under her. She grabbed a support cable and clung, releasing the vine, gasping and trembling all over. Lights glowed above her, below her, and all around, illuminating the other beds in the dark. Leia looked up to the dark mazes of tracks, the rags of fog drifting among the cable and pulley arrangements that held up the gondolas of the beds and above it all the cold white fragments of wind-thrashed ice skating across the plex of the dome itself. She knew she shouldn't look down but did. A swirling sea of fog broken by dark trees and the fragile lamps of a sunken city. A tremendously long way down. Lightly, she ran along the duckboard that stretched the length of the bed. The supply station affixed to the cliff wall itself, 
with its own thick beds festooned in vines, seemed impossibly far away. The steel gondolas that supported the hanging beds were ten or twelve meters by six, filled with earth and overflowing with the heavy, thick-leaved coffee or silk vines. This was a coffee bed, tight clusters of dark beans half hidden among the striped leaves, the bittersweet smell of the foliage thick in her lungs. Narrow catwalks ran between the beds, little more than chain ladders wound on reels that extended or contracted as the beds were raised and lowered, or could be unhooked and drawn in completely if a bed was brought laterally around to one of the supply stations on the rift wall. The thought of crossing one turned Leia absolutely cold, but it was the only means of making her way from bed to bed until she reached the station. The bed Jared shook swayed. Turning, she saw that Irek had swung from the window as she had, and was running lightly down the duckboards to her, lightsaber shining redly in his hand. Leia fired her blaster and missed, the boy ducking nimbly and vanishing among the vines. Rather than face him not knowing exactly what she'd have to face she fled, ducking and scrambling across the first of the spider-strand catwalks, clinging to the safety line that formed a spindly railing for the bridge. She half expected Irek to cut the bridge behind her and try to spill her off, but he didn't, probably knowing she could hang on to the ladder and climb. She felt his weight on the catwalk behind her but didn't dare stop and turn until she had the next bed swinging and rocking beneath her feet. Then she turned, in time to see him spring off the catwalk and into the vines. She fired again but the blaster jerked in her hand, almost loosening her grip and she ducked the whining slash of the blade close enough that she could feel its cold. The coffee vines tangled her feet, but she moved lightly, ducking his cuts, weaving and springing away. She dodged again, as behind her two of the heavy stakes that held the vines uprooted themselves and slashed at her head like thrown clubs he was attempting to drive her over the edge. Her second shot missed, and she could feel the pressure of his mind on hers, her lungs laboring her throat tightening. Consciously she relaxed them, opened them, thrust aside what he was trying to do to her. A blaster bolt whined, took a piece out of the steel rim of the basket, and left a mass of acridly smoking vines between them. Irek startled back and looked around. Leia fired from a distance of less than two meters and only at the last second did his mind try to rip the blaster again from her hand. The bolt seared a smoking rent in the shoulder of his coat, and at the same moment Kelda's voice yelled. I've got her! I've... Irek lunged at Leia in response, driving her toward the edge, and then there was a shattering crack from the plex overhead and the pain cracked, frigid air pouring down through the hole the blaster had made and turning instantly to a swirling column of fog in which snow fragments sparkled viciously in the starry lights. Leia ducked through the momentary screen of the fog to the next catwalk, raced and scrambled along it headfirst, though it was pointing slightly downward to a silk bed a few meters below and nearly ten meters away. This time Irek did cut the catwalk. Leia dropped the blaster and grabbed hard and tight as the chain ladder plunged sickeningly down. The lurch, the jerk of it reaching the bottom of its arc was terrifying, jolting her belly and freezing her heart. The ladder jerked and swung and it took all her courage to release her death grip enough to begin climbing, but she knew she was a sitting target. A bolt burned the ends of the vines to her left. I've got her! She heard Kelda yell again. Leia dragged herself over the edge of the steel cage and fell into the fusty-smelling masses of the vines. She tore up one of the heavy vine stakes knowing it would be almost useless against either lightsaber or blaster, but it was the only weapon to hand. At the same moment the bed lurched and began to move, rumbling along its track on the ceiling, swaying with the momentum of its speed. Leia flattened, digging her hands hard into the vines as the bed lurched and jerked against the other catwalks that connected it to the beds around it, then swayed signingly as the thin steel ladders broke off. Don't look down. She told herself grimly, but looking up saw where the tracks crossed. 
Another bed swept down the crossing track out of nowhere, vines trailing, whizzing along like an out-of-control freighter. Leia crushed herself flat again, and the gondola slashed by half a meter over her head, cables whining as the whole bed dipped toward her in an attempt to sweep her off. Then the bed she was on was moving faster and faster, swaying wildly as it swooped around corners, raising and lowering another searing whine of the blaster, as a whipping turn brought her clear of the pouring fog and into what Kelda considered his range. Here. Over here. The moving bed lurch stopped and reversed its direction. She could see Irex standing up on another bed, slightly above her, backlit in the swirling fog lightsaber burning like amber flame in his hands. Fog was everywhere, spewing streams of it mixed with snow as the cold air poured down through the crack in the dome. Another silk bed swept toward her on a collision course. Leia gauged the possibility of a jump to that one but lost her nerve, ducked flat, and clung as it slammed heavily into the side of her bed, nearly hurling her out, then swept away as it had come. One instant she was swaying over a sickening view of trees and clouds and tiny lights below, the next lost in dark swirls of mist through which the lights on her bed glowed like jewels. Something huge and dark loomed out of the mist above her, and she felt the jolt of someone landing on the bed. A heavy rustle of feet in the vines then. Don't move, princess. I'm not very good with this but at this range I'm not going to miss again. The silk bed lurched out of the fog. Oren Kelder, blaster in hand, stood at the other end. The bed slowed, but continued a constant, even course back to the bed where Irex stood like a slender black god. In a sudden squeal of cables another garden rose from below them, missing them by less than a meter, and from its rim Han Solo launched himself into the vines at Kelda's side. At the same moment both that bed and the one Han had ridden over to them swung in another direction heading along the track toward the Vine Festoon supply station on the rift wall, where Leia could see Javax and Chewbacca, standing at the controls. Irek yelled, No! And Han, who had twisted the blaster out of the astonished Kelda's fist, shouted, Run for it, Leia! Instead she strode over through the vines and delivered a smashing blow with the vine stake to the back of Kelda's head as he struggled with Han on the edge of the bed. Kelda staggered, reeling. Han jerked him back from the edge and thrust him toward the leading end of the bed, which was now closing in on the supply station. Javax waded through the deep vines, reaching out with a long pole to steady the incoming bed. Irek shouted something else. Leia didn't hear exactly what. And the pulleys that held the bed to the trolley overhead let go with a snap. Leia flung herself at the hanging jungle of the supply station's vines, Han leaping after. She thought he wouldn't make it, reached out with the force, but didn't afterward know whether it was his own agility or some added energy of hers that let him grab the bottom ends of that trailing green beard. But in any case Oren Kelder, architect of the Death Star and sole surviving technician of the Eye of Palpatine, had neither the force nor the trained muscle of a rough and tumble smuggler to help him. And if Irek was capable of levitating him out of the falling ruin of the silk bed, he didn't react quickly enough or didn't try. The scientist's scream of terror echoed in the ghostly broil of fog still streaming down through the cracked dome, and when Leia and Han gained the safety of the platform, all trace of Irek was gone. Chapter 24 with the closing of the shuttlecraft door behind the last contingent of the Gakfeds, the hangar seemed profoundly silent. Beyond the magnetic seal, the blue-white curve of Belsavis flung back a cold glory of light, a bony radiance that bleached Kray's features to a haggard shadow and turned Nichasa's to silvery marble. There it is, said Callista softly. There, where the clouds rise up in columns over the heat of the thermal vent. Even from here, Luke could see the star-silvered night side chaos where the Plow Rift lay. Leaning like a tired old man on his staff, he remembered the young Jedi who'd come to him a year ago, bringing the tall, elegant blonde woman Dash, 
the most brilliant AI programmer at the Magritte Institute and strong in the force as well. She'd stepped forward, he remembered, to shake his hand, taking charge of the situation so that it wouldn't take charge of her. I'm sorry, he wanted to say to them, not knowing quite why. For life. For this. For everything. The lander's going to be launched first, on automatic, he said, forcing his mind back to the matter at hand. Time was, he knew, now very short. Once it gets clear of the magnetic field, Blue Shuttle will go. He gestured to the massive pale block of the Telgorn. It rocked, very slightly, and a muffled thumping could be heard within. He felt a momentary rush of gratitude that the control cabin was completely separate from the passenger hull. Triv. The elderly stormtrooper stepped forward from the shadows where he'd been standing with Thrupio. He'd shed his white armor and wore again the faded, flower-embroidered makeshifts he'd had on when he'd come on board. His dark face was calm, but there was an infinity of sorrow in his eyes. I'm putting you in charge of Blue Shuttle in case there are any problems, but the controls are slave to Red Shuttle's console Nichos will pilot both crafts from there. Luke drew a deep, shaky breath. Cray. She raised her eyes. Silence had been growing around her, like a sea creature manufacturing a shell of its armor, a double shell, this time, enfolding them both. It was the first time he'd seen Cray and Nichos so comfortable together, so close, since the days on Yavin before Nichos's hands had started to go numb, his vision to blur. With the various small camouflages gone the steel mesh and the ornamental housings covering wrist joints and neck he was more than ever a droid. But something in the way they stood, something in their silence, was as if the past eight nightmare months had not taken place. There's an escape pod at the end of the corridor outside the gunnery deck, he said quietly. Once I make it to the top of the shaft, I'll yell down to you and you get to that pod and get the hell out of here. I think there'll be time. I thought I was the one, said Cray softly. Who was going up the shaft? He shook his head. I could never make it to the pod. I've rested. It wasn't much of a lie, he reflected. I can use the force to help misfire the grid, and I think I have the strength to levitate to the top. Once I'm in the central core. He took another deep breath. Once I'm in the central core I'm going to try to cripple the guns, rather than blow up the ship. According to the readouts you got from the central computer that should be possible from there. And what if it's not? Demanded Callista's voice. Then, he almost couldn't say the words. Then I'll start the reactor overload. But if it hasn't blown in ten minutes... Cray and you'll be out of there and in the pod by then start thinking about how we're going to get enough memory in a unit to get Callista off the ship. After that's done we'll blow it. No, said Callista. Callista, I can't. No. He could see her, almost standing in front of him, her features set and white and her smoke-colored eyes grim, as they had been in the other hangar thirty years ago. Luke, we can't risk it. You can't risk it. Say you're right. You find a way to cripple the guns really cripple them, not have the eye lie to you and say they're crippled. That leaves the eye in orbit until you can scrape up enough units of memory, enough circuits and synapses. You're never going to find that kind of thing on Belsavis. From what you've told me, they're just an agricultural station, and a small one at that. So you sent for them. So they take a day, two days to arrive. And meanwhile whoever sent for the Eye of Palpatine comes along. And every Imperial Admiral who picks up word of it. You think the Republic's going to be able to fight off the pack of them? With a station like this one for the prize? Luke was silent, unable to argue. Unable to tell himself that the dark flower of knowledge... The cold dread of his dream had been illusions. Something had sent for the eye. Something was waiting for it. 
and it had it almost within its grasp. Blow the reactors, Luke. Her voice was low, barely to be heard in the deep silence of the shuttle deck. None of the others spoke, but Luke was conscious of Cray's eyes on his face, knowing in a way that none of the others did what he was going through. Knowing that his decision to be the one in the shaft was based partly on the knowledge that if he destroyed the ship if he destroyed Callista he would be in her heart when the end came. Don't let the world deceive you, Callista continued softly. Because believe me, it knows how badly you want to deceive yourself. I know. He doubted any of the others heard his words, but knew that Callista heard. I know. I love you, Callista. She whispered, and I love you. Thank you for bringing me back this far. He straightened up, as if some terrible burden had fallen from him. Nichas 3PO Triv. Get ready for launch. Cray, I still want you to be the one who stays below, the one who gets out of here. He turned, in time to see her take a stun gun from the holster at her side. He had, he realized, thought of everything but that. The will is going to do anything. Use anything. He threw himself sideways and rolled as best he could. But the killing grind of exhaustion and pain had slowed his reactions and blunted any chance he had of using the force, and the stun blast smote him like the blow of a club, hurling him into darkness. Who the hell was that? Leia dragged Han up the final half-meter or so onto the platform, Javax and Chewie reaching down beside her to pull him to safety. Cold wind whipped and tangled her hair, fog swirled around them one moment, ice crystals stinging her cheeks, then whipped away to reveal the tossing soft lake of the rift below. Dimly, from the open window beneath the vines away along the cliff, she could hear the clamor of alarms. Javax, can you get us back there? There under that ledge. And sound the alarms in the valley. All over the planet, whatever other settlements you can reach. The whole planet's going to be shelled, bound from space. I don't know how soon, minutes maybe. Who was that? Demanded Han. And who killed that guy in the passageway? Are to let us back through to the crypts, then up an elevator. What happened to the guardians in the tunnels? Bombed? Demanded Javax, horrified. Now! Go! Get everyone under shelter, into the old smuggler tunnels used the spaceport silos for safety. It won't have been a target. It wasn't built thirty years ago. Chewie ducked back into the supply shack, emerged with a controller in his paws. A moment later a vine coffee bed approached them like a slow, splendid, flower caparison barge along its ceiling tracks. That super ship Mara told us about, the other half of the assault on Belsavis. It's on its way. Irek summoned Etroganda's son, Irek. That kid? He's trained in the force, he can influence mechanicals. He'll make hash out of our fleet. She sprang down from the platform into the thick vines of the bed. After the sickening whiplash drop on the slashed catwalk, and springing from the falling bed to the thin tangle of vines, the short jump down to something securely anchored bothered her not in the slightest. Hans swore and jumped, catching the cables for support. Chewie dropped down after. Warn them! Yelled Leia back, as the Wookiee swiveled the joystick on his controller. The coffee bed swung ponderously along the track, breasting through a banner of fog toward the distant overhang of the cliff and the gaping window beneath. Get everyone under cover! Javax was already swarming onto the little service elevator that would take him down the cliffside. Drost Elegen, Lady Dalla Vandran, and a motley and vociferating gang of private guards, secretaries, and corporate representatives were assembled in the room from which Leia had jumped to the first of the vine beds. They rushed to the window at the sight of the approaching bed, but though several were armed, Leia heard Lady Vandren snap. Don't fire, you idiots, they could have escaped. As the bed drew near, 
Chewie flung out a coil of ladder. Half a dozen hands caught it, anchored it for Han, Leia, and the Wookiee to cross. Artudito was between Lady Vandran and one of Roganda's thugs, rocking back and forth and tweeping excitedly. As Leia swung through the window Drostelogen, a gentleman to his bones, held out a hand to help her descend, Leia said. You've been betrayed, all of you. When Irek discovered he couldn't control the eye of Palpatine, he ran for it, he and his mother. They're the ones who killed Lord Garanin. They looked at one another. Look at his body, said Leia furiously. Irek's the only person in this place who has a lightsaber. And if you look at the place, you'll probably find a trail of jewels and negotiable bonds all the way to the elevator. She saw the glances that were exchanged among the guards. Nobody had produced a weapon yet. It should be a simple matter to pursue them, said Lord Picutorian. We have some of the fastest. Not with all the silo gates of the port jammed shut, you don't, retorted Leia. She turned to Lady Vandrin. It's your ship they're taking, your highness. The Eye of Palpatine is going to start bombing the planet any minute, so I suggest everyone go as deep as they can and as far into the tunnels as they can. The creatures in the crypt began the athletic-looking Lady Carbonell. Have no direction without Irex will, said Elijin. He glanced over at Han and Chewbacca still standing in the embrasure of the window. As I dare say you found out on your way in, he whipped his blaster from his side. After you, your highness. We may still be able to catch them before they take off. They encountered. In fact, two or three of the wretched ex-smugglers and ex-hustlers wandering the passageways farther from the inhabited areas where the thermal vent ran out under the ice. But as Elijin had said, without Irex will the things ran shrieking from the lights borne by Han, Leia, and the various infuriated aristocrats who strode in their wake. Without Irex to interfere with sensor tracking, thought Leia as she ran, they should be able to round up those miserable guardians and get them whatever kind of help could best be devised. She wondered what the old Jedi records Luke had scraped together had to say about such abuses of the power of the Force, what might be done by those with talents as healers. Typical. Leia heard Lady Carbonell snap to someone at the rear of the group a group, she noticed, made up largely of the members of the ancient houses, the corporate types being mostly in prudent search of the deepest defenses they could find. I never trusted the woman. I don't wish to sound the snob. But breeding will tell, and in this case it certainly has. Every now and then they found, on the tunnel floor, a piece of jewelry, or a credit paper, to indicate the direction of Roganda's flight. The elevator up to the surface was jammed. Servos blown at the top, said Han, flipping back the cover plate on the summons button to check the monitor. He did that on the central servo that controls the landing silos, said Leia. I don't know at what distance his power can operate, but it's not something I'd want to have happen if I were in an X-Wing going in. That. Is there a stair? She asked Drostelogen, who nodded. It was, in fact, a circular ramp since the old smugglers had to get cargo down it. Artuditu, who had followed them stolidly along the passageways and ramps from the main mazes behind the cliff, caught up with them and trundled on ahead, his small spotlight shining on the smooth stone of the floor, the battered rock walls. The place smelled of cretch and grew colder as they ascended, Leia's breath smoking in the light of the lamps. Lady Carbonell lent Han her parka when they reached the pillbox at the top. And Han, Leia in her tea suit, and Drost Elijin the only other member of the little group to have a parka with him struggled, with Chewbacca and the droid, over the uneven path that wound through the sheltering backbone of the rock to the ice landing pad and its low white hangar. The hangar door was open, the lights from within shining weirdly on the snow that blew across it, puffing back from the magnetic shield. All around the ice pad, snow was scattered in the characteristic quintuple starburst pattern of a tickier's lifters. 
except for Lady Vandren's two crew members, tied up with engine tape in a corner and shivering with cold, the hangar was quite empty. Leia wrapped her arms tight around herself, shivering as the wind burned her unprotected cheeks. Chewbacca growled, his long brown fur whipped in all directions by the dying winds. Overhead the black royal of clouds had broken, showing the sky the clear, pallid slate of the Belsavi's dawn. At least we'll be able to warn Akbar, said Leia quietly. Irek's power over mechanicals can be circumvented if minor changes are made in the schematics. He can do damage on any ship that hasn't been warned, but we can get the word out. It was a plan that worked best with surprise, agreed Drost Elegin, shaking back his graying dark hair and gazing skyward. Though from what I know of starship mechanics, there are schematics that must be adhered to if the ship is to function at all. You must admit that the initial advantage would have been devastating. Perhaps decisive. He looked down at Leia, his pale eyes chilly. All we want is sufficient power to be left alone by all parties, princess. We are perhaps repaid for our greediness in thinking that a scheming trollop and her brat could provide it for us. He turned and moved off along the path heading back for the ramp head that would take him to the safety of underground. Han stepped forward, to encircle Leia with his arms. You know she was the Emperor's hand. His other hand, he added, as Leia looked quickly up, a protest on her lips. And Mara's fried as a fish about it. It explains how she could do things like kidnap Nastra Magrity and use Imperial funds, said Leia. She must have been planning to develop Irex powers since she first knew he had them. Maybe since before he was born. They're out there, and there's still a danger. She sighed, suddenly very tired, and looked, as Elegin had, into the leaden sky, as if she could see the track of the vanished spacecraft fleeing the place that had been her first, and last, true home. We'd better get under cover, said Han softly. If that ship Mara talked about is going to try and finish up its mission, we don't know how far around the rift it was programmed to bomb. Let's just hope the caves are deep enough. A burning pinpoint of white light flared suddenly in the dim sky, faded, then swelled suddenly to a monstrous glare. Han flinched, covering his eyes with his arm. Leia turned her face aside and saw their shadows men, woman, Wookiee, droid momentarily etched black against the blue-white meringue of the drifts among which they stood. Han said, What the? I don't know, said Leia. But that was way too big for a tickier. It has to have been the eye. Luke, forgive me. He rolled over, body aching from the effects of the stun gun's blast. There were soft hootings in the semi-dark, and a white, fluffy enormity came and bent over him, urging him down with padded black paws. Talls. They clustered around the emergency bunk where he lay, and the whole dark space of the shuttle hold smelled of their fur. Someone was singing. Pillaging villages one by one. Luke sat up, and was immediately sorry. Forgive me, said Callista's voice as he lay down again. Somewhere close by the Jawas chattered, yellow eyes glowing in the dark. Over the heads of the talls he could see one end of the shuttlecraft jammed with old droid parts and stormtrooper helmets used as buckets to hold scrap metal, wire, and power cells. He remembered Callista had told both groups of Gamorreans, in her pseudo-messages from the Will, that it was the intent of the Will that they leave all their weapons outside their respective shuttlecraft. The voice was tinny small. Turning his head, he saw the player sat next to him on the thin mattress of the bunk. The hollow of her face appeared dimly above it, no more substantial than the audio. She looked exhausted, as she had in his dream vision of her in the gunroom, her brown hair straggling from the loose braid she'd put it in, her gray eyes at peace. It was my idea mine and craze. I was afraid we were both afraid that at the last minute you tried to settle for less than complete destruction of the Eye of Palpatine. 
that you tried to play for time to take me off the ship. I'm sorry that I made your decision for you. Her image faded out, and Craze appeared, weary and stretched looking, but with that same exhausted peace in her eyes. With me in the gun room using the force against the inclusion grid, I figure it's just possible for a droid to make it up the shaft. And a droid could take a few hits and still be able to function. Nichos agreed to this. The pale, still features of the Jedi who for a year had been Luke's pupil appeared beside hers, oddly detached looking in front of the metal of the cranial cowling. The hand the precise duplicate of Nichos's hand rested on Kray's shoulder, and she reached to touch the fingers that had been programmed to human warmth. Luke, you know I was never more than a substitute, a droid programmed to think, and remember, and act like someone Kray wanted very much to keep. And that might have suited me, if I hadn't loved her truly loved her as well. But I'm not the living Nichas, and I know I never can be. I would always be something less, something that was not. Nichas is on the other side, Luke, said Cray softly. I know it, and Nichas. She half smiled. And this Nichas knows it. Remember us. Their images faded. No image replaced it, but Callista's voice said again, Forgive me, Luke. I love you. And I will love you, always. From the starboard portholes came a blazing burst of white. No! Luke flung himself to his feet. He thrust through the talls, through the Jawas clustering around the ports, the gentle tripods crowding up against the massive piles of the Jawas junk fell against the wall to stare out in time to see the huge white flare on the far side of the drifting asteroid fade. Tiny it was, hanging in the distance. No! Then the explosion, like the shattering destruction of the world. Chapter 25 Mara J picked them up in the hunter's luck very shortly after that. I came out of hyperspace almost on top of that tickier. She said as she and Leia helped Luke along the short, prehensile templock from the Red Shuttle's lock to the Lux. Behind them in the shuttle, Chewbacca was snarling furiously at the assorted Gamorreans and Jawas seeking to follow, so loudly that he could be heard in the thin almost vacuum. C-3PO, who'd more or less piloted both shuttles away from the spreading cloud of ruin that had been the Eye of Palpatine, had remained with the Wookiee to translate explaining in a number of languages that everything was under control and they'd all be taken care of. It was heading up the corridor like it had a pack of void demons on its tail. If I'd known who it was I'd have taken a shot at them, but they were going so fast I probably wouldn't have got a hit. You be all right, Skywalker? She keyed the entry to the Lux main lock and regarded Luke worriedly as the air cycled in. Luke nodded. There seemed no point in saying anything. He'd heal, he supposed, inwardly as well as physically. He knew that people did. The black gulf of nothingness inside him wouldn't always be the only thing he could see. Now he just wanted to sleep. Leia put her arm around his waist, and he felt the touch of her mind on his. Tell me later, she said. Leia, he thought, would have liked Callista. Mara would have, too, in her cold, cautious way. I'll be fine, he said, knowing it was a lie. There's a pretty good company med center in Plaul, Mara was saying as she eased Luke down the short corridor to one of the small cabins. The Hunter's Luck was a rich kid's yacht that had fallen to pirates years before, but some of the old amenities still remained, including a self-conforming bed in a niche with a small monitor screen onto the bridge. After sleeping on heaps of blankets on the decking in corners of offices, the gentle comfort was strange. Who's the old duffer you got riding herd on the blue shuttle, kid? Han, on the bridge, glanced up at what was clearly his own screen. Luke smiled a little at his friend's nickname for him. Triv Pothman. He used to be a stormtrooper, a long time ago. He leaned his head back into the pillow 
barely feeling it when Leia stripped open the leg of his suit and slapped two heavy-duty Jiloko patches and a massive dose of antibiotics onto the bruised, inflamed flesh. He heard Mara swear and ask, How long has it been like that? It was hard to estimate time. Five days, six days. She sliced off the splint Bulyak had braced it with. He barely felt her stripping away the pipe and engine tape. The force healed that. By the look of those cuts you should have gangrene from your quads to your toenails. Artudi too. He heard 3 Pio's voice in the hall. Turning his head through the door he saw the protocol droid hold out his dented arms to his stubby astromech counterpart, himself battered and smoke-stained and crusted with mud and slime. How extremely gratifying to find you functional. I'll never be anything but a droid, he heard Nichasa's voice in his mind. If I didn't love her. He tried to close his mind to the hurt of memory. Five days, six days, he had said. And your highness, 3 Pio's voice continued. I trust your mission to Belsavis went as you had hoped? You could say that, 3 Pio, said Leia. If you were being kind of free with the truth, put in Han from the bridge. Whoa, what have we got here? We got a signal in the debris field. Escape pod, it looks like. Luke opened his eyes. Cray. So she decided to live after all. Something inside him wondered why. While Mara went off to the bridge to work the tractor beam, Luke insisted that Leia strap another splint to his leg so that he could go down to the hold when they brought the pod in. She'll need to be taken care of, he said, easing himself to a sitting position as his sister fixed the brace tight. Sitting up, he caught a glimpse of himself in the mirror on the other side of the cabin behind what had once been a bar, and was startled to see how the past week had lined and thinned his face. The blue eyes seemed very light in eye sockets discolored by fatigue and sleeplessness, and fading bruises marked jaw and cheekbone under the wicked gouges that shrapnel had left. With a ragged growth of brown stubble, he looked like some dilapidated old hermit, leaning on his staff. He looked, he realized, a little like old Ben. Leia helped him to his feet. She, too, had the appearance of someone who'd been through the mill. Are you okay? He asked. She nodded, brushing away his concern. What about Cray? Did Nichas. He saw her hesitate on the word, die, as she remembered that Nichas after what Cray had done for him to him had been incapable of death. It's a long story, he said, feeling utterly weary. I'm surprised she took the escape pod. My impression was she didn't want very much to live anymore. Over the tannoy he heard Mara say, Got it. Bringing it in through the shield, Leia put her shoulder under his arm and helped him down the hall the two droids and Chewie trailing in their wake. Apparently Trooper Pothman has succeeded in calming the Clags and the Aphitekans on the blue shuttle, Master Luke, 3PO informed him. General Solo has already sent a subspace message to the Contacts Division of the Diplomatic Corps, and they're arranging a party to deal with reorientation of the Eyes prisoners. They say they would like your help on that. Luke nodded, though it was hard to think more than a few minutes ahead a few hours ahead. He saw now why Cray had done everything in her power, had wrung her body and her mind to keep Nichas with her, to try to keep Nichas with her. Because she could not conceive of what life would be like without him as a part of it. He is on the other side, she had said. As Callista, now, was on the other side. Whatever had changed her mind, he thought she would need him there when she came out of her chilled sleep. The lights on the whole door cycled green and the door hissed open. The pod lay on the square of the doors, directly under the hooded, cooling eye of the quiescent tractor beam. It was barely two meters long and eighty centimeters or so wide, mad imperial green, and icy to his touch with the cold of space. 
he slid the cowling back. Under it, she lay in the coma-like sleep of partial hibernation, shallow breasts barely moving under the torn and smoke-stained uniform and long hands folded over her belt buckle. Despite the bruises that still marked it, her face was so calm, so relaxed, so utterly different from the brittle, haggard features of the woman she had become that he almost didn't recognize her. Had she looked like this, he wondered, that first day over a year ago, when Nichos had brought her to Yavin? The most brilliant AI programmer at the Magritte Institute and strong in the force as well. The standoffish elegance she had worn as a protective cloak was gone. She was a different woman. A different woman. Luke thought, no. He shook his head. No. It wasn't Cray's face. The features, the straight nose and delicate bones, the full, almost square shape of the lips, were the same. But everything in him said, it isn't Cray. No, he thought again, not wanting to believe. For a long time the universe stood still. Then she drew a long breath and opened her eyes. They were gray. No. He put out his hand and she raised hers, quickly, as if fearing the touch. For a few moments she simply looked at her own hands, turning them over like one marveling at the shape of palms and fingers, some unfamiliar piece of sculpture, stroking the backs of them, the fingers and the knobby, stick out bones of the wrists. Then her eyes met his, and flooded with tears. Very gently, afraid to touch afraid she would vanish, evaporate, turn out to be only a dream he helped her to sit. Her hands were warm where they touched his arms. For a time they only looked at each other. This can't be real. She touched his face, the bruises and the shrapnel cuts and the beard stubble, his mouth that had pressed to hers in the dream that hadn't been a dream. If I could ask for only one thing, one thing in my entire life. He brought her gently against him holding the long slender bones, the light sinewiness of her, pressing his face against the pale ragged hair, which he knew would turn brown in time. She was breathing. He could feel it against his cheek, under his hands, next to his heart. Then she laughed, a soft and wondering sob, and he flung his head back and everything rose within him in a single wild whoop of triumph and joy. Yes! He yelled, and they were laughing and crying both, hanging on to each other, and she was saying his name, over and over again as if she still didn't believe it, couldn't believe that such things were occasionally permitted by fate. It was her voice, and nothing like craze at all. His hands shook as they framed her face, Leia and Mara and Han and the others standing in the doorway of the hold watching all this in silence, knowing something was taking place, and not quite knowing what. But after a time Leia said, hesitantly, That... That isn't Cray. There was no question in her voice. She stepped aside, said Luke, knowing absolutely and exactly what had happened in the last moments on board the eye. After Nichos went up the shaft, said Callista softly, He was hit badly, most of his systems cut to pieces. He was in no pain but he could feel himself shutting down as he set the core on overload. Cray said to me that she wanted to stay with him. To cross to the other side with him. To be with him. She was a Jedi too, remember. Not fully trained, but she would have been one of the best. Tears flooded the gray eyes again. She said if she couldn't be with the one she loved in this world, at least someone could. She said to thank you, Luke, for all you tried to do for her, and for all you did. He kissed her like the breath of life coming into his body after long cold, and stumbled trying to get to his feet on his bad leg. Laughing shakily, holding on to each other for support, they got to their feet and turned to the group in the doorway. He said softly, knowing it for the truth as he knew the truth of his own bones. Leahan Mara 3PO R2 this is Callista. Chapter 26 
Everything has to be paid for. Callista passed her hands across the surface of the glass sphere, where the pink gold liquid glittered unstirring in the glow of the lamp. Shadows bent and flickered over the other objects in the toy room, catching angles of color, shadow, light. Outside, the stream that ran through the wide hall clucked and muttered in its stone channel, and the glow rod hissed a little in a loose socket, but there was no other sound. I should have known there would be a risk. She went on in that soft, slightly husky voice with the slight inflection of the Chad Deepwater Ranges. I might have guessed there would be a price. Would you have done it? asked Leia. If you knew? Callista said. I don't know. She crossed the room to the flat rectangular tank, with its thin layer of yellow sand, moving with an odd, graceful awkwardness. She had on the faded blue jumpsuit of a spaceport mechanic, laced down as tight as it would go in the back and still baggy over flanks and shoulders, and a mechanic's heavy boots. With her cropped hair and shy, rather quirky cast of face she had an unfledged look, like a military cadet. A lightsaber hung at her belt, a gleaming line of bronze sea creatures inlaid in its grip. The masters used to call images in the tank, like forming up holos. They project their thoughts through the sand. I don't know what its exact composition is, but it occurs naturally on a world in the Gelvidus cluster. The sand is what makes it easy for a child to do the same. Leia frowned, considering the faintly glittering, daffodil-colored dust, trying to evoke Han's face, or Jason's, by thinking through it. Flowers were the easiest, said Callista. Something you're familiar with. Flowers or animals. Make them come up out of the sand. There was silence again. Leia perched on the bench in front of the tank, relaxing and focusing her mind as Luke had taught her, seeing in every detail the little candy pink pit in that had once played with the end of her braids. Thinking through the sand. And in some fashion she couldn't define... The images went through the sand and appeared in the tank, not bit by bit, but with an odd sort of abrupt gradualness. At A.V., rolling on her back to bat at star blossom petals, as if she hadn't been dead for eleven years. Oh, pretty! said Callista. Is she yours? Was, said Leia. A long time ago. The masters always had a problem with the children born Jedi to non-Jedi parents, you know. Callista went on, after a silence in which Leia let the image fade. Because it's usually passed on in families, but not always. And it often manifests spontaneously, in people who had no experience with it, and no way of knowing how to deal with children who had it. The masters tried to catch those as early as they could because those were the ones at the most risk from the dark side. Those, she went on. And the children born of Jedi parents who were only a little force strong, who had only a tiny bit of what their brothers and sisters and playmates had full strength. Some of those were. The most dangerous of all. She stopped, and there was a very awkward pause. Then, quickly, Callista turned away. This is a mental maze. She tapped one of the metal spheres in their rack on the wall. Leia shrank back from it as Callista took it down, remembering Irek holding it out for her, reaching out to suck her spirit into it, to be trapped forever. Most people didn't go into them really, said the taller woman. Not with their whole. Whole being, whole spirit. And they're easy to get out of once you know how. The big ones are the simplest, and they get more complicated the smaller they get, mazes within mazes within mazes. The juniors used to make them for fun, and try to confuse and trap each other, the way kids do. She set the sphere on the table, spun it with her fingers, the light gleaming wetly off its whirling sides. I wish. I wish I could show you. It had been last night, when Leia, Han and Callista had come down to the toy room, that they'd discovered that Callista was no longer able to use or touch the Force. Luke had been taken to the Brathlin Corporation's med center, 
to spend most of the night in the glass tank of viscous bacta fluid. It had occurred to Leia that this young woman who despite her strong superficial physical resemblance to Cray now seemed no more like her than some distant cousin would know the nature and uses of the toys in their room in the vaults beneath Plett's house. Armed with tranquilizers, stun guns, and massive restraints, Javax and Mara Jade had led parties of searchers to round up the remaining insane guardians of the crypts, so it was fairly safe to enter through the tunnels from Roganda's house on Painted Door Street. At the sight of them Mara's cold anger was revived. Many of them were people she knew. In addition to the team from Diplomatic, a group of psychologists and healers was due to arrive tomorrow from a third to help deal with rehabilitation, using the techniques that Tom Ma'el had informed Leia over subspace, seemed at last to be working on Drub McCum. The two shuttlecraft and the lander had been brought in safely and their occupants with the exception of the sand people who were drugged and under firm restraint were in protective custody, to be reoriented, deprogrammed, and returned to their home planets. Both Clags and Gakfeds had adamantly refused reorientation and were currently negotiating with Drost Elegant to be taken on as a bodyguard. Only when Callista had attempted the first, most simple demonstrations of the toys separating the colored fluids within the sphere, Setting to motion the delicately poised levers and wheels of the Dynamitron had the truth become clear. She had lost all ability to use the Force. It wasn't something I even thought about, she said now, turning one of the mind mazes over in her hands. She did not meet Leia's eyes, shy with her and a little hesitant, not because she was the chief of state of the New Republic, Leia guessed, but because she was Luke's sister. Cray had the force in her very strongly. If she hadn't, she wouldn't have been able to, to leave her body the way she did. To guide me into it. To give it to me. She glanced up, her rain-colored eyes anxious. You were her friend, weren't you? Leia nodded, remembering that cool, stylish, intellectual young woman whose height and natural elegance she'd so envied. We weren't close, she said. But yes, we were friends. She reached out and put her hand briefly over Callista's. Close enough for me to guess months ago that she didn't want to live without Nichas. Callista gave her fingers a quick squeeze. He was... Sweet. Kind, she said. I don't want you to be angry that I'm me, and not her. She was the one who... Who offered... Whose idea it was. We didn't even know it would work. Leia gave a quick shake of her head. No. It's all right. I'm glad it did. The Force is something that's been in me, a part of me, since I was small. Jin, my old master, said. She hesitated and looked away again, suddenly silent about what it was her master had said to her, unwilling to pass it on. Well, anyway, she took up a moment later. I never thought there would be a time when I... when it wouldn't be part of me. Leia remembered how this young woman had fled this room last night without a word, vanishing into the lightless mazes of the geothermic caves. She herself had spent a harrowing few hours, wondering if there was anything she could or should be doing in between a dozen subspace calls to Ither and the diplomatic corps until Han had reminded her. She probably knows those crypts better than anyone here. In the small hours of the morning, when Leia had gone to Luke's room at the Brathlin Med Center, she had found Callista there, stretched out on the bed beside the sleeping Luke, her head pillowed on his arm. What will you do now? Leia asked softly. Callista shook her head. I don't know. Sometimes there is nothing you can do. Leaning on the broken frame of the gateway arch, Luke remembered the words Callista had said in the darkness of the Eye of Palpatine. Sometimes justice is best served by knowing when to fold one's hands. That, too, was the wisdom of the Jedi. Maybe the hardest wisdom he'd heard. She sat with folded hands now, gazing out into the weird shimmer of mist and the gray shadows of trees. 
The crack in the dome had done strange things to the weather in the rift, and odd little currents of fidgety cool whispered through the heavy warmth of the fog. She had known this place, he thought, before the dome had been built, before the orchards had been planted, when it had been part jungle, part volcanic barrens around acrid mudflats. She remembered it when the only settlement had been that little group of lava rock houses clustered up against the rising benches of land at the end of the narrow valley, truly little more than a fingernail gouge in the marble wastelands of eternal ice. She had grown up in another world, a universe separated from the present by centuries worth of events packed into a single lifespan. Like Triv Pothman who had been enchanted with the quiet community of Plawl, and was already signed up for training as a horticulturist Callista had spent a long time as a hermit, to return to a world unfamiliar and empty of anyone she knew. He was silent, but she turned her head as if he'd spoken her name. It was good to walk again, without limping, without fear, without pain. It was good to be in daylight again, and in real air. Are you all right? There was quick concern in her eyes as she spoke, held out her hand to him. The tissue regeneration of the back to therapy had left him shaky, and he knew he shouldn't be up yet. I should ask you that. She had been there, lying at his side, when he drifted to consciousness close to dawn. Later, when he'd waked fully, she'd been gone. Leia had told him what had taken place in the toy room but it was as if Luke had known it already. He wondered if he'd been there, seen it in some now-forgotten dream. Certainly when she'd wept, silently, on his shoulder in the pre-dawn darkness, he'd known what it was she had lost. She shook her head, not in denial, but in a kind of wonderment. I keep thinking about Nichos, she said. About being, another Corellian of the same name. She turned her hands over as she had when she'd waked in the hunter's luck, feeling the shape of them, their long strength and the pattern of the veins and muscles beneath the porcelain fine skin. Hefted in them the lightsabers she had once had the skill to make. His head close to hers, Luke could see the brown color already visible at the roots of her cornsil hair, and knew that within a few months the hole would be that heavy, malt-colored mane he remembered from visions and dreams. I keep wondering if I shouldn't have stayed where I was. No, said Luke, meaning it, knowing it, from the bottom of his heart. No, she replaced the weapon at her belt. Even if I'd known. This, she said softly. Even if I'd guessed. Been able to see into the future. Once Cray asked me if I wanted to. To take her place. I couldn't have said no. Luke, I... He brought her into his arms, and their mouths met hard, giving, forgetting, remembering, knowing. Telling her without speech how groundless were the doubts that she didn't dare put into words. It isn't the force in you that I love, he said softly, when at last they eased apart. It's you. She bent her head forward, rested her forehead on his shoulder. They were much of a height. It's not going to be easy for me, she said softly. Maybe it's not going to be easy for us. Sometimes last night, wandering in the caves, I blamed you for this. I was angry I think I'm still angry, deep down. I don't know how you could have been responsible, but I blamed you anyway. Luke nodded, though the words hurt. In a curious way he understood that they weren't personal, and it was better to know. I understand. She moved her head and looked at him with a wry quirk of smile. Oh, good. Explain it to me? He kissed her again instead. Will you come to Yavin with me? When she hesitated, he said, You don't have to. And you don't have to make up your mind now. Leia tells me you've written out all the names you can remember of people who were here. She says you'll be welcome on Coruscant, for however long you want to stay. And I know it won't be easy to be. To be around students, adepts in the Force. 
but your knowledge of the old methods of teaching, the old ways of training, would help me. His voice fumbled with the words, and in the stillness of her face he saw her effort not to trouble him with her own pain, her own uncertainty. Oh, the hell with it. I need you, he said softly. I love you, and I want you with me. Forever, if we can manage it. Her mouth moved in a smile. Forever. The gray eyes met his, darker than the fog around them, but equally suffused with light. I love you, Luke, but... It's not going to be easy. But I think... I feel that we're going to be in each other's lives for a long time. We have time, he said. There's no hurry. But there is and there always will be my love for you. They were still clenched tight in each other's arms, cheeks resting on each other's shoulders, when Han and Leia, Chewie, 3PO, and R2 appeared in the broken gateway. Leia said softly, Let them be for a while. He can kiss her on the ship, said Han good-naturedly. Javax has finally got the landing silos repaired, and we've got those gizmos from the toy room loaded up, and I for one want to get off this rock before something else happens. This would be advisable, Your Excellency, added 3PO. Admiral Akbar did mention concentrations of Grand Admiral Hars troops in the Atravis sector, and we have no idea where or with whom Roganda and her son have taken refuge. Given the necessity of implementing small but significant changes in the schematic of every ship in the fleet or of finding adequate shielding where schematic change is impracticable, it would perhaps be expedient to get underway as soon as we can. You're right. Leia looked around her for a last time at Plett's house, or the ruin that the Empire had left of it. Broken walls, shattered arches, the metal slab replaced over the well. The echoes of its ancient peace filled her covering the pain and ruin as the exuberance of the rift's ubiquitous vines covered the scars of that ancient shelling. Somewhere she seemed to hear children's voices again, singing that old song about the forgotten queen and her magic birds. Callista had given her a partial list of names, all she could remember, though she herself had only visited the place briefly and didn't know most of the Jedi there. But it was a start and she had something of those forgotten children, something of the old Jedi who had lived here, who had offered them refuge. Movement flickered in the corner of her vision. A ghost? She thought. Or the echo of a memory? The shadows of two tiny children chased each other over the thick olive-tinted grass and faded into a stray drift of fog. Nichas? She wondered. Roganda? One running toward the light, the other toward the dark? Someone whose name she did not yet know. Or were they shadows from the future, not the children who had been there, but the children who were to come? Hey, kid! Yelled Han, and Leia poked him in the ribs. Come on, she said. Luke deserves a break. It had been, for him, a long, long time. The couple on the bench turned their heads. We're blowing out of this jerkwater rock, called out Han. Can we drop you any place? They looked at each other, their faces reflecting a curious kinship, for a moment more like brother and sister than lovers, people who have known each other for lifetimes past. Then Callista said, Yavin. If it's on your way. Han grinned. I think we can manage that. Luke and Callista crossed the grass to them hand in hand. Luke and Callista crossed the grass to them hand in hand. End of Star Wars Children of the Jedi by Barbara Hambly